Hi, I'm USA Today best-selling author Jennifer Youngblood. I'm excited to present One Fake Fiancé. I hope you enjoy this unique combination of the audiobook and original video footage that has been made especially for YouTube and is only available to enjoy here on my channel. You may remember Jackson Romeo from One Southern Cowboy. He's an upscale refined cowboy. His cousin Lucas is a rough hoon cowboy in every sense of the word. Lucas dreams of owning a ranch. Magnolia needs a fiancé pronto. Can the cowboy and the debutante find common ground? Or will their shot at happily ever after get stomped to smithereens before it even has a chance to begin? Sit back and enjoy. Oh, and be sure and take a second to like the video and subscribe to my channel. Opening Credits One Fake Fiancé Romeo Family Romance Book 8 Written by Jennifer Youngblood Narrated by Lisa Valdini Chapter 1 Where are you? Lexi demanded. You were supposed to be here 45 minutes ago. Lucas pushed out a heavy breath. Sorry, sis, I'm stuck in traffic. That was partly true. He was sitting in traffic. However, he dragged his feet getting out the door. The only reason he even agreed to go on this dad-blasted blind date was because Lexi had been hounding him about it for weeks, insisting on fixing him up with one of her close friends. You're gonna love her, Lexi kept saying. The most frustrating part was that Lex wouldn't tell him who the girl was. She just kept saying that it would be well worth Lucas's while to go. Lucas could tell that Lexi had something up her sleeve, but he couldn't figure out what. It wasn't like he was hard up for a date. He went out with lots of women. Had Mom put Lexi up to this? Lucas was 32 years old, still plenty young. However, his mom was getting antsy about him finding someone to settle down with. When Lexi was single, her mother had pestered both of them about getting married. However, now that Lexi was with Asher, all the focus had turned to Lucas. His mom was more determined than ever to marry Lucas off saying with a jubilant, I figure Lexi and Asher will get married in the spring. Is it too much for a mother to ask for two weddings? Lucas had been married once, but it ended disastrously. An image of his ex-wife Renee flashed through his mind as the stench of painful memories pressed around him, filling his nostrils with the sourness of dung. Renee had left on Christmas Eve without so much as a note or parting word. Just like that. His marriage was over. Lucas had been devastated, but that was years ago. He pieced himself back together and went to work at Thousand Acres Ranch for his Uncle Knox. Most of the time, Lucas was fine, but when Christmas rolled around, things got tough. Must be some awful traffic, Lexi muttered, considering that it's only a 30-minute drive from your place to my apartment. If it's a big deal, we can just reschedule for another time, Lucas said lightly. He wasn't in the mood to go out with some woman he'd never met. Lexi assured him the woman was beautiful, but beautiful was a relative term. If the girl was as beautiful and wonderful as Lexi claimed, then why did she need to be fixed up on a blind date? Lexi's words rushed out in a ball of fire. Oh, no, you're not weaseling out of this one, bro. We're here, waiting. A wry grin pushed over Lucas's lips. He'd known that that would set Lexi off. All right, sis, he laughed. Don't get your panties in a wad. I'm on my way. Tell the mystery girl that I'll be there in less than ten minutes. The plan was for him to go to Lexi's apartment to pick up the girl. Lexi had arranged for them to go to dinner at the fancy restaurant where she used to work. Lucas glanced down at his flannel shirt and Levi's. Lexi had told him to dress up, but this was as good as it was going to get tonight. Oh, good, you're close. Okay, I'll tell her. He tightened his hold on the steering wheel. Lex, what's this about? Why are you so determined to fix me up with your friend? He paused, bunching his brows. There's an ulterior motive lurking around somewhere. Did Mom put you up to this? No, she laughed, but he detected a hint of nervousness. What makes you think I'm up to something? Maybe I just want you to be happy. I am happy, he growled. 
I can tell, she retorted, her voice dripping with sarcasm. You sound ecstatic. I've seen morticians happier than you. Don't dance around the topic. You're up to something. This is not one of those women you met on that idiotic reality TV show, is it? Nope, she sang. It's not. He felt a smidgen of relief. Good, because I don't have the time nor the patience to put up with some hoity-toity diva. Lexi giggled. You're terrible, Lucas tensed. She's not a diva, right? Um, no, not exactly, he grimaced. Seriously? You know I hate pampered girls. I need someone tough, someone who's not afraid to let her hair down or get her hands dirty. More than anything, Lucas wanted to purchase a ranch so he could work his own land. It was a pipe dream. The price of land was out of sight. The best that Lucas could hope for was that Knox would keep giving him more responsibility. Lucas had proven his value time and time again, but the problem was Jackson was the general manager of the ranch, and that's how it would always be. Angst churned in Lucas's gut as he thought of his first cousin. From the time they were kids, he and Jackson had been rivals. Things got worse in high school when they played football together, and there was the bit about them both liking the same girl, but that was all water under the bridge now. Lucas's infatuation with Lemon Massey had been fleeting, but not so with Jackson. He and Lemon had reconnected and were now engaged. Lucas was happy for Jackson. He'd certainly been a lot easier to deal with now that he was with Lemon. As for their working situation, deep down Lucas didn't blame Knox for putting his own son in charge of the ranch. Still, it cut to know that Lucas had risen about as far up in the chain of command as he could go. He'd always be just an employee, working under his uncle and cousin. Lexi trilled out another high-pitched giggle, breaking into Lucas's thoughts. Just trust me, bro. That's kind of hard to do when you're not telling me the full story. She let out a long breath. Okay, she relented. You're right. There is more to this than a simple blind date. Just as I thought he said, feeling vindicated for having ascertained the situation correctly. Spill it, he ordered. No can do. You'll just have to hear it from your date. Huh? Hear what? Lexi's voice went squeaky. She'll have to tell you the full story. Did you get the flowers? Lucas glanced over at the bouquet in the plastic sleeve, resting on the passenger seat. Got them as instructed. Perfect. See you soon. Before he could say anything else, Lexi ended the call. What are you getting me into, little sister? Lucas grumbled as he drummed his fingers on the steering wheel, continuing his drive to Lexi's apartment. Magnolia nibbled on her lower lip as she watched Lexi stroll back into the living room. Good news, your date's on his way, Lexi announced as she plopped down on the love seat and tucked her leg underneath her. Who exactly is this guy that you're fixing me up with? Lexi made a zipping motion over her lips. You'll find out soon enough, she said, her eyes dancing with secrecy. Magnolia groaned. You've got to at least give me something. I'm dying here. It was a bit odd and concerning that Lexi had left the room when she called the guy to find out where he was. Did the guy not want to go out with her? Magnolia clenched her hand her nails digging into her palm. There's just so much riding on this, she uttered. Her deadline for marriage was less than three weeks away. Just thinking of her approaching deadline made Magnolia's stomach churn. Magnolia had met Lexi in junior high when she moved to Franklin, Tennessee to live with her mom. During the two years that Magnolia lived in Franklin, Lexi was her closest friend. Then, when her mom relocated to Orlando, Florida, Magnolia moved back to New Orleans to be with her dad. At first, Magnolia and Lexi kept in close touch, but eventually drifted apart, as childhood friends often do. The two had rekindled their friendship when Lexi came to stay with Magnolia prior to her going on the TV reality show The Singing Bachelor. Magnolia had forgotten how much she missed hanging out with Lexi. She was so down-to-earth, so relatable, a breath of fresh air from Magnolia's other social-climbing friends. 
Being with Lexi reminded Magnolia that there was a whole other world outside of the country club and endless social events, which the upper echelon deemed as necessary as bread and water. Several weeks ago, out of sheer desperation, Magnolia had called Lexi asking if she knew anyone she could fix Magnolia up with. Lexi said she had someone in mind, but it had taken forever to schedule a date. That was somewhat understandable, with Thanksgiving and the Christmas holidays in full sway. However, it made Magnolia super nervous. Time was ticking away. She had to find a fiancé, pronto. While she was waiting to meet the guy Lexi planned to introduce her to, Magnolia had dated legions of men as backups, hoping that one of them would fit the bill. Sadly, none had. If only Roman hadn't cheated on her. Or better yet, Magnolia wished to the depth of her soul that she would have realized earlier that Roman was a louse before wasting an entire year dating him. It'll be okay, Lexi soothed. I hope so, Magnolia pushed out a hard breath. If my grandmother were still alive, I'd give the old bat a piece of my mind. This whole thing is so absurd, I still can't believe I'm being forced to marry for money. Lexi gave her an astute look. Technically, you don't have to marry anyone, Magnolia's eyes rounded. I do if I want to get my ten million dollar inheritance. I understand, Lexi said calmly, holding out her hand. Hopefully, tonight's date will be the start of something great. The guy I'm fixing you up with is solid, a salt-of-the-earth type. Good, Magnolia said, squaring her jaw. That's what I want. I'm sick of the country club types. She felt like she was two parts of a person. From her mom, she'd inherited the desire to be carefree and unencumbered by social expectations. From her dad, she learned just how rigid social pressure could be. She searched Lexi's face. How much does this guy know of my situation? Zilch, I thought it would be best for you to tell him. Magnolia's stomach tightened as she nodded. That's probably wise. A dry laugh riddled her throat as her hand encircled her neck. I guess I should at least make sure he's decent looking and that we somewhat get along. Even as the words left her mouth, she cringed inwardly, not wanting to contemplate what she'd been reduced to. It was on the night of her 21st birthday that Magnolia's father sat her down and explained the terms of her late grandmother's trust. As the only child and grandchild, Magnolia was set to inherit $10 million on the express condition that she get married by her 27th birthday. Furthermore, she was to stay married at least five years and have a child. When Magnolia first heard the terms, she laughed until her insides were sore. The idea of being forced to marry to fulfill the terms of her controlling grandmother's trust seemed ludicrous, not to mention archaic. Magnolia thought she could find a way out of it. She had many tearful conversations with her father about it. While he expressed sympathy for her situation, there was nothing he could do. Her grandfather was nearly as hard-nosed as her late grandmother, so it wouldn't do any good to talk to him about it. He was completely on board with his late wife's wishes. As time went on, Magnolia came to the painful conclusion that her grandmother's will was ironclad. Carol Bentley, heiress to one of the largest fortunes in the U.S., had paid an army of attorneys to make certain of it. It would seem that her cool and aloof grandmother had found a way to control Magnolia from the grave. Magnolia's only consolation was knowing that she had five years to find the right man. The years had flown by faster than she'd ever thought possible. She finished college and got a job as chief editor for Dress to Fit, a well-known fashion and lifestyle online magazine. Just when she thought life couldn't get any better, she met Roman Abbott, handsome and charming. Roman was everything that Magnolia thought she always wanted. Roman's infidelity not only left her furious, but even worse, without a fiancé, right before the ominous deadline. Roman hadn't known about the trust. Magnolia had never found it necessary to tell him. She wanted him to love her for her, not the money. 
She'd planned to break the news to Roman after they were married. Now it was a moot point. At this point, Magnolia's hand would be forced, and she'd have to tell whatever guy she got engaged to the full truth. With any luck, they could strike a bargain. She merely needed a body to fill the space. Well, not just a body, but someone classy enough to put up a good front. The trust dictated that her grandfather and Eric Stanford, the attorney over the estate, both approve of Magnolia's choice for a husband. Would this guy that Lexi was setting her up with be the solution to her dilemma? If he were as salt of the earth as Lexi claimed, then he might balk at the idea of marrying for money. After all, not everyone could be bought. Magnolia was ashamed of having to stoop to paying someone to marry her. How different the situation would have been had Roman been the guy she thought he was. She'd be planning her real wedding right now instead of hoping that she could buy off some stranger. The doorbell rang. He's here, Lexi sang with a large smile. Butterflies tapped out a fast beat in Magnolia's stomach as she sat up taller in her seat and fluffed her hair. Do I look okay? She'd taken extra care in getting ready, selecting a green blouse to go with her eyes. Also, she'd curled her blonde locks. You look gorgeous as usual, Lexi said as she stood and went to the door. Magnolia rose to her feet, clasping her hands. Her heart was pounding a hundred miles an hour. She sucked in a quick breath as she rubbed her sticky palms on her jeans. When the door opened, Magnolia pasted a smile over her lips. She caught a glimpse of flowers just before Lexi embraced the guy in a tight hug. Hey, Lexi said, her voice ringing with affection. You made it. A second later, she turned, motioning. Magnolia, you remember my brother, she said grandly with a bright smile. Lucas, Magnolia inserted, the word falling from her lips like poison. Her heart dropped clear to her feet, disappointment battering her insides. A wall of tears pressed against her eyes as she blinked to stay them. This was the guy she'd been waiting a month to be fixed up with? Lexi's brother? All hope for the future imploded in a suffocating cloud of dust. There was no hope of finding anyone. She could kiss her trust fund goodbye. No surprise, Lucas was still as handsome as ever in a casual, indifferent, snub-the-world way. His sable hair was longer on top and spiky messy. The ends were tipped with gold from being out in the sun. His olive-toned skin held a sun-kissed glow. Magnolia saw the flicker of surprise that passed over Lucas's features before his jaw turned harder than concrete. He shot Lexi a glare so withering it could have stopped a tiger in its tracks. This is who you've been harping about for the past month? He smirked, shaking his head. I can't believe I drove all the way here for this. He held up the bouquet. This was a waste of twenty bucks. Molten fire zigzagged through Magnolia as she spun around to Lexi. How could you fix me up with him? Her breath rushed out in fast, short puffs. You know I can't stand him. She felt dizzy. She couldn't breathe. Oh, yeah, well, the feeling's mutual, honey. Lucas shot back. Magnolia pointed her finger. I'm not your honey. A hard amusement flicked through Lucas's blue-gray eyes. No, you are most certainly not. Since when do you hate my brother? Lexi asked, confusion written all over her face. Magnolia threw her hands into the air. Since when have I not hated him? Lucas scoffed. Why don't you give the letter thing a rest? It happened eons ago. Lexi blinked several times. Is this about the letter that you wrote to Lucas when you were in the seventh grade? Magnolia straightened to her full height, jutting out her chin. That's where it started, but there's a lot more to it than that. She perched a hand on her hip, daring Lucas to disagree. Lucas's brows shot down. It wasn't my fault that Mikey Sanders found your little love note on my desk. 
The condescension in his voice made Magnolia's stomach royal. Her voice rose. Mike made umpteen copies of it and posted it all over school. I was humiliated. I had forgotten about that, Lexi said, her eyes forming circles. This has nothing to do with the letter, and you know it, Lucas countered. Why don't you admit the real reason why you hate my guts? Magnolia's blood was boiling. Because I prefer to keep the past where it belongs, in the past. What's he talking about? Lexi asked. Nothing, Magnolia mumbled. Lucas smirked. Oh, she's just ticked because we went out a few times after high school, and I wasn't interested in going steady. He threw Magnolia a smug look. You're a despicable pig, Magnolia seethed. She'd been devastated by Lucas's rejection. He chuckled. Darling, I've been called worse. I'm sure you have, Magnolia retorted, and I'm sure it was well-deserved. When did you all date? Lexi asked. It doesn't matter. Magnolia's anger ebbed a fraction, leaving her feeling numb and colder than Antarctica. She'd have to go back to the drawing board, find a suitable contender to take to North Carolina to meet her grandfather, a guy that she would marry in a few short weeks, a guy she was supposed to have a child with. The task seemed impossible, filling her with dread. I'm not feeling well. I'm going to go and lay down. Lucas raised an eyebrow. Don't leave on my account. I'll go. Good riddance, Magnolia muttered, grinding her teeth. Fury flashed in Lucas's eyes as he turned to Lexi. You remember what I said about those hoity-toity divas? Well, there she is, in the flesh. He thrust the bouquet into Lexi's hand. See ya, sis he quipped as he turned on his heel to leave. Don't let the door hit you on the way out, Magnolia taunted. Hold it, Lexi ordered the second before Lucas stepped through the door. Both of you, this stops now. You're both acting like spoiled brats. It's time to talk turkey. She turned to Magnolia, eyes blazing. You need a fiancé. Lucas choked out an incredulous chortle. A what? Lexi spun around to him. And you need a ranch. If y'all will sit down and talk like rational adults, then just maybe you might be able to help one another. Lucas frowned. What are you talking about? He looked from Lexi to Magnolia. Somebody had better start talking, he demanded. Magnolia scoffed. What are you going to do if we don't? Stomp us to pieces with those filthy boots? She shook her head in disgust. A decent man would have at least gotten dressed up for the date. She lifted her chin, folding her arms over her chest. Amusement touched his features. Honey, where I come from, this is dressed up. Quit calling me honey, she snapped. She wanted to charge at Lucas, rip that smirk off his face. A hard smile wrapped his lips. That's right, Magnolia, you don't know the meaning of honey, do you? Heat torched Magnolia's cheeks. What's that supposed to mean? You're all spitting vinegar. A derisive chuckle sounded in his throat. It's no wonder that you need a fiancé. You'd probably have to pay some poor schmo to take you. He turned to Lexi. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I'm out of here. Stop! Lexi's voice cracked like a whip. We're going to sit down and talk. Now! She growled. Lucas pushed a hand through his hair. Fine, he muttered. I can't wait to hear this. Magnolia looked at Lexi. This is a waste of time. Lexi gave her a steely look. Do you have any better ideas? Magnolia's silence was her answer. Your time's almost up, Lexi continued as she motioned to the couch. I suggest you sit down and put a cork in that smart aleck mouth. When she saw Lucas's amused sneer, Magnolia's anger sailed through the roof. She was about to launch into another tirade, but Lexi spoke first, 
Her tone held the sharp edge of a knife as she eyed Lucas. And I'd advise you to stop being a boneheaded cowboy. Button your lips and listen. Lexi's outburst snuffed out any further conversation as they all three went to sit down. Chapter 2 I didn't realize that y'all had dated. Lexi's voice had the controlled authority of a mediator as she looked between Magnolia and Lucas. Anyone care to tell me what happened? Lucas and Magnolia both sat in stubborn silence. Lexi pressed on. Fine. Since y'all won't talk about it, then we're moving past it. She focused on Magnolia. Why don't you start by telling Lucas why you need a fiancé? The corners of Lucas's mouth twitched. He had to fight hard to squelch his laughter. He couldn't begin to fathom what events had led up to Magnolia needing a fiancé. Furthermore, he had no idea why Lexi thought he'd be a contender. What had Lexi meant by him needing a ranch? Was Magnolia trying to buy him off? None of this made a lick of sense. Magnolia took in a breath as she pressed her lips together. Lucas was struck by her incredible beauty. Had she always been this attractive? If so, why hadn't he realized before? His brain gave back an immediate response. Maybe because she was such a diva. Pretty is as pretty does. Magnolia was a siren, drawing unsuspecting men in so she could dash them against the rocks for sheer sport. Well, he refused to be one of her conquests. His eyes seemed to break rank from good sense as he took in the long tresses of her glossy blonde hair, noting how the curls fell in soft waves, framing her heart-shaped face. She had the slightest bit of a dimple in her chin. Her shirt picked up the vivid green in her fiery eyes. Even though she was throwing him a look that could kill, Lucas couldn't help but admire her spunk. When Magnolia spoke, her voice was flat, as if she were reading from a script. My grandmother was the daughter of Quentin Bentley. She looked at Lucas as if waiting for him to react. Never heard of him, he said dryly. He made his fortune in oil and then used it to invest in other businesses, Magnolia explained. He had one daughter, Carol Bentley, my late grandmother. My grandparents had one son, my father, Oscar. I'm an only child, meaning I'm the only heir. Your family's not much for procreation, huh? Lucas quipped. Shh, Lexi warned, elbowing Lucas. The two were sitting on the couch with Magnolia across from them. Lucas caught a blip of amusement in Magnolia's eyes. It gave him a strange sense of pleasure to know that she thought his joke was funny. On my 27th birthday, December 30th, I'm to inherit my trust fund, totaling $10 million. Lucas felt his eyes bulge. $10 million? He croaked. Wow! That amount of money was so far above his reach that it was staggering. He couldn't even comprehend what it would be like to have one million dollars, much less ten. Congratulations, he threw out mechanically. That's how it went. The rich got richer, while the rest of the world scratched and clawed to carve out a living. Magnolia Bentley had been born with a silver spoon in her mouth. Tell him the rest, Lexi prompted. Magnolia clasped her hands tightly in her lap. There are a few conditions to me getting my inheritance, she swallowed, rubbing her tongue over her lips. I have to be married. Lucas made a face. Seriously? What kind of trust is this? Don't even get me started, Magnolia fumed. I'm so ticked at my late grandmother. If she were here right now, I'd squeeze her neck until her head popped off. Lucas chuckled. Okay, tell me how you really feel. Believe me, I am, Magnolia shot back. The pieces of the puzzle were starting to shift into place. He eyed Magnolia. So you need a fiancé? She nodded, looking away. He turned to Lexi, 
his voice throttling up several notches. And you thought that would be me? Color brushed his younger sister's cheeks. I did. You want to purchase a ranch? A disbelieving laugh tickled his throat. Yeah, but you can bet your best boots that I'm not going to marry a sugar mama to get it. You know me better than that. Magnolia's face drained. I told you this wasn't going to work, she said to Lexi. Lexi moistened her lips, tucking her hair behind her ears. Magnolia called me in a panic. Her boyfriend, the man she thought she would marry, cheated on her. Lexi gave him a pleading look. I figured if anyone would understand the pain that causes, you would. Lucas's lungs squeezed, cutting off his air. A sense of shame cloaked him when he saw Magnolia's sympathetic expression. He certainly didn't need anyone, least of all Magnolia Bentley, feeling sorry for him. I'm way past caring what happened to my failed marriage, he said gruffly. Lexi touched his arm. I know. I only meant that you and Magnolia have something in common. She glanced at Magnolia as she spoke. Magnolia asked me to fix her up with a good guy. Her voice quivered with intensity. You are one of the best I know. Lucas's thoughts were thrashing around his skull like a bronco, refusing to be reined in. I'm not marrying for money. The idea went against every core principle that made up who he was. And I'm especially not getting hitched to some spoiled heiress who wouldn't know what a hard day's work was if it bit her in the butt. Outrage streaked over Magnolia's face, turning it cherry red. You don't know me, she hissed. I'll wager that I could work you and every other blockheaded cowboy under the table. Despite what you think, I've worked hard to get where I am. Amusement simmered in his gut. Oh, yeah, and exactly where are you? Front and center of the country club league, or whatever you people call your little get-togethers? That's enough, Lexi warned. Magnolia looked like she might spring out of her seat any minute and flee the room. Well, maybe that was for the best, so they could put an end to this ridiculous conversation. Lexi tipped her head thoughtfully. What if Magnolia's right? Lucas sensed a trap. What do you mean? I'm sure you could find plenty of work for Magnolia to do on the ranch. She could show you her skills. The mortified look on Magnolia's face nearly matched Lucas's own shock. He rubbed his neck, a smile tugging at his lips. Yeah, I don't think that would work. He's right, Magnolia agreed. It's freezing outside right now, not the best time to be working on a ranch. She hugged her arms like she was suppressing a shiver. Lexi gave Lucas a speculative look. Think about what it would mean for you to have your own ranch. No more taking orders from Jackson. His sister knew just what buttons to push. You're right, I do want my own ranch, but there are limits to what I'm willing to do. Magnolia gave him a challenging look. Would marrying me be so bad? His answer was an immediate resounding yes. He could almost see steam coming out of Magnolia's ears. Look, we dated. It didn't work out. That's not what happened at all. Magnolia shot back. It worked too well. You were scared of committing, so you retreated. That's the real story. She gave him a superior look. Yep, it was all about me and my lack of commitment. It had nothing to do with you snubbing your nose at my profession or freaking out when your designer shoes got muddy. Okay, Lexi said with a laugh. I thought we weren't going there. Here's the deal. Magnolia needs a husband. You need a wife. You've dated half the countryside and haven't found anyone. What can it hurt to give Magnolia a chance? Giving her a chance and marrying her are two different things, Lucas grumbled. Lexi held up a finger. So what you're saying is that you're willing to give her a chance? Don't put words in my mouth, he warned. Lexi pressed on. You and Magnolia could go on a few dates, see if you can patch things up. 
I'm making dinner for Mom and Dad on Thursday. Asher's coming back into town. It would be the perfect opportunity for you and Magnolia to get together. Lucas was taken off guard by the flicker of hope that lit Magnolia's eyes. She was obviously desperate if she was considering him for marriage. This whole thing was insane. His mind jumped ahead. What happens if I decide to go through with this charade? He hated himself for even asking that question, but while they were here, it was good to get everything out in the open. I'll buy you a ranch, Magnolia blurted. And whatever else you want, I just need a fiancé to take to North Carolina for Christmas. Lucas lifted his eyebrow. A fiancé or a husband? Both. Magnolia's words spilled out. We would need to get married the day after Christmas. Every detail of the wedding is planned to the letter. I claim my inheritance and you get your ranch. Lucas stroked his chin. And then we get the marriage annulled? A tiny ember of excitement kindled in his breast. He could put up with Magnolia for a few weeks if it got him his ranch. A look passed between Lexi and Magnolia. What? Magnolia leaned forward. Um, it's not that simple. Of course it's not, Lucas grumbled. It never is. What's the catch? We have to stay married for five years. He ran his mind through the scenario. It would be a dream come true to own a ranch. Okay, we could do that if we lived in separate states. And have a child together, Magnolia inserted. What? 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 He blustered. Well, that's not going to happen. I don't care how beautiful you are. I'm not going to marry you and have a child together. Magnolia rocked back, blinking. You think I'm beautiful? She stammered. He rolled his eyes. I'm sure you've got mirrors tucked away somewhere in one of your fancy mansions. You know how you look. Thanks, she uttered quietly, taking the sting right out of his jab. He tried not to notice how her thick lashes fluttered against her soft skin. He had to fight the lure of the siren. What she was asking of him was despicable. Marriage was a sacred institution. And bringing a child into this world? Well, that was something Lucas didn't take lightly. He was irritated with the part of him that was disappointed because he couldn't go along with the deal. He might be a lowly ranch hand, but at least he had his dignity. He could look at himself in the mirror without flinching. He couldn't be like Esau from the Bible and sell his birthright for a bowl of porridge. When Lucas finally did find the right woman, he wanted to marry for love. A silent prayer flitted through his mind. Please, Lord, help me to walk away from this temptation. Yes, I want a ranch, but I don't want to lose my soul in the process. Irritation crawled down his spine. He couldn't believe that Lexi, of all people, was trying to put him in this situation. She knew the turmoil he'd been through when Renee left. Hadn't she just been talking about how foolish it was for her to go on that reality TV show and mix love up with her career? She had Asher now, so everything had turned out hunky-dory for her. She should realize that Lucas wanted to find his significant other also. So what do you think? Will you consider Magnolia's offer? Lexi asked, a cautious hope simmering in her eyes. She shrugged, a wistful smile touching her lips. Who knows? The two of you could actually fall in love. Stranger things have happened. Her hand went to her chest. Trust me, I know. I found love in the most unlikely place. Lucas's brows bunched. Have you lost your mind? This isn't some sickly sweet Hallmark show. No, I'm not considering the offer, he thundered. I was up until the kid part. Do you really think I would get married and have a child just so I could have my own ranch? Lexi's cheeks turned red. When you put it like that, it sounds kind of slimy. The whole thing's slimy. Lucas's head swung back and forth. I can't believe I'm even sitting here listening to this. He stood, weary of the whole conversation. Lexi rose to her feet, catching hold of his arm. 
You could at least come to dinner on Thursday at Mom and Dad's. She looked at Magnolia. You should come, too. Magnolia nodded. Lucas homed in on Magnolia. I can't believe you're actually considering marrying me. His voice rose. Me, the podunk, hick cowboy, isn't that what you called me? Lexi's face fell as her head snapped to Magnolia. Did you really call him that? Sure did, Lucas fired back. Magnolia shifted. I was angry. He dumped me. I wanted to hurt him like he hurt me. I didn't dump you. We only went out a handful of times. I cared about you, Magnolia said, her voice trembling with fury. And you took my feelings and threw them in the toilet. I'll never forgive you for what you... Lucas talked over her. Five years is a mighty long time, princess, and having a child together? His jaw hardened. Well, that's not something I take lightly. Magnolia stood. I realize how crazy all of this sounds, she said stiffly. But it's what I'm reduced to. The vulnerable note in Magnolia's voice tugged at Lucas. For one inestimably tiny moment, his frustration at Magnolia ebbed. He let out a long sigh. Look, for what it's worth, I'm sorry that you're being put in this position. I hope you're able to find someone decent who can suit your needs. I'm just not that guy. Good night, sis, he clipped to Lexi. With a curt nod to both women, he strode out the door, slamming it behind him. Chapter 3 That went well, Magnolia huffed. Tears burned her eyes as she collapsed into the love seat. I can't believe you picked Lucas to fix me up with, her voice broke. I'm doomed. Lexi threw her hands into the air. I didn't realize that you all had a history. She looked Magnolia in the eye. You never told me that you cared about my brother. You knew about the note I wrote him, she sniffed. Every time Magnolia thought about the humiliation of that note, she wanted to punch Lucas and Mikey Sanders in that order. Yeah, in the seventh grade. That was a lifetime ago. Lexi sat down on the couch. I didn't realize y'all dated after high school. When? Remember when I spent that month in Franklin, a couple of summers after high school? Lexi nodded. It was then. Tears pulled in Magnolia's eyes before dribbling down her cheeks. She hated the desperation that clawed at her. Lucas hates me. You're not exactly his favorite person, as it turns out. But he doesn't hate you. Lucas is just prickly. Magnolia snorted. Is that what you call it? He's downright cruel. Lexi gave her a shrewd look. You know, if I didn't know better, I'd say that you've still got a thing for my brother. Heat flamed Magnolia's cheeks. That's ridiculous. I've long since gotten over him. She had thought of Lucas on occasion, but wild horses couldn't drag that admission from her lips. When she asked Lexi to fix her up with someone, she never imagined it would be Lucas. If you say so, Lexi drawled. Anyway, it doesn't matter how I feel. Lucas isn't going along with it. She felt Lexi studying her. What? She growled. I wouldn't throw in the towel just yet. There's a good chance Lucas might come around. Really? Magnolia squeaked, surprised by the burst of hope in her breast. Yeah, he just needs time to think it over. Lucas is one of the most infuriating men I've ever met. Magnolia spouted. I can't believe he had the audacity to call me a hoity-toity diva. Her voice rose. Do you think I'm a hoity-toity diva? She asked when she saw the laughter in Lexi's eyes. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, Lexi answered diplomatically. Magnolia took in a deep breath. I thought you were going to fix me up with someone like Asher, not your brother, she pouted. There's only one Asher, and he's taken. Yeah, I know. 
Too bad. Hey, Lexi countered, giving her a sharp look. I'm teasing. Magnolia folded her arms over her chest, her brain spinning like a kite in a hurricane. So where do we go from here? Lexi tipped her head. Well, we start with dinner on Thursday. Yeah, right, like Lucas will agree to come. He will, with the right persuasion. Magnolia was intrigued. What do you mean? My mom is set on Lucas finding the right woman. Lexi looked Magnolia up and down. You could be that woman with a bit of coaching. You mean convince your mom that I'm the one for Lucas? Get her on our side? Yep, Magnolia frowned. But what will she say when she learns about the trust and my real reason for wanting to marry Lucas? Mom doesn't have to know. Not yet, anyway. Okay. I'm liking where this is going. It could work. Magnolia stopped, a sudden thought pinging through her brain. Why are you doing this? Lucas obviously doesn't want to go along with it. Don't you feel bad saddling your brother with a wife he doesn't want? Lexi squinted her eyes like she was doing some hard thinking. You know, I've asked myself that very question a hundred times over the past few weeks. My original intent was to put you and Lucas together so that you could both get what you wanted. Lucas has dated so many women and none of them have been right. I figured what could it hurt for him to go out with you, see if the two of you clicked. Lucas is so sick of working for my uncle. Well, he doesn't mind working for Uncle Knox, but he hates being under Jackson. Who's that? My first cousin. He's the general manager of the ranch. He and Lucas don't get along. Lots of history there. Lexi waved a hand. Anyway, I decided to put you and Lucas together because I want Lucas to be able to live his dream. She paused, cocking her head. But now... Magnolia rushed to fill the silence. Now that you've seen me and Lucas together, you realize what a disaster it would be to pair us up. A heavy blanket of gloom pressed over her. Actually, what I was going to say was that after watching the two of you together, I think you might be just what the other needs. A match made in heaven. Magnolia's jaw dropped. Huh? Did you hear the same conversation I did? Lexi grinned. Yep, sure did. Lucas and I couldn't be more wrong for each other. He wants a burly ranch hand who can milk cows and shovel manure, not some spoiled princess. Her expression turned sour as the sting of his words rushed back full force. Quit wallowing in self-pity. You're only as spoiled as you want to be. It's time for you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Lexi pinned Magnolia with a penetrating look. Do you want your trust fund or not? Magnolia's head snapped up. Of course I want it. Okay, then let's figure out how to make Lucas have a change of heart, shall we? That would be the miracle of the century, Magnolia grumbled. We need a miracle, that's for sure. Better start praying. I mean that with all sincerity. Prayer really helps. You don't have to sell me on the power of prayer. I know that firsthand. Magnolia had been doing a lot of praying as of late. Her prayers had become more urgent and pleading. She had so much resentment concerning her grandmother and the rigid terms of the trust. She was trying to work through that anger as well. Also, she was still ticked at Roman for leaving her in the lurch. One of her favorite scriptures kept running through her mind. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. She was trying to trust but was falling miserably short. Maybe if she were a better, stronger person, she'd just turn her back on her inheritance, tell Eric Stanford and his team of attorneys to go jump in a lake. Okay, that was harsh. It wasn't Eric's fault that her late grandmother was a control freak. He was just doing his job. Still, it was a bitter pill to swallow. Magnolia looked at Lexi, realizing that she was still talking. Oh, and you're going to need a few cooking lessons. Magnolia wrinkled her nose. Cooking lessons? I don't understand. You will, 
Lexi chuckled. When the timer buzzed, Magnolia slipped on an oven mitt and removed the cast-iron skillet from the oven. The fragrant scent of cornbread wafted through her senses. The perfection of the golden crust evoked a curious sense of pride. Magnolia had never been great at cooking, but with Lexi's help, she was improving. She'd actually enjoyed Lexi's cooking lessons. Mrs. Romeo brought her hands together. That looks amazing. Thank you, Magnolia said with appreciation as she cast Lexi a surreptitious glance. Lexi winked. She taught Magnolia how to make cornbread. Magnolia had wanted to learn how to make biscuits, but Lexi explained it would take much more than a few cooking lessons to teach her the technique, so they'd opted for cornbread instead. Lucas will be so surprised and excited that you're joining us for dinner, Mrs. Romeo said. You've been working nonstop since you got here. She scooted out a kitchen chair. Here, sit down and rest. The kitchen exuded such a cheerful warmth that it tugged at Magnolia's heartstrings. She was enjoying the easy chatter passing between Lexi and her mom. The two of them were obviously close. There was a time when Magnolia was close to her mom, Janet, but things had gotten tense between them ever since Magnolia's mom remarried several years ago. Magnolia didn't like the awkwardness that having Dave in the family created. Her mom had always been so independent but now it was like she couldn't make a move without Dave's permission. He stayed glued to her mom the entire time, like an extra appendage, almost as if he were afraid that Magnolia might get to spend a minute alone with her mom. It was a strange situation. Magnolia could tell that Dave viewed her as competition for her mom's affection. Magnolia's mom had invited her to spend Christmas in Florida, but there was no way Magnolia could do that not with the impending wedding. Janet had invited Magnolia for Christmas the past several years in a row. Every year, Magnolia came up with a different excuse as to why she couldn't go. At least this year, her excuse was valid. Magnolia hadn't told her mother about the conditions of the trust fund. Her mom would freak out if she knew that Magnolia had to get married to claim her inheritance. There was no love loss between Janet and the Bentleys. Tell me what you've been up to since you left Franklin, Mrs. Romeo prompted. I can't remember the last time I saw you. You're all grown up now. It has been a long time, Magnolia agreed. Lexi pulled out a chair and sat down at the table. I'm the chief editor for an online clothing and lifestyle magazine, Magnolia began. It's one of the top magazines in the country, Lexi chimed with a touch of pride. Magnolia loved that about Lexi how she was genuinely gracious and happy for Magnolia's success. So many of Magnolia's other so-called friends were insanely jealous of one another. They were okay with their counterparts being successful so long as they remained the top dog. Mrs. Romeo seemed impressed. Wow! Mrs. Romeo, you teach English at the high school, is that right? Yes, she offered a warm smile. Please call me Layla. Magnolia nodded. Layla, you have a beautiful home. She'd never paid much attention to the decor when she was a kid, but now that she was seeing it through the eyes of an adult, she appreciated the artful details that transformed the house into a home. It was the little things that made the difference. The tomatoes ripening on the windowsill, the colorful bowl of fruit on the island, the copper container of wooden kitchen utensils, the baskets craftily arranged on top of the upper cupboards. There was a festive dish towel adorned with a pattern of green holly and bright red berries draped over the oven door. Christmas cards framed the doorway. The room was so cozy. Magnolia thought of her father's mansion in New Orleans. For all its grandeur and spaciousness, it could tend to feel a bit cold and lonely. This cottage-style kitchen was the beating heart of the Romeo's home, the appliances were well used, the dinged-up butcher block island worn to a mellow honey finish, evidence that many a delicious meal had been prepared atop it. Thank you, Layla said, tucking her hair behind her ear. The unconscious gesture was so reminiscent of Lexi that Magnolia smiled inwardly. 
like mother, like daughter. There was a striking resemblance between Layla and Lexi. They shared the same dark hair and expressive eyes. Layla's hair was cut above her shoulders, and she wore it wavy. Layla looked older than Magnolia remembered, which was to be expected. The edges of her eyes were etched in fine wrinkles, and there were stress lines around her mouth. Still, she was an attractive woman. Magnolia appreciated her open and accepting demeanor. Layla had a gracious way about her that made Magnolia feel right at home. So, tell me about you and Lucas, Layla prompted, a gleam of anticipation in her eyes. Magnolia cleared her throat. Here's where it would get tricky. Lexi was adamant about not wanting to lie to her mom, and Magnolia agreed wholeheartedly. No good could come from deceit. Magnolia planned to tell the truth, just not the entire truth. She glanced at Lexi, who gave her an encouraging nod. There really isn't a me and Lucas. Layla's face fell. I thought y'all were a couple. I thought you said as much. The disappointment in her eyes was both flattering and encouraging as she turned to Lexi for an explanation. Magnolia jumped in to get Lexi off the hook. I would like for there to be something between me and Lucas. She hoped lightning wouldn't strike her down for the white lie. What she should have said was that she desperately needed there to be something between her and Lucas. She was running out of time. Layla brightened. Oh, I see. That's good. Actually, we were hoping that you might put in a good word for Magnolia, Lexi added, wrinkling her forehead. Me? Layla pointed to herself as a surprised laugh issued from her throat. Her head swiveled back and forth as she pressed her lips together. I'm not sure that Lucas will listen to me. I've been trying to get him to settle down for longer than I care to think about. He listens to you more than you think, Lexi countered with a sage expression. Layla tipped her head. You think so? I know so. Lexi put a hand over Layla's and squeezed it. A pleased smile tipped Layla's lips. That's good to know. She gave Lexi a long look. Do you think that Magnolia and Lucas would be a good match? Magnolia held her breath, waiting for the answer. Absolutely, Lexi boomed with so much certainty that Magnolia could almost believe that she and Lucas should be together. Why? Layla asked. She looked at Magnolia. No offense, but if I'm to put in a good word for you, I need to know why my daughter thinks that you and my son should be together. I understand. Magnolia's heart began to pound. Layla was kind, but she was tough. Magnolia hadn't expected this. Lexi dipped her head thoughtfully. Well, for starters, Magnolia doesn't put up with any of Lucas's crap. She tells him exactly how it is. Layla giggled as she cast Magnolia an appraising look. I like a girl who can hold her own. The men in this family are tough. Amen, Lexi piped in. Almost as tough as the women. Layla grinned as she and Lexi shared an affectionate look. See why I love her, Lexi drawled. Yes, I do, Magnolia said earnestly. Lexi was lucky to have such a wonderful family. What else, Layla asked. A wicked grin curved Lexi's lips. She makes a mean skillet of cornbread. Yeah, I'll agree with that, Layla cut her eyes at Lexi. It bears a striking resemblance to someone else's cornbread. Color brushed Lexi's cheeks as she offered a sheepish grin. I might have shared my recipe, she admitted. Layla turned to Magnolia. Lucas is a complicated person. He hides behind this tough wall of indifference, but inside, he's a big teddy bear. Her features tightened. When his ex-wife, Renee, left him for her therapist, Lucas's world imploded. It's hard for him to let anyone in. Layla studied her with probing eyes. Why do you want to be with my son? Forgive me for being so blunt, but I don't want to see Lucas get hurt again. I totally understand. Heat crawled up Magnolia's throat. It was better to tell as much of the truth as she could. 
she took in a deep breath before diving in. When I was a kid, I had a huge crush on Lucas. A reminiscent smile tugged at her lips. He was hands down the best-looking guy in school. Are you sure this is Lucas we're talking about? Lexi retorted. Shh! Layla swatted her hand. Lucas is handsome. He had this confident swagger that made all the girls swoon. When he would smile or speak to me, it was like my world stopped spinning. Magnolia shrugged. Of course, to Lucas, I was just his kid sister's friend. She paused, trying to figure out how to tell the rest. After I graduated from high school, Lucas and I went on a few dates. She'd been ecstatic when her path crossed with Lucas at a deli on the square of downtown Franklin. She couldn't believe that he asked her out. She'd walked on air for days. I liked how down-to-earth he was. He didn't put on airs for anyone. We had fun doing normal things like going for a walk or jumping on the trampoline. One afternoon, I helped him wash his pickup truck. Lexi chuckled. Lucas is relentless about keeping his truck clean. He washes it every weekend, even now when it's colder than a witch's nose. Magnolia was still lost in the memory. That same evening, we put an old mattress in the back of Lucas's pickup truck. We went to the drive-in and watched a double feature. We ate so much popcorn that we were sick. We just laughed and talked. We really connected. She and Lucas went on one other date after that, but it was a disaster. Magnolia could tell that he was distant, and it irked her to no end. She pressed the issue, demanding to know what his problem was. They argued. She said something snarky about him working the ranch and pitched a fit about her new shoes getting ruined in the mud. That escalated to a huge fight that ended with her calling him a podunk, hick cowboy who had a colossal fear of commitment. He called her a spoiled princess who had no idea what the real world was like. But no need to add all of that ugliness into the narrative. The clearing of a throat prompted Magnolia to turn around. She gasped, her tongue tying a noose around her windpipe when she realized that Lucas was standing in the doorway. He was leaning against the wood frame, his legs crossed, wearing a cocky smirk. A sickening humiliation blasted through her veins. Somehow she managed to find her voice. How long have you been standing there? Something indiscernible flashed in his eyes. Magnolia would have given anything to be able to read his thoughts. Long enough he said lightly as he straightened to his full height. A large smile filled his face. Something smells good. Lexi and Magnolia have been cooking up a storm, Layla answered. The doorbell rang. Lexi sprang out of her seat. I'll bet that's Asher. Her voice was coated with a breathy excitement. Her cheeks flushed. She smoothed a hand over her sweater and touched her hair. Do I look all right? Lovely. Lucas's voice dripped with sarcasm. Lexi shot him a dark look, which seemed to give him great pleasure. It was obvious that Lucas enjoyed razzing his younger sister. Don't you do anything to embarrass me, Lexi warned as she pointed her finger straight at Lucas. He held up his hands. Don't worry. But Lexi had already bounded out of the kitchen before he could even get the words out. Lucas grunted. She could play a little hard to get. Hush your mouth, Layla commanded. Lexi's happier than I've ever seen her. He sighed. I know, I'm happy for her. He strolled over and gave Layla a kiss on the cheek. An awkward silence descended over the room like a dense fog until Layla spoke. Where are your manners? Aren't you going to say hello? Hey, Lucas said, turning his attention to Magnolia. She could feel her cheeks burning. Hey, Magnolia made some cornbread to go along with this feast that Lexi has prepared. A trace of amusement streaked over his handsome features. You made cornbread? Of course, Magnolia responded, miffed that he was acting so surprised. Granted, she wouldn't have had a clue how to make a decent skillet of cornbread if Lexi hadn't taught her, but that was beside the point. Layla motioned to an empty chair. Have a seat. Lucas did as she directed. 
Now that he was here, Magnolia's skin tingled with a heightened awareness. Not wanting to be obvious about it, her eyes flicked over him. He was wearing a denim shirt, rolled up at the sleeves, faded jeans, and his trademark leather boots. Heat wafted over her. Everything about Lucas screamed 100% American male. Jiminy Cricket. Even his forearms were masculine. If she could convince Lucas to marry her, the one consolation would be that she was definitely attracted to him. It wasn't just his handsome looks that drew her, but rather his aura. Truth be known, she even liked his cocky attitude. When's Dad getting home? He had a meeting with Knox about a new project they're working on. Layla glanced at the clock on the microwave. He should be home any minute. She turned to Magnolia. My husband Dylan and his brother Knox are real estate developers. My dad is also in real estate. He was involved in large-scale projects, many of which were commercial buildings, high-dollar outdoor malls and resorts, but Magnolia didn't see the need to point that out. Layla smiled brightly. One more thing you all have in common. Magnolia glanced at Lucas, expecting him to scowl, but he didn't. Instead, he winked, a crooked grin turning up a corner of his lips. The gesture warmed Magnolia through to her bones as a smile trembled over her lips. Did she dare hope that Lucas was coming around? She could think of worse things than being married to Lucas Romeo. A warm, rich, decadent desire stirred through her stomach as her mind wandered to all the physical expectations a marriage would require, washing a wave of heat up her neck. Lucas looked around. What can I do to help with dinner? Layla's eyes sparkled with humor. That's a first, Lucas frowned. What? You offering to help with dinner? Color moved into his cheeks. That's not true. Layla laughed as she squeezed his arm. It's okay, son. I don't take offense. I know you've been out working hard. Magnolia and I can take care of it. We sure can, Magnolia inserted, liking how Layla was including her. She scooted back her chair and stood. What would you like for me to do? The shock on Lucas's face would have been comical had it not been so insulting. Magnolia could tell exactly what he was thinking. What? she taunted. You don't think the princess knows her way around the kitchen? His eyes bugged as Layla sniggered. Yep, I think the two of you will be just fine. What have you been telling my mom about us? He raised an eyebrow, giving Magnolia a challenging look. Stop pestering her, Layla shushed as she swatted his arm. You should be counting your lucky stars that a girl like her is giving you the time of day. A chuckle broke through Lucas's lips. Is that right? There was a glint of admiration in his arresting eyes, which looked more blue tonight than gray. You're good, he drawled. One visit with Mom and you have her in your corner. You bet she does, Layla punched out. She's a keeper. A glow of warmth spread through Magnolia as she smiled. Thank you. She felt Lucas's eyes on her, was surprised at how intently he was studying her. What? She mouthed. He shook his head, giving her a look that said he'd explain later. Lexi and Asher came into the kitchen. Lexi had her arm through Asher's and was beaming. It was neat to see Lexi so in love. A pang went through Magnolia. She'd never know a love like that, thanks to her grandmother. But she would be wealthy beyond her wildest dreams. Gaining her inheritance had been in the forefront of Magnolia's mind for years. Yet, here in this modest kitchen, with so much familial love and warmth flowing, wealth seemed like an empty consolation. Hello, Asher said as he embraced Layla in a hug. He went to Lucas next giving him a hearty handshake and pat on the back. He turned to Magnolia. Hey, neighbor, long time no see. Y'all are neighbors? Layla asked, her eyes moving from Magnolia to Asher. Yep, Asher answered. We both live on Esplanade Avenue in New Orleans and didn't even know each other. Wow, it's a small world, Layla murmured. Sure is, 
Lexi chimed. Magnolia hadn't seen Asher since the night of the fair in New Orleans when he'd first met Lexi. She'd been irritated at Asher then for taking Lexi away from Charles Harrington, Lexi's date that Magnolia had arranged. Good to see you again, Magnolia grinned, shaking her head. It was a huge shock to learn that you were the bachelor on the reality TV show. Lexi laughed, the sound floating free and unencumbered. It was indeed a shock. Here I was telling Asher all about how I was going on the show solely for my career and that I had no intention of falling in love. Her eyes went as soft as fresh caramel as she looked at him. I guess fate had other plans. Asher gave her a smile so resplendent that Magnolia felt like she was watching the climax of a chick flick. Fate was on our side, and it didn't hurt that we gave it a little push. He slid his arm around Lexi's shoulders, pulling her close. Magnolia looked across the room at Layla, who was standing by the stove. The radiance of her face spoke volumes. She was thrilled that Lexi had found someone. Something smells amazing, Asher said. You know, Lexi, she's been cooking up a storm. Asher's eyes sparkled with an eager anticipation. Good, because I'm starving. I've been thinking about Lexi's chicken fingers all day. Lexi's face fell. I didn't make chicken fingers. We're having sugared ham, pinto beans, cornbread, collard greens, and cheesy potatoes. Sounds good to me, Asher said. Anything you make is delicious. Thank you, Lexi smiled, her eyes warming with pleasure. Magnolia felt Lucas watching her. She gave him a questioning look. He just smirked and looked away. Magnolia wasn't sure if it was a mean-spirited smirk or just Lucas's way of hiding behind his tough-guy mask. Just when she thought she was building up some sort of rapport with Lucas, he started putting up barriers. Frustration rose inside her. Not much has changed over the years. Hello! A commanding voice boomed as a tall, strapping, broad-shouldered man stepped into the kitchen. Magnolia remembered him from her childhood. He'd seemed larger than life back then, a maverick type with a quick, easy smile and gargantuan personality. Mr. Romeo was still pretty impressive, even viewed through her grown-up eyes. His dark eyes sparkled with adventure. He had a mole on his right cheek. His hair was cut so short that it was nearly shaved. Magnolia assumed that it was because it was thinning on top. He reminded Magnolia a little of the actor Jason Statham, the kind of guy who was still movie star handsome, even without hair on his head. Hey, Dad, Lexi said, a clear note of affection in her tone. Hey, sweetheart. He grinned broadly at Asher. Good to see you. They clasped hands and hugged. A few seconds later, the man turned to Magnolia. And who might this pretty little lady be? He looked to Lucas for an answer. This is Magnolia Bentley, Lucas said. Nice to meet you. I'm Dylan. He flashed Magnolia a disarming smile as he shook her hand. Magnolia could definitely see the resemblance between Lucas and his dad. Although she couldn't figure out where Lucas had gotten his gray-blue eyes, she found the color of them so fascinating. It was neat to note how they changed color, depending on what he wore. Hon, you know Magnolia, Layla piped in. Dylan searched her face, trying to place her. I do? Yep, she's Lexi's friend. She used to come over when they were kids. A grin spread over his lips. Ah, you were the bouncy blonde who never could sit still. That's me, Magnolia laughed. I was a thorn in my teacher's sides back then. Well, you seem to have turned out just fine, Dylan assessed. Thank you, Magnolia said appreciatively. Dylan rubbed his hands together. I hope dinner's ready. I'm starved. We were just fixing to warm everything up. Layla looked at Magnolia. Magnolia went to the stove. What can I do? Layla wiped her hands on her apron. Turn on the burners and stir the food. I'll finish setting the table. I can help, Lexi offered. A short while later, they all gathered around the long farm-style table in the dining room. 
The house was an open floor plan, giving Magnolia a splendid view of the living room, which housed a live Christmas tree trimmed in red ribbons and wooden ornaments. Beside the tree was a massive stacked stone fireplace. The hardy wood mantle was decked out in a plush garland of greenery, pine cones, berries, and ribbon. Stockings hung from the bottom of the mantle. Dylan sat at the head of the table. He cleared his throat ceremoniously as he looked around the table. His gaze settled on Layla, who was directly across from him at the other end, giving her a loving smile. Our family is growing. Magnolia glanced at Lucas, who was seated next to her, but his expression was too guarded to read. Let us pray, Dylan said as he reached out to join hands with Lucas and Lexi, who were sitting closest to him. When Lucas caught hold of Magnolia's hand, her breath hitched. His touch was more thrilling than she would have ever imagined. She tried her best to keep her expression impassive as she reached for Layla's hand. Dylan offered a heartfelt prayer, expressing gratitude for the Christmas season. He mentioned that he was thankful to have Asher and Magnolia join them. The light pressure of Lucas's hand titillated her skin, shooting warm tingles through her. It was crazy how her body was reacting to him. Yes, Magnolia had been crazy about Lucas back in the day, but she'd moved on, hardly giving him a passing thought. Then when she realized that he was the one Lexi was fixing her up with, the old hurt had risen up so fiercely that it had overtaken her reason. It was strange that she'd reacted so strongly to seeing Lucas again. Dylan offered a hearty amen when the prayer was over. Lucas let go of her hand. Instantly, she felt a sense of loss. Interesting. Dig in, Layla encouraged as everyone began passing around bowls of food. Dinner was excellent. Lexi was an incredible cook. The cornbread was good, too. Conversation flowed easily around the table. Dylan asked Lucas about the ranch, and Lucas talked about everything he was doing. It was obvious that he derived great satisfaction from his work. Dylan looked at Lexi and Asher. So how's the music business? A look passed between Lexi and Asher. Great, Lexi gushed. We're going to High Cliff Records tomorrow to lay down some tracks for our new album. We hope to get a good start on it before everything shuts down for the holidays, Asher added. What type of work do you do? Dylan asked. It took Magnolia a second to realize that the question was directed at her. She'd just taken a bite of cornbread. The crumbs got caught in her throat as she coughed to clear it. You okay? Lucas asked. She nodded as she reached for her glass, taking a quick drink of water. Yes, she croaked. Sorry. She cleared her throat, patting the center of her chest. That uh, went down the wrong way. An apologetic smile curled her lips. She swallowed before taking in a quick breath. I I'm an editor for an online fashion and lifestyle magazine. Dylan looked impressed. Are y'all busy this time of the year? We make a practice of staying a season ahead. We're now working on our spring edition. We'll work the rest of this week and next, and we'll then break for the holidays. Speaking of the holidays, Layla cut in, we need to make some concrete plans for Christmas. Panic rippled through Magnolia. She couldn't very well announce that she planned to take Lucas to North Carolina, where she hoped to marry him the day after Christmas. Her heart picked up its pace as she looked across the table at Lexi. Lexi wore an uncomfortable expression as she shifted in her seat. She glanced at Asher before moistening her lips. Um... Asher and I are planning on spending Christmas Day with his family since we were here for Thanksgiving. Layla nodded in disappointment. But we'll for sure spend New Year's Eve and Day here, Lexi added. Oh, good, Layla said, her smile fixing back into place. How about you guys? She turned her gaze to Magnolia and Lucas. Magnolia's pulse hammered in her ears. She had no idea what to say. We'll be heading to North Carolina to spend Christmas with Magnolia's folks. The words flowed easily from Lucas's mouth. Really? Magnolia turned to face him. Are you sure? She searched his handsome face, her eyes asking all that her mouth couldn't right now. Yeah, I'm sure, he said evenly. 
Magnolia wanted to jump up and shout hallelujah. She couldn't stop the jubilant smile from spreading over her lips. Okay, we're doing this. Lucas nodded. Doing what? Dylan asked with a frown. Magnolia blinked. Shoot, she should have taken more care to guard her words. Magnolia was asking if I could take her to North Carolina to visit her folks. I wasn't sure if I could clear my work schedule, but I talked to Knox and Jackson today, and they're good with me taking a few extra days off. Magnolia's jaw dropped. There were so many questions running through her head right now, starting with, when did you change your mind? Obviously, Lucas had been making plans. I guess y'all are getting along better than you let on, Layla said, giving Magnolia a coy grin. A shaky laugh left Magnolia's throat. I guess so. Will y'all be back by New Year's Eve? Layla asked. We're not sure yet, Lucas answered, but we'll keep you posted. The conversation moved to other topics, but Magnolia hardly heard a word. All she could think about was that Lucas had agreed to marry her. Her head was teeming with all sorts of thoughts and plans. There was so much to do, so little time. She had to book flights to Asheville, call the wedding planner, and give her Lucas's tux measurements. Well, first Magnolia had to get the measurements from Lucas. She needed his belt size, shoe size. She needed to coach him on how to deal with her grandfather. Yikes! That would be tricky. Oh, and Lucas needed to know how to navigate Eric Stanford, the attorney over the estate. She would need to take Lucas shopping, buy him some tailored clothes that would fit into the Bentley world. She thought past the wedding. Where would they live? She could work from anywhere. Would Lucas choose to purchase a ranch nearby so he could be close to his family? Magnolia looked around at the group. She couldn't remember the last time, if ever, that she'd felt so comfortable in a family setting. It would be easy to come to adore Layla and Dylan. Sitting here with all of them, the fanciful side of Magnolia could almost make herself believe that she and Lucas were actually a couple, that they were as blissfully in love with one another as Lexi and Asher were. Magnolia knew she was daydreaming, but it was a wonderful dream. She sighed as she glanced at Lucas, admiring the clean edge of his strong jaw. The faint dusting of freckles across his nose gave him a boyish appearance. His spiky hair was as cute as it was reckless. A smile tipped her lips. Lucas gave her a quizzical look. You okay? He whispered. Yep, she quipped. I'm great. She would continue indulging in the fantasy a little longer, if only for tonight. Chapter 4 Magnolia hugged her arms, trying to ward off the frigid air seeping into her bones. After dinner was over, the group moved into the living room where they swapped stories and enjoyed one another's company. When it was time for Magnolia to leave, Lucas offered to walk her out. Being out here alone with Lucas sent a shot of adrenaline through her veins. She turned to him. What made you change your mind about marrying me? Her breath came out in puffs of mist that froze into droplets the instant they left her mouth. He rested his back against the handrail. A funny thing happened today. I was at work. The feeder shorted out. I wanted to call my buddy, Walter McIntosh, who's been begging for our business, but Jackson wouldn't have it. He insisted on calling Vance Bryant. He grunted in disgust. The old curmudgeon charges a fortune. I wouldn't put it past him to just slap a band-aid on the problem, knowing good and well that we'll have to call him every month or so to come back out. Jackson and I had a few words. As always, it's either his way or the highway. He paused, giving Magnolia a meaningful look. I got to thinking about your offer. How nice it would be to get out from underneath Jackson, to have my own ranch. She swallowed the curious disappointment that lumped in her throat. The fantasy was over, taking all the pleasure of the evening with it. This was all business. She forced her voice to go light. 
and here I thought I'd won you over with my cornbread. A lopsided grin tugged at his lips. Well, that too. Their eyes met as the moment slowed. It would be so easy to fall for Lucas all over again. She traced the outline of his lips, her breath coming faster. An erratic energy ricocheted through her. If she kissed him right now, would everything be ruined? Yes, most definitely. Her emotions were running away with her. If she weren't careful, they'd run right off a cliff. Get a grip, she commanded herself as she took a step back to put distance between them. Time was on her side. All she had to do was get Lucas to the altar. Then she'd have five glorious years to make him fall in love with her. She flinched at the direction her thoughts were taking. She was jumping the gun here, thinking love when Lucas didn't even like her. One thing at a time. What happens next? Lucas asked. She clasped her hands, the practical side of her brain taking control. We'll need to get you some new clothes. His eyes bugged before narrowing into slits. What's wrong with my clothes? Nothing, she said lightly. When you're working on the ranch. She paused, trying to figure out how to phrase the rest. Spit it out he demanded. You don't want to be embarrassed by me. His mesmerizing eyes held a direct challenge. He was so formidable, so passionate about every little thing, so deliciously exhilarating. No, that's not it at all. I'd never be embarrassed by you. I think it's awesome that you love what you do. That was the honest truth. Lucas was the type of man that any woman who had an ounce of sense would be proud to claim as hers. His expression was suspicious. Really? She nodded. Really? This doesn't have anything to do with what I think. It's what my grandfather and Eric Stanford, the attorney over the estate, think. They have to both consent to the marriage. He rubbed a hand across his jaw. This is a whole horse wagon of crazy. Tell me about it. Suddenly she couldn't do it. She couldn't take this cowboy, who had such a wonderful life and family, and taint him with the Bentley wealth. She had to think of what was best for Lucas, instead of only thinking of herself. Her eyes prickled with moisture. This isn't going to work. Rock settled in her stomach. I'm sorry she uttered as she turned to leave. Lucas caught her arm. Wait a minute. She turned to face him. He pushed out a heavy breath. Fine, I'll get new clothes. Laughter gurgled in her throat. This isn't about the clothes. It's not? No. Then what? I just don't want you to get corrupted by all of this. My grandfather isn't exactly the warmest and fuzziest person. He's rigid, tough. His laughter cut her off short. What? she demanded. Let me get this straight. You're afraid of corrupting me? Well, yeah. She motioned at the closed door. Your family is so awesome, her voice cracked. What y'all shared tonight? The dinner, the conversation in the living room? I've never had that. A shadow moved over his features. My family's not all peaches and cream. We've got our problems, same as everyone else. It doesn't seem like it. You and I are from two different worlds. You're the rugged cowboy. I'm the hoity-toity princess. I don't see how it's going to work. A dry smile touched his lips. What? I see what you're doing here. Her brows bunched. What do you mean? You dangle the bait, I bite, and now you're retreating. He leaned close, a look of triumph flashing in his eyes. Who's the one afraid of commitment now? She barked out a short laugh. I'm not afraid of commitment. Forgive me for looking out for your best interest. His nearness ignited her cells, cascading tingles through her. 
I don't need you or anyone else looking out for my interest. His voice was hard as flint, the lone warrior facing down the foe. I've been doing a pretty good job of that myself. She lifted her chin. Indeed you have. His caustic attitude was rubbing her the wrong way. You need a husband. I need a ranch. Let's strike a bargain right here and now. He eyed her with a foolhardy defiance, as if he could bend her will to his. She wasn't a horse to be broken. Fine, she spat. Name your terms. It was always the same with Lucas. Magnolia didn't know why she allowed herself to believe it could be any different. He'd never let her get through to the real guy behind the tough facade. She couldn't believe that a few short moments ago she thought she could fall in love with him or that he could grow to love her. After our marriage, you'll buy me the ranch of my choice and you'll agree to pay off the mortgage on my parents' house. Her eyebrow shot up. That's all you want? Shivers ran through her body. Her lungs had a sore, heavy feeling, like she'd been breathing ice. It was so cold out here. She was going to turn into a popsicle. Yep, that's it. What will you give me in return? Time to set the terms, here and now. She wanted him to recognize that she wasn't a pushover. He was amused. I'm marrying you, isn't that enough? Yeah, but where will we live? Together? He looked thoughtful. I suppose we have to keep up appearances. Her heart leapt with anticipation. Luckily, she managed to keep a poker face. What about the baby? A look of horror crossed his features. Do we have to talk about that now? I guess not. But we will have to cross that bridge, eventually. He nodded. We'll have to get to know each other super well so that when we go to North Carolina, we'll be a convincing couple. Okay, he said warily. Her brain began compiling a to-do list. What's your birth date? I'll need to get us plane tickets. Not gonna happen. Huh? I don't fly. An incredulous laugh scratched through her throat. What? What? You're afraid to fly? It was astounding to think that the rough-and-tumble cowboy was afraid to get on an airplane. He clenched his jaw, exuding a bullheaded stubbornness. Not afraid, I just don't like it. I'll drive us to North Carolina. She made a face, her voice going shrill. But what about snow and ice? They'll clear the roads. We'll take my truck. It handles well in the snow. You're serious? Yep. He steeled his jaw. The only way I'm going to North Carolina is if I drive us there. Okay, fine. You can drive. Magnolia loved to travel. She flew all over the world on a regular basis. Have you ever been outside the U.S.? Nope. Don't you want to go to Europe? See Paris in the spring? It's breathtaking. There are so many places I'd like to show you. His eyes registered surprise. Really? She felt hot despite the cold. She'd lost herself for a moment, let her true feelings show. Well, yeah, she said with a disinterested shrug. As my husband, I would just assume that you'd go with me. You know, for appearance's sake. Gotcha. Well, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. Her eyes met his. I guess there are a lot of bridges we'll have to cross. When can we go shopping? I want to take you to Atlanta. Why, they sell plenty of clothes in Nashville, he said dryly. She chuckled. Not the kind that we're looking for. She straightened her shoulders. Okay, I'm freezing out here. I've got to go. Her entire body was stiff as a board from the cold. Are you going back to Lexi's apartment? Yep, that's where I'm staying. It'll be easier for us to get together on a regular basis. I'll walk you to your car. The steps and sidewalk are icy. No thanks, I can manage. She moved away from him and started down the steps. She let out a yelp when her foot nearly slipped out from beneath her. Lucas rushed to her side. Careful, he warned, taking hold of her arm. 
He helped her down the stairs and to the car, supporting her in a strong, protective grip. Her heart swooned a little. His nearness was disconcerting, intoxicating. It irked her that she was so dang attracted to him, especially when he didn't seem to be at all enamored by her. See you Saturday, she said glibly as she got into the car. Be careful driving home, he warned. The roads are slick. Her voice went gooey sweet as she did her best Scarlett O'Hara impression. Why, Lucas Romeo, if I didn't know better, I'd actually think you cared. She batted her eyelashes, a coy smile curving her lips. This tactic often worked with other guys, but she didn't dare hope it would on Lucas. Her body flinched slightly when she saw it, that ghost of a smile that peeked beneath his tough guy mask. She felt like she'd scored a huge victory. The world slowed as they shared a look. Was that a blip of tenderness in his eyes, or was it merely wishful thinking on her part? See you, princess. He winked as he turned and strode back to the house. She turned on the engine as she traced the outline of his erect, confident shoulders. His gait was smooth, confident, the top of his hair bouncing lightly with his every step. An unexpected wave of heat splashed over her, making her want to fan her face. I'm marrying Lucas Romeo, she said aloud, giddy laughter bubbling in her throat. She looked up, her gaze going through the ceiling of the car straight up into heaven. Dearest grandmother... This is all thanks to you. I don't know if I should be cursing you right now or thanking you. Chapter 5 Are you sure we'll be able to make it to Asheville? Magnolia's stomach clenched as she looked through the windshield at the leaden sky. It looked like it could dump snow any second. We'll be fine, Lucas said a faint edge of irritation needling its way into his voice. Magnolia was fast learning that Lucas didn't like her questioning his judgment. Well, the brooding cowboy had better get used to it because she'd always spoken her mind and didn't intend to stop doing so now. I still think we'd have been better off to fly, she huffed. If someone weren't afraid, she cut her eyes at him. His response was as immediate as it was forthright. I'm not afraid. It's like I've told you a hundred times. I don't like to fly. I prefer to keep my feet firmly planted on the ground. She stifled a grin. It was endearing how quickly Lucas rose to the bait. She rolled her eyes and responded with a flippant, You don't have to get so bent out of shape about it. I was just making a statement. No, you were trying to pick a fight. He shot her an ornery look. Okay, she admitted, her voice smooth as silk. You caught me. I guess I was picking a fight. You looked so serious over there that I had to do something to lighten the mood. We've got a long drive ahead of us. I don't want to sit in stone silence the entire time. She shifted in her seat, flicking an imaginary speck of dust from her pants. Lucas wasn't the only one keyed up. She was so nervous she could hardly sit still. She forced herself to take a deep breath in through the nose. You can turn on the radio. She sighed in exasperation. What I want to do is talk. We need to get our story straight. My grandfather and Eric Stanford will put our relationship under the microscope. We only have a few hours to coordinate everything. They were going into the danger zone here, and Lucas seemed oblivious. It was two days before Christmas. Only two days. Could they pull off the charade? Beads of perspiration popped over the bridge of her nose. Get a grip, she commanded herself, balling her hands into fists. In Lucas's defense, how could he possibly know what lay ahead? Magnolia's grandfather wasn't quite as icy and aloof as her grandmother had been but he was definitely a close second. Grandfather hadn't masterminded the trust fund and all of its rigid rules. That had been her grandmother's doing. However, Grandfather was fully determined to carry out Grandmother's wishes to the extent of his ability. When Magnolia spoke to him yesterday over the phone, he questioned why she'd broken up with Roman. 
He expressed concern that perhaps Magnolia had grabbed the first man she could find so that she could fulfill the terms of her trust. Her denial had slipped haltingly from her lips, her face scalding. You'll see how much in love Lucas and I are, she replied with a light chuckle. Yeah, right. This was a disaster. Desperation clawed at the base of her skull. Lucas shrugged. If you wanted to talk, then why didn't you just say so instead of needling me about flying? He hunched his shoulders like he was drawing into himself. Why was he in such a foul mood? She could feel the animosity pouring off him and souring the air like rancid milk. Her spine stiffened. What's with you today? As if she didn't have enough to worry about without adding his rotten mood into the mix. Nothing, he grumbled. Ever since Lucas had picked her up at Lexi's apartment, he'd been on edge. They'd been driving for roughly thirty minutes, and all the while Magnolia's fears were gnawing at her like a pack of ravenous wolves. Apprehension squeezed her lungs in a tight grip, making it difficult to get a good breath. Was Lucas having second thoughts about the marriage? All had gone well with their shopping trip to Atlanta. They'd gotten Lucas a whole new wardrobe. When Magnolia saw him in the expensive, tailored clothes, her heart had skipped a few beats. She realized with a startling jolt that appearance-wise, Lucas could give Roman Abbott or any other upper-crest guy a run for his money. Lucas could walk through the doors of any country club, and they would roll out the red carpet. It was when he opened his mouth that things got dicey, not because Lucas wasn't cultured enough to measure up, but rather because he was so blunt and outspoken. He didn't give a rip what anyone thought of him. While Magnolia admired that about him, it wouldn't fly in the Bentley world. Magnolia had hoped that she and Lucas would be able to get together at least a time or two after their shopping trip to Atlanta so that she could coach him about how to act around her grandfather and Eric Stanford. However, Lucas claimed that he needed to work extra hours at the ranch to make up for the time he'd be taking off during Christmas. Magnolia reminded him that after their marriage, money would no longer be an object for either of them. However, Lucas insisted that he couldn't leave his Uncle Knox in the lurch. Try as she might to explain to him the necessity of them getting together to go over their game plan, Lucas refused. He was the stubbornest man on the planet. Now here they were, on the road to Asheville. In a few short hours, she would be introducing Lucas to Grandfather. They had to put on a convincing act. Their entire future hinged on it. They needed to come up with a plan, make sure their stories synced. Rivulets of sweat rolled between her shoulder blades. She fanned her face. Can you turn down the heat? I'm roasting. He turned down the dial. Thanks, she mumbled. Silence. Okay, enough of this. She angled to face him, squaring her jaw. I know it'll kill you, but while we're at my grandfather's house, you're going to have to act more affectionate towards me. You know, hold my hand, at least pretend that you like me a little. His expression didn't change. He kept staring at the ribbon of road in front of them that split the landscape in a somber bookmark. Was that how it would always be between them? This friction? This animosity? The highway stretched too far in the distance for her to see the end. She swallowed. What was her deal? This situation with Lucas was a business arrangement, nothing more. The sooner she got that through her thick skull, the better. She'd not expected her old feelings for Lucas to resurface. Every time he acted terse or disinterested in her, she felt the sting of rejection all over again. She couldn't figure out why Lucas Romeo elicited such strong emotions in her. He always had. She'd been crazy about him as a kid. And then those few dates that they'd gone on after high school left her feeling like she was walking on air. For one wild moment, Magnolia thought she might have found the right guy for her. Then when Lucas started retreating, she was furious. Her adoration was replaced with an acerbic resentment, much of which was still leaking out years later. 
With Roman, things had been more even-keeled. Deep down, Magnolia had known that she wasn't in love with Roman. But their relationship was fun, easy. Roman was from a world that Magnolia understood. He'd gotten his undergraduate and MBA from Columbia and was planning on getting his doctorate so that he could be a professor. For Roman, making a good impression on the Bentley family and Eric Stanford would have been a walk in the park. The left lane is for passing only, Lucas growled. Magnolia about jumped out of her skin. For a second, she thought Lucas was lashing out at her. Then she realized he was talking to the car directly in front of them. Get over, he threw his hand into the air, barreling up on the car's bumper. Take it easy, Magnolia warned, holding on to the dash. The last thing they needed was to get a ticket, or worse, have an accident. The driver in the car looked elderly from the back. Magnolia didn't want Lucas to scare the man and cause him to have an accident. Lucas glanced in his rearview mirror, the muscles in his jaw pulsing. Cars are backing up behind us. This idiot needs to get over. He looked like he was furious enough to chew through metal. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the car did get over into the right lane. Lucas punched the gas, blowing past the car. That did it. A molten spark of indignation split through Magnolia's head as she whirled around. What are you doing? Driving. You're acting like an imbecile. You need to slow down, she ordered. He smirked as he punched the gas, making them go even faster. You're such a moron, she seethed. That's it. We're done here. She couldn't spend another minute in this situation, much less the next five years. Hot tears burned her eyes. She had no idea what she would do if she didn't marry Lucas, but right now she didn't care. I'm giving everything to this venture, but you couldn't care less. She felt his surprise as he slowed the truck to a more reasonable pace and moved over into the right lane, but it was too late. Her anger was on a runaway train going straight down a ravine. She rushed on. You are the most bullheaded, insensitive person I've ever met. I can't do this. She sucked in a ragged breath. I'd be better off with a cheating louse like Roman than to put up with your crap. Her voice rose to a shrill. Turn around and take me back. I said this is over. He didn't respond, just kept on driving. Tears rolled down her cheeks. She didn't bother wiping them away, but sat with her arms clamped over her chest. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, he spoke. I'm sorry, he said quietly. She blinked. He pushed out a long breath. You're right. I'm being a jerk. You think? She shot back. She was beyond shocked that he was actually admitting fault. It's been a rough morning and I was taking it out on you. I'm sorry, he said again. The strain in his voice cut through her anger. What happened? When he didn't answer right away, she feared that he would keep shutting her out. A minute later, he sighed. I stopped by to check on my parents this morning before going to get you. I found my mom at the kitchen table bawling her eyes out. Magnolia forgot about her irritation at Lucas as her attention shifted to Layla. Why? She and my dad had an argument. He paused, throwing her a glance. You sure you want to hear this? You might get a not-so-rosy peek into the life of the Romeos. His voice held a note of bitter irony. I want to hear it, she affirmed. He tightened his hold on the steering wheel. Earlier that morning before I arrived, my dad had given my mom a diamond bracelet as an early Christmas present. Magnolia didn't see how a diamond bracelet could lead to an argument, but she didn't dare say a word for fear of causing Lucas to clam up. My mom freaked out because it was so expensive. Oh, wow. All Lucas wanted out of their marriage was a ranch and for Magnolia to pay off his parents' mortgage. Are your parents having financial problems? Her words gushed out. If they need money to pay off debts, we can give it to them after we get the inheritance. We? Yeah, we. She heard his surprise and didn't know what he was getting at. You mean after you get the inheritance? She waved a hand. 
That's what I meant. Color fanned her cheeks. It was so easy for her to think of them as we. How she wished that Lucas could learn to trust her. Magnolia was beginning to detest Lucas's ex-wife, Renee, for doing such a number on him. I appreciate the offer, but my parents are doing okay financially. Right now. The way he said right now made her think that they did need help. My mom panicked because she was worried that my dad had started back gambling. She thought that might have been how he paid for the bracelet with money that he won. Not at all what she'd expected to hear. From the outside looking in, Lucas's family had seemed so perfect. It just went to prove that no one was exempt from problems. Magnolia's pastor always said that the purpose of this life is to be tested, to see if we'll choose to do right when the going gets tough. I'm sorry, that must be hard. Yeah, was all he said. Several beats passed. Magnolia became aware of the motion of the truck moving along the road. She sought for the right words to delve deeper into the conversation without ticking Lucas off. Is your dad okay? Lexi had never mentioned anything about her dad having a gambling problem. Then again, Magnolia and Lexi had been apart for years and were just now getting close again. Why would Lexi mention it? No one wanted to expose the skeletons in the closet. He's doing much better. As it turns out, he hasn't been gambling. He's been squirreling away money for six months to surprise my mom. That's why Dad got so upset when Mom asked if he'd been gambling. The two of them argued, and Dad stormed out. He let out a heavy breath. I just worry about my parents. Dad's doing so much better, I don't want anything to set him off, put him into a state where he'll backslide. Magnolia caught the slight quiver of apprehension in Lucas's voice. It tugged at her sympathies. Without thinking, she put a hand on his arm. He tensed his arm for a split second before relaxing under her touch. Can you call and check on him? I tried. He didn't answer. Maybe you should call your mom. She might have spoken to him by now. Suddenly, a revelation dawned on her. You would have already called your mom, but you didn't want to do it with me in the truck. She could tell from the look on his face that she'd hit the nail square on the head. His bicep muscle felt taut and rigid beneath her fingertips. Sheesh, he was cut. She had the ridiculous urge to run her hand over his arm to further soothe his frustration. Instead, she removed her hand. I'm glad you told me what was going on. His jaw relaxed a fraction, as did his hold on the steering wheel. Magnolia felt a tiny streak of victory. Maybe there was hope for them, after all. She wanted to be there for Lucas. She wanted to understand him. She wanted the two of them to find common ground. It was too much for her to hope that he might one day come to care about her. Right now, a friendship would have to suffice. Go ahead and call her now, if you want, she offered. He retrieved his phone from the console, pressed a button, and put it to his ear. Hey, Mom, how's it going? Are you okay? Dad's there with you? Oh, good. I'm glad y'all got it worked out. Hearing the relief in Lucas's voice brought a tiny smile to Magnolia's lips. She was glad that everything was okay. She'd been so caught up in her own turmoil, trying to figure out how to find a husband before the deadline, that she'd only been thinking of herself. She tried to put herself in Lucas's shoes. He was going along with his life, business as usual, when she pulled him onto this uncertain path. It would be a lot for anyone to take in. She needed to be more understanding of Lucas, overlook as much of his moodiness as she could. It was just that he could be so dang infuriating. When he ended the call a few minutes later, his spirits were much lighter. They got it all worked out. They're fine. I'm so glad. He glanced at her giving her a grateful smile that bathed her in sunshine. Thank you. She was struck by his sincerity, the warmth in his masculine voice. You're welcome. His jaw worked as he shifted in his seat. 
Okay, I know you've been trying to pin me down so that we can get our act together. Yep, she chuckled, and it's been like trying to pin Jello to the wall. I hear you, he drawled in an easy tone. Several beats passed before he spoke. Look, about what happened earlier with the driver, I have a temper. I'm trying to work on it, but sometimes... He shook his head in defeat. I understand. Magnolia thought of what Layla had told her about Lucas putting up a tough wall, but being a teddy bear inside. Magnolia was starting to see that. I know all of this has thrown you for a loop, she grunted out a laugh. It has thrown me for a loop, too, and I've had six years to process it. For the record, I have a temper, too. A teasing smile tugged at his lips. You? I never would have guessed that. The princess has a temper. This time the word princess held a term of endearment that hadn't been there before. She liked it. She felt dainty, cherished. Getting these tiny golden nuggets from Lucas was like trying to capture scattered sunlight that managed to break through the dense curtain of dark clouds. His voice grew pragmatic. Okay, tell me everything I need to know about your family. She slid her tongue over her lips as she composed her thoughts. You'll like my father, she began. He's debonair, fairly easy to talk to. Lucas made a face. Do you call him father or dad? Most of the time, father. It just seems more appropriate. Dads are the ones who play with their kids in the backyard, tell jokes, watch movies, and eat popcorn. Her stomach twisted as she swallowed. My father never did any of those things. But I know he loves me, she inserted quickly when she saw the shock written over Lucas's face. How could your dad father not have played with you or told you jokes. She clasped her hands in her lap. He was always too busy with work, I suppose, and he has a hard time showing emotion. I can count on one hand the number of times my father has told me he loved me. She forced a laugh. He'd just give me his credit card instead and tell me to get whatever I wanted. Her voice went a notch higher. So I did. Well, what about your mom? What's she like? You lived with her when you were in Franklin, right? Yes, she pursed her lips. Let's see, how can I describe my mom? She's a beautiful butterfly with these enchanting wings of all sorts of glorious colors. You want to capture her and hold her close to your heart, but she's too ethereal, never stopping to land one place long enough. I always wondered how it was that my mom and father ended up together. They're so different. My mom's so carefree, so unconcerned about society and all of its expectations. She nibbled on her lower lip. But then, a few years ago, my mom married Dave. Resentment tightened her insides. Dave's the CEO of a hospital. He's straight-laced, uptight. Her eyes narrowed. Dave's got his hooks so deep into my mom that she can't make a move without his permission. Her head moved back and forth. There must be something in my mom that craves order and restraint. Otherwise, why would she be attracted to those types of men? What's your type of guy? The comment broadsided her, and she began blinking so fast that it was a wonder her eyelashes didn't take flight. You'll have to earn the right to an answer to that question, mister. Ah, so that's how it works, he mused, a smile tipping his lips. I guess I'll have to see what I can do. Magnolia liked this side of Lucas. He could be the picture of charm when he wanted. She threw out her next questions with laughter coating her voice. How about you? What's your type? A low, throaty chuckle sounded in his throat. Oh, no, princess, this street goes both ways. I'll tell you when you tell me. I guess we're at an impasse. A grin stretched over his lips. I guess so. A minute or so later, he threw her a glance. What was the clown like? Clown? She asked dubiously. The slime ball who cheated on you. The disgust in Lucas's voice was gratifying. Oh, that clown. 
She pursed her lips, compiling a profile of Roman. He's good-looking, charismatic, driven for success, runs in my same social circles. Lucas grunted. In other words, he would have been a shoe-in to take to North Carolina. Yeah, she admitted. On paper, Roman Abbott looks perfect. A sour taste rose in her mouth. It's the real-life commitment part where he needs some work. Any man stupid enough to cheat on you should be hung up by his toenails and horsewhipped, Lucas muttered. Laughter gurgled in her throat. I agree. She tried to dissect the meaning of Lucas's words. Had he given her a compliment? Or was his wrath coming from his own experience with his cheating ex-wife? Lucas switched gears. Tell me about your grandfather. My grandfather's tough. He's not quite as aloof and rigid as my grandmother, but he comes pretty close. Already he's questioning how the two of us could have fallen in love so quickly. He was expecting me to bring Roman to North Carolina, and now he's having to get used to the idea of there being someone new. Interesting. What? Your grandfather knows the conditions of your trust fund, meaning that he knows the kind of pressure you're under to find a husband, and yet... He's faulting you for it? The truth of Lucas's words was a punch in the stomach. The injustice of the situation was a perpetual thorn in her side. Yep, that's my grandfather. So the money came from your grandmother's side of the family? Yes. My grandfather's parents were affluent, but their wealth wasn't even a drop in the bucket compared to my grandmother's wealth. That's right. The money originally came from oil. She nodded. Did your grandparents marry for love or duty? She tilted her head. You know, I'm not sure. I do know that they loved each other. My grandmother wasn't the easiest person to get along with, but my grandfather adored her. He was devastated when she passed away. Snowflakes were falling on the windshield. The wipers flicked them away in a methodic rhythm. What did your grandmother die of? A heart attack. It was totally unexpected. How did your grandparents feel about your mom and dad's marriage? They were totally against it. They disowned my father, wouldn't speak to him for years. In fact, it wasn't until after my parents got divorced that my grandparents reconciled with my father. They wrote him back into their will. When my grandfather passes away, my father will inherit everything. She could almost see the wheels turning in Lucas's head. What are you thinking? Did the demise of your parents' marriage have anything to do with the money? An invisible fist clenched Magnolia's stomach. I... I'm not sure. Even in her own ears, the words came out unconvincing. My father adamantly denies it. My mom refuses to talk about it. She shrugged. So yeah, the money probably did play into it. Your grandmother lost control of her son for a time, so she set up a $10 million trust fund for her only granddaughter, stipulating that you get the money, providing that you get married. He held up a finger. But wait, there's more. Your grandfather and the head attorney, what's his name? Eric Stanford. Your grandfather and Eric Stanford have to both approve. His voice took on an edge. This whole thing is about control. Her muscles tensed. Yep, you pegged it. That's exactly what it's about. How does your dad feel about the trust conditions? He's frustrated, same as me. But there's nothing that either of us can do about it. My grandmother made sure that the specifics of the trust were ironclad. We've had scores of attorneys look at it. The only way I'm getting my inheritance is if I comply with all of the rules. Does it bother you that you're being forced to get married and have a child? A hot, acrid anger surged through her. Of course it does. I mean, I've always wanted to get married and have a family. Her voice cracked. But I wanted it to be on my terms. I wanted to find someone who loved me for me, not for the money. Emotion rose in her throat as she swallowed it back down. She forced her voice to go light. Anyway... It is what it is. A thin laugh rose in her throat. Many people would kill to be in this position. 
I'm about to become a multimillionaire. They rode in silence until Lucas spoke. Have you ever considered throwing in the towel? Telling your grandfather and the attorney to stick it where the sun don't shine? A startled laugh pushed through her throat. More times than you can count, he gave her a shrewd look. And yet, here we are. Here we are, she swallowed. You could just wait until your father passes and then inherit everything. She chewed on her inner lip. Yeah, I suppose I could. But I don't want to wait until I'm old and wrinkled to get my inheritance. I want it now so I can enjoy it. She paused, gripping her hands. I'm sorry I'm putting you in this situation. I don't want you to get cankered by the money. Lucas was a man of high principles. His life was simple. He went to work, earned a living. He had a good, caring family that was warm and open. He could be anyone he wanted to be, love whomever he pleased. Magnolia would like to hope that her father had been the same way once. After all, he would defied her grandparents' wishes and married her mom, and yet he wasn't strong enough to stay the course. You aren't holding a gun to my head. I agreed to this of my own accord. Because you want a ranch, she held her breath, awaiting his response. Of course that's what he wanted. Her head knew this, but her heart kept holding out unreasonable hope that just maybe he might care a smidgen for her. Yeah, I want the ranch. His gaze caught hers. Amongst other things, he uttered. The look in his eyes jolted her to the core. For the tiniest of moments, she thought he might care. Her jaw about hit the floor when he reached over and caught hold of her hand, linking his fingers through hers. A sharp, fierce desire pinged through her with enough force to steal her breath. His warmth flowed into her skin, lighting her cells on fire. You're holding my hand, he winked. I figured I'd better get used to showing you some affection, you know, for appearance's sake. She laughed, feeling light enough to fly, just for appearance's sake. Her head argued that it probably was just as he'd said, for the sake of appearance. However, her thirsty heart was so eager for any amount of affection from him that she couldn't help but drink up every last drop. She was pathetic, she knew. She'd always had a thing for Lucas. Obviously, not much had changed. The best that she could hope for at this point was that he would take careful care of her heart. Otherwise, she was headed for a big heartache, the likes of which she'd never before seen. Chapter 6 The snow was getting worse. It didn't help that they were on a narrow, winding road. An hour ago, Lucas had taken a detour off the interstate. He glanced over at Magnolia, who was sleeping soundly, her blonde tresses trailing like spun gold across the back of the seat where her head was resting. She was a princess in every sense of the word, and drop-dead gorgeous to boot. Contrary to what he told her that night at his parents' house, it hadn't been Jackson or the incident with the feeder that prompted Lucas to take Magnolia up on her offer. Rather, it had been the things she said that night at the kitchen table, when she hadn't realized he was listening. The tender wistfulness of Magnolia's voice had evoked an ache deep inside him, making him remember for one brief moment what it was like to be loved. The way she'd looked at him that night on the porch, her eyes ablaze with hope. He couldn't help but agree to go along with the ruse. She wanted a knight in shining armor to ride in on a white horse and save her. He thought that night that he had it in him to be that guy. Then afterwards, in the clear light of day, he had a freak-out moment. He'd called Lexi, telling her that there was no way he could marry someone for money. And have a child together? That was insane. Lexi talked him off the ledge, telling him that Magnolia needed him. She's desperate, Lexi had said. She'll marry someone. It's better for her to be with you. You won't take advantage of her. His gaze drifted over to her heart-shaped face, tracing the delicate outline of her jaw. Her skin was milky and smooth, 
her dainty lashes fluttering faintly every so often in her sleep. There was something so childlike and naive about Magnolia. He'd felt her watching him with hopeful eyes. The attraction to her was strong, making it hard to keep her at bay. However, he didn't want to do anything to confuse the situation. When René walked out the door, he'd plugged the hole in his heart with a stony disinterest. Sure, he dated, but he kept a clear line drawn, refusing to ever be put at the mercy of a woman again. Also, it wouldn't be fair to Magnolia to misrepresent what this situation was. Lucas did want the ranch so badly that he could taste it. Now that the idea had taken hold, it flamed like a fire inside him. His desire for the ranch made him feel guilty. He felt like he was taking advantage of Magnolia and the situation. Had her ex-boyfriend not cheated on her, she'd be getting married to him. Lucas didn't know if he should be thanking the guy or punching his lights out. His thoughts went to his parents. What would they think when they learned about the wedding? Would his mom be ticked because she didn't know about it, or would she just be relieved that Lucas was finally settling down? This morning, seeing his mom so upset had rattled Lucas, taking him back to that dark time when the family was on pins and needles, wondering if his dad would be okay. Lucas hadn't intended on telling Magnolia about his dad's gambling problem, but he was glad he did. It felt good to get it off his chest, to confide in someone. The things Magnolia told him about her family floored him. He'd always thought of Magnolia as an entitled diva, but listening to her talk, he could understand why she acted like she did. For all of his parents' flaws, he knew that they loved him and Lexi, their family was close, and despite his long-standing rivalry with Jackson, Lucas was close to his first cousins. Knox was like a second father to him. Magnolia didn't know what it was like to be part of a close-knit family. The money was all she had, all she knew. No wonder she was so desperate to get her inheritance. He wondered what the next few days would bring. He was dreading meeting Magnolia's grandfather, he could tell that Magnolia feared Lucas wouldn't measure up. While he put up a confident front to Magnolia, the truth was, he was in way over his head here. If only he were more like his cousins. When he'd gotten the new clothes, he felt a bit like Ramsay, the sharp dresser of the bunch. Lucas wished he had Cash's quick wit and brains, or Noah's finesse. Heck, he'd even settle for Jackson's bullheaded confidence right now. Lexi had always accused Lucas of being on the defensive where their cousins were concerned. You need to stop comparing yourself to them, Lexi said, and be yourself. You are enough. Was he enough? He certainly didn't feel like it. There was part of him that was riddled with holes. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't plug the leaks. The practical side of his brain insisted that all he could do was be himself, and try to buff out the rough edges. He and Magnolia had decided to keep their stories as straightforward and close to the truth as possible. They'd reconnected when Lexi went to stay with Magnolia prior to the reality TV show. The narrative was short and sweet. He could handle that. Lucas thought back to the handful of dates he and Magnolia had gone on. In some ways, it seemed like it was another lifetime. And then in other ways... The foibles of the past still clung to them, wrapping them in a shroud of regrets that would be better off buried and forgotten. The night they went to the drive-in stood out in his mind. They'd connected, never running out of things to talk about. Lucas could tell that Magnolia was crazy about him. It scared him. Back then, he wasn't anywhere near ready to settle down, so he'd played it cool intending to politely put distance between him and Magnolia. She wasn't going to have it, however. She pressed the issue, which led to the fight. They'd called each other names, said cutting things, and went their separate ways. Now here they were, years later. Life could be a strange beast sometimes. Snow was falling harder, sticking to the windshield, despite the wiper's efforts to wick it away. Magnolia stirred. Lucas tensed. 
She was not going to be happy when she learned that he'd taken a detour. There was a ranch for sale that he'd found online. According to the GPS, it would only take an extra hour to visit it. Lucas figured they might as well check it out while they were so close. It wasn't as if an extra hour would make much difference in their schedule. Then again, with the snow coming down hard, they would be delayed more than an hour. Turn right in 200 feet, the GPS instructed. He slowed, pulling onto a gravel road. You have arrived, the GPS announced. Lucas surveyed the area. He'd hoped there might be a for sale sign or ranch entrance, something to let him know that they were in the right place. But there was nothing. Magnolia opened her eyes as she sat up and looked around. Where are we? I decided to take a detour, he said casually. There's a ranch that I want to check out. Her eyes flew open wide. And you picked today, of all days, to go and look at it? Her expression held a mixture of disbelief and frustration. Yeah, the ranch was pretty much on the way. I figured it would be easier to look at it when we were in the area, rather than having to come back later. A layer of red seeped into her cheeks. How much time is this going to cost us? I figured it would take an extra hour. He could almost see the wheels turning in her head, she was irritated by his deviation from the schedule, and yet she was trying to be understanding. He admired that about Magnolia, how she was trying to find some common ground with him. Finally, she sighed. Okay, that's not too bad. A second later, her voice pitched. The snow's coming down hard. She threw him a worried glance. It wouldn't be good for us to get stuck out here in the middle of nowhere in a blizzard. We need to get to Asheville so we can get everything ready for the wedding. We won't get stuck. His truck handled well in the snow. Even so, had Lucas realized how hard it would start snowing, he might have thought twice about taking the detour. Magnolia hugged her arms. This place is so remote. That's the idea, he grinned. You sure there's a ranch down there? she asked a few minutes later as they continued down the long gravel road. There was nothing but glistening snowy pastures on either side of the road. No, he wasn't sure of anything at this point. I guess we'll find out. They came to a gravel road that shot off to the right. Do we take that one or stay straight? Magnolia asked in a voice that was clearly worried. Lucas slowed to a stop. Let me check the GPS. He reached for his phone, his gut tensing a smidgen. There's no service. Seriously? Magnolia rolled her eyes. That's not good. Maybe we should turn around and go back. We can't afford to get stuck out here. We'll go just a little farther. If we don't find it, we'll turn around and head back to the interstate. She nodded, her jaw tight. Lucas looked through the snow further up ahead on the road they were on. His pulse quickened. Look, there's a car up ahead. He continued driving in that direction. They came upon not one, but two cars. A group of people was standing a few paces in front of the cars. Oh, good, we can ask them where the ranch is, Magnolia said in relief. Lucas spotted the tall, rail-skinny man first, wearing a navy coat and matching knit hat. A thickly set woman wearing a gray coat was standing beside the man, bracing herself with a walker. Flaming red curls peeked out beneath the hood of her coat. The deep red strands of her hair were a stark contrast to the glistening white dots of snow. Three teenage boys faced the couple. Something about the scene was off. The couple looked scared. At the same time, Lucas heard Magnolia's startled breath. He realized that the boy in the center was holding a knife. Those boys are attacking that couple, Magnolia exclaimed in dismay. We have to call 911. The sight of the boys preying on the older couple scalded Lucas's blood. He threw the truck into park and undid his seatbelt. Magnolia caught hold of his arm, her eyes filling with alarm. You can't go out there. You'll get hurt. There are three of them. Lucas hated bullies with a passion. A bunch of thugs preying on a defenseless older couple was reprehensible. Stay here. I'll be fine. No, she protested but he was already out the door. His footsteps were soundless against the thick blanket of fallen snow. 
What's going on here? Lucas demanded. The teenagers whirled around in surprise. Their backs had been to the road, and they undoubtedly had not heard Lucas's truck over the falling snow. The ones on the outside wore expressions of fright, like they might flee. But the one in the center, the ringleader, narrowed his eyes. This is none of your business, mister. Get out of here before you get hurt. He held out the knife, pointing it at Lucas. Don't make me use this. The boy's brazenness seemed to embolden his cohorts as they held up their fists, ready to fight. Lucas glanced back at the couple. Y'all okay? The woman nodded in the affirmative. Her expression was pinched, her eyes clouded with apprehension. I said get out of here, the teenager in the middle hissed. This ain't none of your business. Lucas took a quick assessment of the situation, his senses going on full alert. His pulse thrashed out a fast beat against his temples, everything coming into razor-sharp focus. He felt the cold ping of snowflakes against his warm face. He became aware of the buffer against sound that the snow created, as if the entire world were wrapped in a thick white pillow. Three against one was not ideal. Lucas focused on the main guy in the middle. He'd go after the head of the snake, and the body would fall easily enough. His muscles pulled taut as he planted his feet, getting into a crouching position. Come on, you little snot, he taunted, pointing at the guy. Me and you. The teenager's face blushed a furious red as he rushed forward, intent on slashing Lucas with the knife. But Lucas sidestepped the attempt. He caught the guy's arm and threw a punch that landed on the guy's jaw with a sickening thud. The kid grunted in surprise. Lucas twisted the guy around and yanked his arm behind his back. He doubled over with a yelp. Lucas wrenched the kid's hand, forcing him to drop the knife. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw another kid lunge for the knife, but Lucas was faster. He gave it a swift kick, knocking it out of the guy's reach. He shoved the ringleader face first into the ground before turning to the other guys. They came at him at the same time. Lucas socked the first one square in the nose, knocking him back. The teen's hands went to his nose as blood spurted out. The second tried to grab him from behind, but Lucas jabbed him in the eye with his elbow. A few more swift hits and a kick and all three guys were down. With a groan, the ringleader staggered to his feet like he was going to come at Lucas again. He wiped his bloody lip on his sleeve. You've made a big mistake, mister, he sneered. Stop right there, a woman commanded. It went through Lucas's mind that it was Magnolia who'd spoken. She was holding the knife. Her jaw set in a steely determination, her blonde locks flapping. Lucas had kicked the knife in the direction of his truck, never dreaming that Magnolia would pick it up. I said back off, she screamed, wielding the knife. Her beautiful face was a picture of warrior-like tenacity. If Lucas hadn't been worried that Magnolia would get hurt, he would have been impressed by her grit. He was a trace bit amused that she actually thought she could take on all three kids. The princess had more torque than he realized. From the corner of his eye, Lucas saw movement and realized the head honcho was making a run for Magnolia. Lucas was close enough to trip the guy with his foot, sending him sprawling. I'd stay down if I were you the older woman warned. Clay Brewster, I mean it. She pointed a finger at the ringleader. You too, Willie. Surprise rattled through Lucas as he turned to the older woman. You know these jokers? Unfortunately, yes, she spat in a gravelly tone, the loose skin under her jowl jiggling. Just give us what we came here for and we'll leave you alone, Willie said. A light laugh floated from the woman's throat. Willie McHenry, I have no idea what you're talking about. Sam and I came out here to find a Christmas tree. She glanced at the tall man. Didn't we? Yes, ma'am. That's why we're here, he said dutifully. Lucas glanced at Magnolia to get her take on the situation. Something strange was going on here. The man and woman had something that the teenagers wanted. The older woman puckered her ruby red lips in distaste as she eyed the teenagers. Melissa will be so disappointed when I tell her what you've done. The boys' faces fell. She continued, 
and when Cannon hears about it, he'll go out of his mind. I don't care what you tell Cannon, the ringleader asserted, but his voice lacked conviction. The older woman had known just what to say to guilt-trip her assailants into a timid state of regretful embarrassment. She motioned with her head. Go on, get back to the Garrett house, and stop pulling shenanigans, or I'll do more than just talk to Melissa and Cannon. Next time, I'll call the police. The boys got up and scrambled to their car. They started the engine and peeled off, slinging gravel behind them. Thank you so much, the older woman began as she flashed an appreciative smile. Her curious gaze moved from Lucas to Magnolia. You two are quite the team, she said appraisingly. If you hadn't come along when you did, there's no telling how that would have ended. Lucas studied the woman. Her curls were so flaming red that they looked fake, like they belonged on a doll. Her makeup bordered on being gaudy, with her bright blue eyeshadow, her heavily penciled thin brows, the streaks of blush and red lipstick. Are you sure you don't want to call the police? Those hoodlums could cause a lot of trouble. They could hurt someone. The boys are staying at the Garrett House, a local shelter for children and women. Willie's a menace, but he's come by it honestly. His mom left when he was seven. He's being raised by his dad, who's an alcoholic. The other two boys share similar stories. Even through her diamond-encrusted glasses, Lucas could see the compassion shining in her eyes. This is a tough time for a lot of people. Lucas nodded. He knew all too well how hard the holidays could be. There was one bright spot to his situation this year. He was so caught up with Magnolia and impressing her grandfather that he would have little time to dwell on Renee's betrayal. Magnolia looked down, her eyes widening in mortification, like she'd just now realized that she was still holding the knife. I have no idea what to do with this. Gingerly, she held it up with her index finger and thumb, pinching the handle. I'll take it, the thin man said as Magnolia handed it over. What were the boys wanting you to give them? Lucas asked. There was definitely more to this story than the couple was letting on. Our wallets, I'm guessing, the woman said as she glanced at Sam. Lucas could tell the woman wasn't being truthful, but it wasn't his place to give her the third degree. All he wanted to do was look at the ranch and then get on the road. At this point, maybe he should forego seeing the ranch. With this much snow, the roads were bound to be treacherous. Snowflakes were steadily falling. Magnolia wrapped her arms around her body, shivering. It's f f freezing out here, she chattered. Let's get you back in the truck. Lucas stepped close to Magnolia and placed an arm around her. Now that the adrenaline had worn off, he too was starting to get chilled. Magnolia nestled close to him. He liked the feel of her next to him. Somehow, it felt as right for them to be together as it was thrilling. Interesting. A saying his mom often said darted through his mind. Often, life's greatest blessings come as a complete surprise. Is there anything more we can do to help? Lucas asked the couple. On first glance, he assumed that the man and woman were about the same age, but now that he'd gotten a better look at them, he realized that the man was a good decade or more younger than the woman. The woman's curious eyes flicked over Lucas and Magnolia. Are the two of you new to remember? Just passing through, Lucas answered. We're heading to Asheville, Magnolia added. The woman frowned. You won't get very far in this weather. We should probably get on the road, Lucas said, before the roads are impassable. How in the world did the two of you end up here, in this remote area? The woman chuckled. Not that I'm complaining, mind you. You are angels sent straight from heaven. Yes, they are, the man agreed. I'm looking to buy a ranch, Lucas answered. Supposedly there's one for sale nearby. The woman's eyes widened as she turned to the man. I'll bet he's talking about Arthur Vincent's ranch. Is it at the end of this road? Lucas asked. The woman shook her head. No, it's on another gravel road a mile or so from here. The GPS led us here, Lucas said in defense as he glanced at Magnolia. 
The detour had cost them much more time than he'd anticipated. If the storm worsened, they could be forced to pull off the road and get a hotel for the night. Magnolia wouldn't be happy about that. At least they'd been able to help the man and woman. Lucas shuddered to think what would have happened if he and Magnolia hadn't shown up when they did. The woman offered a warm smile. You are certainly an answer to our prayers. Thank you both for coming to our rescue. We are in your debt. I'm glad we could help, Lucas said casually. He wasn't looking for a pat on the back. He'd seen people in trouble and had reacted. He was impressed that Magnolia had jumped in to help. There were more layers to her than he realized. The older woman's expression grew sheepish. I hate to be more trouble, but Willie and his accomplices sliced our tires. Lucas looked over at the black sedan. The tires were indeed all flat. We'll be happy to give you a ride wherever you need. Do you live nearby? Magnolia asked. Lucas didn't have to be a mind reader to ascertain Magnolia's thoughts. They'd already lost so much time. The clock was ticking. He felt the same way, but they had to help the couple regardless. We're about ten miles away, the man said. We're happy to give you a ride, Lucas repeated. He could feel the vibrations of Magnolia's shivering. Let's all get into the truck where it's warm. Magnolia looked at the woman, her gaze lingering on the walker. You can sit in the front. That will be more comfortable for you. Thank you, dear, the woman said. You are so kind. She pointed to her chest. By the way, I'm Lillian Yates. This is Sam Johnson. I'm Magnolia Bentley, and this is Lucas Romeo, Magnolia answered. Lillian blinked. Oh, I thought the two of you were married. Not yet. Our wedding is the day after Christmas. There was a touch of pride in Magnolia's voice. Lucas felt a strange sense of pleasure in hearing those words. Granted, he was also petrified. It would take a while for him to wrap his mind around everything that was happening, one step at a time. Lillian giggled with delight. I love Christmas weddings. Her eyes sparkled. You should stay the night at the inn. You shouldn't be out in this storm. It's not safe. Inn? Magnolia asked dubiously. The Magnolia Blossom Inn. We're nearly booked to capacity, but we do have one room open. She looked at Sam, grinning. We'll let them have it free of charge. She homed in on Magnolia, her eyes twinkling. It's only fitting that you stay the night, since you and the inn share the same name. Thank you, that's very kind of you, Magnolia began. But my grandfather is expecting us to arrive this evening. Lillian wasn't the least bit deflated by Magnolia's refusal. She flashed a large smile. The invitation stands. Let's see how the weather is when we get to the inn, shall we? You can make your final decision then. Magnolia looked like she might argue, but nodded instead as they turned to go to the truck. Sam grabbed Lillian's purse out of the sedan and helped her get seated before climbing into the back seat. Magnolia sat behind Lucas's seat. He blasted the heat, which felt heavenly after the frigid cold. As Lucas turned the truck around and headed back down the gravel road, he was struck by how much more snow covered the road now than before. When he turned onto the main road, the truck slid momentarily before the wheels caught traction. Magnolia gasped from behind. It was slow going. Lucas clutched the steering wheel with both hands, sitting up, his spine bored stiff as he peered through the endless barrage of white balls, pounding the windshield like golf balls. A thick silence descended over the group. The farther they went, the more Lucas was coming to realize that Lillian was right. It wasn't safe to be on the roads. The glum realization settled over him that they wouldn't have any other choice but to stay somewhere tonight. Magnolia wouldn't be happy. Guilt pulled a hard string at him. Asheville was only an hour and a half away. Had he not taken the detour, they might be at her grandfather's house by now. Tell me about your upcoming wedding. Lillian prompted in a cheery voice. Lucas suspected that it was her way of easing the tense silence. Where is it taking place? We're getting married at my grandfather's home in Asheville. Asheville's a beautiful city. I know it well, Lillian answered. 
Sam, didn't Leah Bradshaw and her husband get married in a church in downtown Asheville? I believe so, he answered, but I'd have to ask Melinda to know for sure. Sam's wife, Melinda, is a beautician, Lillian explained. She knows everyone. Lucas was curious to know the relationship between Lillian and Sam, but he didn't want to come out and ask. Magnolia, however, held no such reservations. Sam, what is your and Lillian's connection? I work for Lillian. What type of work do you do? Lucas glanced in the rearview mirror at Sam. I help Lillian run her in. Sam's the most dependable, exemplary employee I've ever had, Lillian said. Let me tell you, that speaks for a lot. It's hard to find people you can depend on. Yes, it is, Magnolia asserted, with such fervor that Lucas wondered if it was a jab at him. He glanced in the rearview mirror. Magnolia shot him an annoyed look. Yep, that's exactly what she was getting at. A thundercloud settled over him as he scowled. Things had been going so well with him and Magnolia. He was starting to feel a strong connection to her. Lucas supposed that was short-lived. Either Lillian was oblivious to the brittle tension running between Lucas and Magnolia, or she chose to ignore it. Her voice was solicitous when she spoke. Magnolia, you said you were going to visit your grandfather. I take it you're from Asheville? She looked at Lucas. Are you also from Asheville? I'm from Franklin, Tennessee, Lucas answered. Right outside of Nashville, Magnolia spoke up. I'm from New Orleans. My grandfather lives in Asheville. That's why we're having the wedding there. What's your grandfather's name? Lillian asked. I know a lot of people in Asheville. Benjamin Bentley? I know Benjamin well, Lillian answered with a gush of pleasure. He and my late husband Howard were close business associates and friends, she laughed. Wow, it's a small world. Lucas's jaw dropped. He looked back at Magnolia. She was also stunned. His brain connected the dots. If Lillian's husband ran in the same circles as Magnolia's grandfather, then Lillian was undoubtedly wealthy. One certainly wouldn't have gathered that from looking at her. When she removed the hood from her head, Lucas realized she was wearing dangly earrings in the shape of Christmas presents. Everything about Lillian was over the top. She might have been an attractive woman had her makeup and hair not been so glaring. Lillian put her hands together. It's settled. You guys are staying at the inn tonight. But my grandfather's expecting us tonight, Magnolia objected. I'm sure Benjamin will understand. He wouldn't want you out in bad weather. If need be, I can call Benjamin and explain the situation. Tell him all about you and Lucas's heroic actions in saving me and Sam. Magnolia's voice pitched high. You do that for us? Lillian's answer was immediate. Of course. Thank you, Magnolia said, sounding genuinely touched. That would be wonderful. You know, she mused, I think Lucas and I should take you up on your offer. Her voice warmed with a smile. We would welcome the opportunity to stay at your inn for the night, won't we, Lucas? He shrugged. Sounds good to me. Anything to keep from driving in these treacherous conditions. Chapter 7 Magnolia let out a high-pitched cackle as she spun around. We can't stay here in this... She threw her hands up. In this atrocity? The town of Remember, the outside of the inn, the lobby, and common areas are all so quaint. But this, it's like something out of a freak show. Her eyes swept over the wallpaper, splattered with hearts of all colors and sizes. Lucas pointed. I don't know, the Cupid statue is kind of growing on me. The corners of his lips twitched as he sniggered. Magnolia's eyes rounded as she looked at the white ceramic statue dusted with red glitter. A plump, baby-faced Cupid wore a cherubic smile as he cradled his bow, the tip of his arrow pointing up. Magnolia's shoulders shook, mirth building inside her until she could no longer hold it. She burst out laughing. 
They both laughed long and hard, dissolving some of the strain from the day. When the laughter died down, Magnolia mopped her eyes. You know, in all my twenty-six, almost twenty-seven years, I've never before seen a heart-shaped bed. Her head swung back and forth as she pursed her lips. That's something. She was keenly aware that she was alone in the honeymoon suite with Lucas. The enormous plush bed was a reminder of their impending marriage and all that it would require. Desire spun a twist of ribbons in her stomach. Was it wrong to be excited about marrying Lucas? For so long she'd been concerned about her lack of devotion to Roman. She'd been fond of him, yes, but he'd never evoked any type of strong emotion within her, be it good or bad. Lucas, on the other hand, well, all he had to do was walk in the room and the emotion was there, sizzling like a live wire. A mischievous grin tugged at Lucas's lips. So who gets the bed? He gave her a lingering look. The smolder in his eyes warmed her blood. His deep blue button-down shirt brought out the blue in his eyes. Also, it molded well to his abs of steel and his well-defined pecs. She took in his jeans, which showcased his long legs. His cowboy boots had been replaced by mid-tone brown Doc Martens. She actually missed his cowboy boots. They were so intrinsic with his personality. She tore her eyes away from his physique, mortified that she'd been ogling him. I suppose we could share it. Maybe stack pillows in between us to keep everything prim and proper. Heat flamed her cheeks. She didn't need to look in the mirror to know that they were as bright as the crimson bedspread. You can have the bed. I'll take the couch. She whipped a light tone into her voice. After all, it's not every day that a girl gets to sleep on a red, white, and pink plaid couch. Nah, he chuckled. I couldn't do that to you. My mama raised me better than that. I'll take the couch. His eyes lit with a teasing sparkle. Although in a couple of days we'll be married and then we'll have to rethink the bed and couch thing. A shaky laugh left her throat. I guess we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. Her face was burning to the point where she thought she'd combust. She didn't know why she was feeling so shy all of a sudden. Maybe it was because of the intense attraction she felt for Lucas. He'd been so larger than life back then. Lexi's older brother the star football player who had the world by the tail. Heck, he was still all that. The conquering hero all wrapped up in that tough, sexy cowboy swagger. Even though his clothing had been changed from western wear to something more neutral, he was a cowboy through and through. In long, fluid strides, he went over to the couch and put down his duffel bag. Well, he drawled, looking around, what now? Magnolia placed her purse on the bed before moving into the bathroom. She took one look, giggling. Lucas, you've got to see this. He stepped into the bathroom. The startled look on his handsome face was priceless. She watched with pleasure as his gaze moved over the glistening white clawfoot tub. Red towels embroidered with white hearts were draped over the edge of the tub. Red soaps shaped like hearts, were stacked in a pyramid beside the sink. A red fuzzy cover covered the toilet lid. Spread across the black and white checkered floor were two red shag rugs. This takes the cake, he chuckled. No wonder Lillian had this room open. No one in their right mind could possibly want to stay here. Magnolia moved to leave the room. As she walked by Lucas, her hand brushed against his, sending a tremble of spark through her. This energy building between them was wildly unnerving. She hoped she wasn't the only one feeling it. She traipsed over to the couch and plopped down. She looked out the window. 
They were on the second floor, giving her a splendid view of the large wooded yard. Snow was still falling, a tall pile collected on the window sill. She looked out at the large trees, their intricate network of branches clothed in a soft blanket of fresh snow. It was a feast for the eyes, almost magical. Magnolia's heart skipped a beat when Lucas came over and sat down beside her. He angled to face her, his leg touching hers. So what do we do now? We have several hours to kill before the live nativity. Lillian had invited them to attend the live nativity celebration held on the town square. Magnolia had never been to a live nativity before. She thought it sounded like fun, and it would give them something to do. Otherwise, they'd just be sitting in this outlandish room, twiddling their thumbs. She glanced at his lips as a heat wave swirled through her. She could think of a few things other than twiddling their thumbs that they could do to occupy their time. Amusement flickered in Lucas's eyes, making her think for one crazy moment that he'd read her thoughts. What? she laughed. He arched an eyebrow as he draped his arm over the ledge of the couch behind where she was sitting. You want to kiss me? The cocky expression on his face caused the hair on the back of her neck to rise. I do not, she retorted. Sheesh, this was embarrassing. Was she that obvious? A corner of his mouth pulled into a crooked grin. Yes, you do, he murmured as he leaned close. Her skin zinged when he brushed a hand across her cheek. You're blushing. You certainly have a high opinion of yourself, Lucas Romeo, she said tartly. I'm sure you think all the girls are after you. Rich, melodic laughter flowed from his lips. Not all the girls. He gave her a meaningful look. Just the one that matters. Her breath hitched as her eyes searched his. Do I matter to you? The words had trickled out of their own accord, leaving her vulnerable and exposed. Scratch that, she blurted, giving him an apologetic look. She looked down at her hands. Lucas was marrying her for two reasons, to get his ranch and to pay off his parents' house. It was so easy to confuse the situation, with him sitting here gazing at her with those compelling eyes that glowed with such an inner fire that it stoked the adventurous part of her, making her believe that anything was possible. Earlier, when he'd taken on those three hoodlums, fear had struck the center of her heart. The thought of Lucas getting hurt filled her with such a dark dread that she knew she had to come to terms with her feelings about him. He interrupted her thoughts. Yes, you matter. More than I realized. Her head snapped up. You're not just saying that? Her throat clogged. She coughed to clear it. Because of the money? She regretted her words the instant she saw his stricken expression. A heavy sigh pushed through his lips. What do you want me to say? Nothing. Traitorous tears rose to her eyes. She blinked to stay them. Of course you're here for the money, she swallowed. We both are. A sad smile touched her lips. I guess it's just hard to keep things straight in my head. She motioned, her hand encompassing their surroundings, as a weak laugh blipped through her throat. I mean, <laughs> look where we are. He brushed her jaw with the tips of his fingers. His touch was tantalizing, hypnotic. A peculiar expression flitted over his features. What? she murmured. If we're going to make a convincing case for a couple in love, we should probably get lots of practice in. His eyes were so deep and liquid blue that she felt like she could lose herself in their depths. Ah, she laughed softly. I see where this is going. You want to kiss me. She felt his need for her, wrapping her in wings of euphoria. He did care. She could see it in his eyes. Yes, he uttered with a ragged fierceness that stripped away all pretense. This had nothing to do with practice. This was blissfully real. 
Her breath came faster as she parted her lips and leaned in. Regardless of what happened from here on out, she would savor this moment. She'd only kissed Lucas once before, the night at the drive-in. It had lit her on fire. As time went on, she thought she'd probably built up the kiss in her mind. Here and now, she'd find out for sure if her brain had fantasized the exquisiteness of the kiss or if her assessment had been accurate. He cupped her cheeks. You were something today, holding that knife ready to take on those punks. The tender way he looked at her, the admiration in his voice, filled her entire body with glorious warmth. Thank you, she said softly. Her lips trembled with a deep ache, craving the feel of his lips. If he didn't kiss her soon, then she'd kiss him. His mesmerizing eyes went to her lips. Her spirit soared with the knowledge that his mouth was about to take hers. Her phone rang. She jerked, gritting her teeth. Are you kidding me? He lowered his hands from her cheeks. Maybe you should get it. It might be your grandfather. She sucked in a quick breath, nodding. As soon as they'd gotten to the inn, Magnolia had stepped into the cozy living room adjacent to the foyer where she'd called her grandfather to tell him that they would be delayed. He'd not answered, so she left him a message. She went to her purse to retrieve her phone. Her stomach lurched. It's grandfather, she said as she slid her finger across the screen. Hello, her voice sounded too high-pitched in her own ears. Magnolia, he began in an unceremonious brisk tone. What's this about you being delayed? She swallowed the tightness in her throat. It's a whiteout. We're spending the night in the Magnolia Blossom Inn in a little town called Remember. Before he could respond, she rushed on with a shaky laugh. Actually, we met a friend of yours. Who's that? He clipped. Lillian Yates? She owns the inn? It was with some relief that she heard her grandfather's voice warm a fraction. Lillian, how's she doing? Really well. She has invited Lucas and me to a live nativity celebration tonight on the town square. According to Lillian, the town is known for it. This was met with silence. She tightened her hold on her phone. Grandfather, are you there? I'm here, he grumbled. How did you end up way over in Remember? That's off the beaten path. Her brain scrambled to come up with a response. She couldn't very well mention that Lucas went looking for a ranch for sale without drawing suspicion. Lucas and I decided to do some sightseeing along the way. She winced at her lame excuse. In a snowstorm? His voice was edged with suspicion. It wasn't snowing that hard at the time. There was another long pause. Magnolia, what's really going on? Her heart began to pound. What do you mean? You were so set on Roman, and now you're bringing this new guy. What's his name again? The frosty, annoyed tone of her grandfather's voice took Magnolia right back to her childhood. She used to hate visiting her grandparents. Her father would get wound up as tight as a drum, spewing out all the expectations of how Magnolia was to behave. She felt like she had to be a robot to fit into the impossibly small box of her grandparents' expectations. Lucas, Romeo. She glanced at Lucas as she spoke. She could tell from the way his jaw hardened that Lucas knew she was getting grilled. She moistened her lips. You'll love him. He's amazing. I'll be the judge of that, Grandfather said crisply. Her spine stiffened. Yep, you and Eric Stanford. She didn't try to hide the resentment in her voice. What time will you arrive tomorrow? According to what Lillian told us the snow is supposed to stop tonight, we should be okay to leave mid-morning, assuming that they will plow and salt the roads. I don't have to remind you that time is counting down. I will need time to make my assessment, as will Eric. I will not be pressed into making a hasty decision, 
simply because you can't get here on time. Magnolia rolled her eyes. Yes, I know. The man was relentless. He'd never shown her a shred of warmth or sympathy. No wonder her father was uptight. He'd been raised by Benjamin and Carol Bentley, two of the coldest, most brittle people on the planet. I'll expect you to arrive no later than noon tomorrow. There was a frigid finality to his tone. Her insides tightened. Like I said, so long as they plow and salt the roads, we should be fine to get there by then. Make sure that you do. I'm running out of patience. He ended the call. I love you, too, she growled as she pressed her lips together, shaking her head. What was that all about? My grandfather's ticked that we didn't arrive today, as scheduled. The words left a sour taste in her mouth as tears of frustration rose in her eyes. She tossed her phone back into her purse. He's so infuriating. She put her hands on her hips, glancing up at the ceiling as she tried to get a handle on her emotions. Lucas patted the spot beside him. Come here. The tenderness in his voice called to her soul, breaking the dam. Fat tears rolled down her cheeks. Hastily, she swiped at them with the palms of her hand, embarrassed that Lucas had seen her crying. Magnolia, please, come over here. His voice was achingly tender. She went over and sat down. He gathered her hands in his. She loved the rough feel of his working man hands. They were such a nice contrast to Roman's soft hands that it made her all the more aware of Lucas's masculinity. He looked into her eyes. I'm sorry. She frowned, searching his handsome face. How could he be so rugged, so virile? A young Clint Eastwood and John Wayne rolled into one. For what? His eyes deepened with regret. If I hadn't taken us on that wild goose chase to see the ranch, then we'd already be in Asheville. Your grandfather would be fine and everything would be hunky-dory. Surprise laughter sloshed in her throat. I don't think anything will ever be hunky-dory as far as my grandfather is concerned. Well, at least he wouldn't be on the warpath. That's true. When Magnolia woke up from her nap earlier and realized that they were out in the middle of nowhere in a snowstorm, she'd had a panicked moment that quickly morphed to anger. Then when Lucas told her it would only take an hour out of her schedule, her ruffled feathers had been smoothed. She'd tamped down her irritation because she wanted to make peace with Lucas. She didn't like the two of them arguing all the time. It was too taxing emotionally. Of course, things took a crazy, unexpected turn, and now they were here. I promise you that I'll do everything I can to make a good impression on your grandfather and Eric Stanford. The sincerity of his tone struck a chord inside her. Thank you she said hoarsely. He brightened. The good news is that once they sign off on your marriage, the deal with the trust fund will be done. Your grandfather and Eric Stanford will no longer be in our business. We just have to get through the next three days and then we'll be in the clear. Her feelings must have shown on her face. What? Lucas asked with a note of wariness. She grimaced. I'm afraid there's more to it than that. His brows furrowed. What do you mean? After our wedding, we'll get the first installment. Every year on our anniversary, we'll get another installment, providing that we adhere to the terms of the trust. We'll continue this process for five years until the money is paid in full. Your grandfather has you on a short leash. The resentment in his voice mirrored Magnolia's own feelings. Yes, he does, she grunted. Several emotions that Magnolia couldn't pinpoint pinged over his features before giving way to resolve. Lucas squeezed her hands. We'll get through this. Together. She nodded. His eyes locked with hers. I mean it. We're in this together. I promise. 
As long as you need me, I'll be here. He steeled his jaw, and she caught the ferocity in his voice. His words were a healing balm to her soul. I'll always need you, her heart replied. Thank you, she uttered. Suddenly a grain of truth penetrated to her core. For so long she'd prayed for a solution to her dilemma about the trust fund and her marriage to Roman. It had bothered her that she wasn't in love with Roman. She'd prayed that she would grow to love him. And then when he betrayed her, everything came crashing down. Now here she was with Lucas. Caring for him came as easily as breathing. It would be so effortless for her to fall head over heels in love with him. She'd never really fallen out of being enamored with him. He was her greatest crush. Her teenage heart had yearned for him. She laughed inwardly. It wasn't just her teenage heart that had yearned for him. Her adult heart seemed to be following the same path. She wasn't sure at this point if her infatuation with Lucas would be her deliverance or her undoing. He stroked her jaw his voice going deliciously husky. It titillated her senses, sending them swirling to an acute awareness. You are so beautiful. She exulted with the knowledge that he was finally going to kiss her. A knock sounded at the door. Seriously, she muttered, gritting her teeth. Another interruption? It was like fate was deliberately toying with her. Lucas grinned. His expression was boyishly cocky, like he was getting great delight out of knowing that she was aching to kiss him. We'll have plenty of time later to practice, he winked. Come in, he called. The door opened as Sam stepped in. When he saw them together on the couch, he cleared his throat, dipping his head slightly. Sorry to interrupt, he said cordially, but Lillian thought you might be interested in attending a play. What kind of play? Magnolia asked. A Christmas carol is being performed at our local playhouse. Lucas glanced out the window at the snow, frowning. Are they still having it in this weather? Of course, Sam answered resolutely. We get lots of snow in these parts. Life goes on. Magnolia looked at Lucas. Would you like to see a play? The horrified expression on his face answered her question. Come on, she urged. It'll be good to get a little culture infused in those rawhide bones. Well, if you put it like that, Lucas grinned broadly. Sure, we'd love to go. The seats are on the front row, Sam continued. Thank you, Magnolia said. How much do we owe you? Sam looked surprised. We wouldn't dream of charging you for them. We are in your debt. We are glad we could help, Lucas said casually. He gave Sam a shrewd look. It's a shame that you and Lillian weren't able to get your tree, with it being so close to Christmas. Sam blinked a few times, his face gathering color. It's no problem. He smoothed a hand over his tailored sweater. His posture was so erect that Magnolia could almost imagine that he had a board attached to his spine. He was so regal and elegant, almost too formal. I'll drive you to the theater. Meet me in the foyer in twenty minutes? Will do, Lucas said. Very well. With a brief smile and nod, Sam turned and strode out. Lucas tipped his head. Did you see the tree in the common area of the inn? The massive one in the living room? Magnolia had noticed it because it was so impressive with the red ribbon and gold decorations. Lucas nodded, a thoughtful look crossing his face. I don't think Lillian and Sam were out looking for a tree. What do you think they were doing? In the heat of the moment, Magnolia had been so worried about Lucas's safety when facing down those delinquents that she hadn't given much thought as to why Lillian and Sam were in that remote location. She had no reason not to take their statement at face value, although, now that Lucas was raising questions, it did seem strange that Lillian would be outside with a walker in her condition looking for a tree to cut. 
Lillian had some sort of ailment that made it hard for her to get around. Those teenagers were looking for something. What do you think it was? He shook his head. I don't know, but I get the feeling that there's more to Lillian and Sam than meets the eye. She nibbled on her lower lip. Well, I guess we'll never know the full story. With any luck, Lillian would make good on her promise to tell Magnolia's grandfather about Lucas's heroic actions. Magnolia could tell that her grandfather thought highly of Lillian Yates. Lillian didn't seem like the type to run in her grandfather's circles. She was much too gaudy and outlandish in her appearance, and her manner was too open and frank. Then again, the wealthy were very eccentric. Was Lillian wealthy? It was hard to say what she was. At any rate, it didn't matter. Magnolia would be grateful for any help that Lillian could offer. She and Lucas needed a miracle. She realized Lucas was studying her. A smile tugged at her lips. What? I was just wondering what thoughts were circling around in your pretty little head. Her heart gushed at the compliment. I'm just glad that you were there to save Lillian and Sam. A smile tipped his lips. That we were there. Her heart beamed. Yes, we. Chapter 8 What did you think of the play? Magnolia stepped closer to Lucas. He slid his arm around her shoulders as she scooted into him. Well, as plays go, it wasn't half bad. Lucas could count on one hand the number of plays he'd attended. His last one was in junior high. His mother was volunteering at his school. She was a chaperone and insisted that if she had to attend the school play, then so did Lucas. Laughter floated from Magnolia's lips coming out in a puff before dissipating into the cold night air. Not bad. It was terrific, as wonderful as plays I've seen in New York. I could tell from the way Lillian was going on about the community playhouse that she's super proud of it. Now I know why. Lillian was waiting for them, already seated on the front row when they arrived at the theater. She had on a snowman sweater that was complete with red bows and bells. She greeted Lucas and Magnolia like old friends, jabbering about the playhouse and how lucky the town of Remember was to have such talented people, not only to run the playhouse, but also to perform. Lucas would have preferred to poke his eyeballs out with a dull fork rather than sit through the duration of a play. Yet it had been enjoyable to see the excitement on Magnolia's face as she watched it. Once, when she was startled by Marley's ghost, she'd reached over and grabbed Lucas's hand. The gesture jolted Lucas, mostly because he never would have thought that he and Magnolia would be a good fit. And yet, surprise, surprise, they were. Ever since Magnolia had re-entered his life, it seemed that Lucas was having to rethink his stance on quite a few things. Snow was still falling, encapsulating the world in a cocoon of stillness. They strolled past the shops on the square with their festive windows. The square was bustling with excitement from those who'd come to see the nativity. People were friendly, nodding and smiling at Lucas and Magnolia as they passed them on the sidewalk. In the background, Christmas carols were being sung by a choir of children, their youthful voices pouring gladness into the still air. Lucas felt an unexpected glimmer of hope. Normally, during this time of the year, he had to fight against the gloominess of his memories. Tonight, however, his heart felt light a new scope of possibilities unfolding before him like the pages of a book that he never would have thought to select from the shelf. Several times since they'd left the playhouse, Magnolia had stopped at a store window to look at the displays. They were headed to the live nativity beside the courthouse that sat prominently in the center section of the square. This town is so quaint and picturesque. I feel like we're in the middle of a snow globe, Magnolia said with a touch of wonder in her voice. It's certainly cold enough to be a snow globe, Lucas joked. She cut her eyes at him, her lips forming a pout. Party pooper. He laughed, squeezing her shoulders. Nah, I'm just more of a realist. 
He appreciated how optimistic Magnolia was. She had a knack for taking pleasure in the moment. She was soaking in the experience of the live nativity celebration like it was a rare treasure. Her enthusiasm was infectious. Lucas liked seeing the world through Magnolia's vivid, lively eyes. Also, it didn't hurt that Magnolia looked terrific in her bright red coat, which accentuated her blonde locks. The fragrant scent of cooking food wafting in the air caused his stomach to rumble. I heard that, Magnolia chuckled. She motioned at a nearby food stand. Let's get something to eat before we go to the nativity. A few minutes later, they found a vacant bench where they commenced eating hamburgers, cheesy fries, and hot chocolate. You know, Lucas mused, I don't think I've ever drank hot chocolate while eating a burger. Magnolia giggled. Me either. It's pretty good. Yeah, not half bad. There you go again with that not half bad lingo. She shook her head, giving him an affectionate look. Stick with me, Lucas Romeo, and you might just find yourself getting excited about life. He grinned. Yeah, I just might. Their eyes met. Lucas could see the adventure shining in Magnolia's eyes. She was enamored with him, viewing him as her knight in shining armor, the one who was going to save the day, with her by his side. He felt like he could be her hero. Or maybe she was his hero. She was saving him from a life of cynicism and regret. Here, tonight, he was beginning to think that anything was possible. After they'd eaten, they walked hand in hand to the nativity. A hush of reverence settled over the scene as they looked at the manger. Lucas was surprised to see an actual baby sleeping peacefully, wrapped in a thick woolen blanket. Mary had her hand on the manger, gazing down lovingly at the child. Joseph stood near Mary, keeping a careful watch over her and the baby. There were shepherds and several sheep. The three wise men stood at a respectable distance, dressed in vibrantly colored robes. One was holding the reins of a donkey. The nativity looked remarkably authentic. Magnolia's expression was one of repose as she gazed at the scene. He traced the lines of her graceful features, marveling at how angelic she looked. Her nose and cheeks were pink from the cold, further enhancing her beauty. A whisper of peace spoke to Lucas's soul. Knowledge poured into him from someplace else. He could build a life with Magnolia. They could grow together in love and understanding. She turned to him, her eyes glistening. This is what I've been missing, she said softly. I've been so caught up in fulfilling the requirements of the trust that I haven't even taken time to be still and simply enjoy the season. Clarity comes from recognizing the true meaning of Christmas. Yes, he answered, getting the distinct feeling that they were truly understanding one another. At the designated time, Sam picked them up near the nativity to take them back to the inn. Lucas and Magnolia sat in the back of the car. Magnolia scooted close to Lucas. He reached for her hand, linking his fingers through hers. The evening had been imbued with such a magical quality that Lucas didn't want it to end. On the one hand, he was ready to get to Asheville so he could get the initial meeting with Magnolia's staunch grandfather and Eric Stanford over with. On the other hand, he wished he and Magnolia could stay here longer and savor the unique culture of remember. Here we are, Sam announced as they pulled into the inn. Lucas and Magnolia walked close together to ward off the cold. Snow was still falling. Magnolia glanced up. Do you think we'll be able to leave tomorrow as planned? Her voice was coated with apprehension. Yes, Lucas answered with more certainty than he felt. A cheery warmth greeted them as they stepped into the foyer. The scent of fresh pine needles from the tree enveloped them. Lucas glanced at the crackling fire in the fireplace. No one was in the living room. He wondered if Magnolia might like to go and relax there before they retired to their room. At least the living room was classy, as opposed to the tacky honeymoon suite. 
Before he could pose the question to Magnolia, Sam spoke. Look where you're standing. The tiniest hint of a smile crept over Sam's patrician features as he pointed to the ball of mistletoe hanging from the chandelier. Startled laughter rose in Magnolia's throat as she looked at Lucas. I guess we are. It was cute how rosy her cheeks suddenly became. A wicked impulse streaked through Lucas's brain. In two short days, Magnolia would be his wife. They were to have a child together. It was time to quit dancing around the water. Better to dive right in. In a swift move, he encircled her waist and pulled her to him. She gasped softly, her eyes widening to silver dollars as she looked up at him. He caught the flicker of desire in her jade eyes. It called to him. He dipped her back. His lips claimed hers as he kissed her hard and thoroughly as he'd been wanting to do all day. He relished the heady fire that licked through his veins. Her lips were soft and pliable against his. She tasted as sweet as he imagined. He longed to run his fingers through her glorious hair. He wanted to kiss her until he couldn't think straight. But then the rational side of his brain took over. He couldn't exactly do that here in the Magnolia Blossom Inn with Sam watching the entire thing. He set her back upright on her feet. Her cheeks were flushed, her lips parted and swollen from the kiss. Her chest moved up and down with her fast breathing. Magnolia had never looked more beautiful or more enticing. He wanted another kiss. No, he wanted infinite kisses. He wanted to savor every aspect of their physical relationship, and he would as soon as they became man and wife. Until then, he'd keep his desire in check. It wouldn't be easy now that he knew how incredible she was. Ever so slowly, a satisfied smile moved over his lips. And here you thought we were going to need more practice. A chortle hiccup from her rosy lips. You are something, she uttered, caressing him with her eyes. So are you. Sam cleared his throat, winking at Lucas. That's the best use of the mistletoe I've seen all season. Magnolia giggled, ducking her head slightly like she was embarrassed. He liked how proper and dignified she was, a princess to the nth degree. Magnolia added a refining element to Lucas, an element he'd not realized was missing in his life. He'd blustered and complained about the trendy clothes that she'd selected for him, but the truth was, the clothes were growing on him. Maybe he wasn't as much of a redneck as he once believed himself to be. Lillian was hoping to be able to visit with you tonight, but she wasn't feeling well, so she went to bed early. She suffers from rheumatoid arthritis. It gets bad this time of the year with the dampness. I'm sorry, Magnolia said, her voice ringing with sympathy. Sam offered a nod of acknowledgement. Lillian hopes to be able to catch up with you tomorrow at breakfast. It will be offered buffet-style in the dining room. What time do you plan on leaving tomorrow morning? Lucas looked at Magnolia as he did a mental calculation. While they weren't far from Asheville, they would need to account for the snow. I'm guessing we should leave around 8 or 8.30. Good idea. We can't afford to be late. Magnolia looked at Sam. Do you think the storm will let up tonight? That's what the weather forecast is saying. I hope the forecasters are right. Apprehension tightened her features. I'll tell Lillian that you'll be down for breakfast at 7.30. Will that work? Lucas and Magnolia looked at one another before Lucas shrugged. Sure, that sounds great. I hate to make Lillian get up so early. She's already been so kind to us. We don't want to put her out any further. No, we don't, Magnolia piped in. Sam waved a hand in dismissal. You're no trouble, he held up a finger. Oh, I almost forgot. Lillian called and spoke to Arthur Vinson. Who? Lucas asked. The man who's selling the ranch. Lillian has some information about it for you. That's great, thank you. After saying goodnight to Sam, Lucas and Magnolia went up to their room. A nervous energy buzzed between them as Lucas inserted the old-fashioned metal key into the lock. They stepped into the room, closing and locking the door behind them. 
So, Magnolia began, her voice shot up several notches as she clasped her hands. What now? Color rose in her cheeks as she glanced at the heart-shaped bed. Does it feel hot in here? She removed her coat and draped it over the foot of the bed. I'm sweltering. She turned to Lucas, a halting laugh issuing from her throat. I can't believe how over the top this room is. She sat down on the bed and removed her boots. She let out a long sigh. It has certainly been an interesting day. Her voice had a squeaky edge to it as she forced a laugh. The hoodlums with the knife, the storm. She looked around. This crazy room. Her eyes met his. Us. Lucas went over and sat down beside her on the bed. He reached for her hands. They were ice cold. A sudden thought entered his mind, tying his stomach in a hard knot. Was Magnolia having second thoughts? Everything had been going great between them until the kiss. Maybe she'd not felt the same fire in her blood as he had. He'd been under the impression that Magnolia cared about him, but maybe he was wrong. Maybe Magnolia was still hung up on her cheating ex, and this was solely about the trust fund. He shouldn't have let his guard down. He shouldn't have let himself believe that he and Magnolia could craft a life together. Just when he thought things were turning around, everything went up in a ball of smoke. Well, at least he would get the ranch. He pushed out a hard breath. I shouldn't have kissed you like that. I shouldn't have confused the situation. This is a business deal, nothing more. Her face fell. What? She barked out a hard laugh. What happened to all of your talk earlier about standing by me? I will stand by you, just like I said. You are unbelievable, she seethed. He was startled by how quickly her anger had come on. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Her voice dripped with venom. Just when I managed to break through that sky-high wall you've built up, her voice caught. Every time we start to get close, you push me away. Her head swiveled back and forth. I don't know why I even try, she muttered, pulling her hands from his. Confusion lassoed a tight circle around him as his brows shot down in a V. I'm not pushing you away. Yes, you are, she argued, thrusting out her chin. You're pushing me away just like you did when we connected at the drive-in. Her eyes flashed fire. Don't try and deny it. His brain raced to connect the dots. Are you saying that you care about me? Of course I care about you, she snapped. I've always cared. If you had an ounce of sense in that bullheaded brain, you'd realize it. Her voice hitched. What does a girl have to do to get you to open your eyes? A swell of relief ran through him. He rubbed his neck. I guess I misread the situation. When we came into the room, you were as jittery as a frog hyped up on a pound of sugar. A w what She laughed in surprise. He rushed on. I assumed that you were having second thoughts about us. Her eyes lasered into his. Are you having second thoughts? No. Even as he spoke the word, the truth of it settled into his bones. This thing with us, it caught me completely by surprise. A hint of a smile peeked beneath her frustration. Yeah, I know what you mean. She paused. If you must know, if I was acting a little jittery, it was because I'm worried about tomorrow. Are you afraid that we won't get there in time? Yes, I'm worried about the weather. I've been praying that it will clear. Apprehension clouded her eyes. But that's not all. She began fiddling with her hands. What else? He prompted. She clasped her hands together, holding them tightly in her lap. Tonight has been wonderful, her eyes softened. Yes, it has, he uttered, soaking in her exquisite features. He marveled at the glow in her countenance, how her eyes reflected such light and hope. I just don't want anything to change what's developing between us. My grandfather and Eric Stanford will be looking for any chink in our armor. I dread being put under the microscope. I dread it for the both of us. She squared her jaw, a fierce light shining in her eyes. We have to stand together. We have to show them that we care about each other. 
His hand went out to cup her jaw. He stroked his thumb over her smooth, milky skin. That shouldn't be too hard to do. She gave him a questioning look. No? No, he affirmed, a smile moving over his lips. Because it's the truth. I'm falling for you, princess, fast and hard. This was new for him, laying out his heart. It was hers to do with as she pleased. Her face lit with such pleasure that it warmed him through to his toes. About time! An amused chuckle rose in his throat. I may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but I eventually come around. The cowboy can be taught, she teased, a brilliant smile breaking over her face. He pursed his lips. You know, this situation reminds me a little of bronc riding. It was cute how quickly her eyebrow shot up. Please don't tell me you're comparing me to a bronco, she clipped indignantly. Never, he laughed. Hear me out. When my cousin Jackson and I were teenagers, he always wanted to ride broncos. He talked about it incessantly. It was like this annoying song that he got in his head and wouldn't let go of it. Finally, to shut him up, I agreed to go with him and give it a try. He grinned, remembering. I got bucked off nearly from the minute I got on the Bronco. I got a nice face full of dust. She grimaced. That sounds awful. Yeah, one would think. But then I pulled myself up by the bootstraps and mustered up the courage to get on again. This time, I rode for four seconds. A grin slid over his lips. From that point on, I was hooked. His eyes moved over her face. You see, he murmured, bronc riding was the sport that I never knew I would come to love. Her eyes flicked with understanding before glowing with delight. He continued, You're the song I can't get out of my head, the song I don't want to let go of. Her green eyes sparkled with amusement. An annoying song? A crooked grin slipped over his lips. I'll opt to plead the fifth on that one. He winked. The pull to her was too great. He couldn't resist kissing her. He traced the outline of her lips with his finger. A contented sigh rose in her throat as her lips parted, causing his blood to run faster. You know, he drawled, I was wrong earlier. Oh, when I said we didn't need any practice. He leaned in, his hands encircling her back. Her hair swished in the process, and he caught a whiff of her fruity shampoo. It drove him to distraction. She was intoxicating, mesmerizing. How had he not realized it before? Her eyes danced with anticipation. I'm always up for practice, she whispered as his lips took hers. Chapter 9 for 7.30 a.m., the inn was surprisingly busy. Magnolia hadn't realized there were so many guests staying here. The inn had a remarkable way of feeling cozy and secluded. Then again, it made sense that there were lots of people here. After all, the tacky honeymoon suite was the only room open. Apprehension pulled a tight cord inside Magnolia. The roads were clear enough to drive on, which was a miracle. Magnolia was super grateful that she and Lucas could get on the road shortly. However, that also meant that in a few short hours, they would face her grandfather and Eric Stanford. Magnolia couldn't pinpoint why she felt such impending dread over the visit. She and Lucas were fast becoming a real couple. Tingles traipsed down her spine as she thought of those amazing kisses they'd shared the night before. Surely anyone seeing her would be able to tell that she was crazy about Lucas. Lucas placed his hand on the small of her back, navigating her into the crowded dining room. Magnolia liked the protective feel of Lucas's hand. It was both thrilling and comforting. She'd watched the tender exchange of affection between his parents. That's what she longed to have, the kind of family life that she'd never had. 
The fragrant scent of bacon tingled her senses. Breakfast was spread over an antique buffet. A large rectangular table sat prominently in the center of the room. It was surrounded by bevel glass windows with wreaths hanging on the outside, their red ribbons swaying gently. The snowy scene beyond the windows was breathtaking. Wow was the word that came to mind. Lillian was sitting at one end of the table. When she saw them, a large smile tipped her bright red lips as she waved them over. Good morning, she said, her lively eyes sparkling behind her glasses. How did you sleep? Well, Lucas replied easily as he rested his arm around Magnolia's shoulders. Thank you for everything, Magnolia added. Staying here has been an unexpected blessing. She looked at Lucas as they shared a smile. I'm so glad. Lillian made a shooing motion with her hand. Go and get some food. She looked down at her plate. The pancakes are delicious. Magnolia's stomach rumbled as she looked at the stack of fluffy blueberry pancakes on Lillian's plate, loaded with syrup and butter. I'm saving these two seats for you, Lillian said. A few minutes later, Magnolia and Lucas returned to the table with their plates. They sat down across from Lillian. Can you believe it's Christmas Eve? Lillian began in a wistful tone. Magnolia had unrolled her silverware and was about to dig into her food. She paused, sensing that Lillian needed her and Lucas's undivided attention. She glanced at Lucas and could tell from the set of his chin that he, too, realized that Lillian needed them to listen to her. It does seem hard to believe, Magnolia said. The year has gone by so fast. So much had happened to Magnolia, she thought her life would take one direction, and now she was on a completely different path from what she'd planned. A much better course than she could have ever imagined. A sentimental smile touched Lillian's lips. Christmas Eve was such a special time for me and my late husband, Howard. He would get me a dozen roses. We'd get dressed up and go out for a nice dinner. Afterwards, we'd stop by the church to watch the Christmas pageant. A faraway look drifted into her eyes. Then we'd go home and dance. Her eyes misted as she cleared her throat, offering an apologetic smile. I'm sorry I tend to wax nostalgic this time of the year. Howard and I met at this inn. We came here for years afterward. That's why I bought it after he passed. I'm sorry for your loss, Magnolia said quietly. Lillian waved a hand. Losing Howard was tough. Her gaze moved between Magnolia and Lucas, giving them pointed looks. But I've come to realize that love is a gift. I was blessed to have Howard in my life. I was blessed to know what it is like to truly love and to be loved. Emotion rose in Magnolia's throat as she swallowed. It sounds like you were very blessed. Lucas reached for her hand underneath the table and squeezed it. The gesture enfolded her in a soft, cushy blanket. There were many who didn't think that Howard and I were a good fit. Howard was cultured, the epitome of class. An astute smile curved Lillian's lips. Whereas I'm just me. Magnolia grinned as she looked at the Christmas sweater Lillian wore. It was bold and a bit gaudy with the sequins and bows. Lillian had on candy cane earrings that matched her sweater. Many of Howard's so-called friends didn't consider me to be on the same social level as Howard. Her eyes sparked. Thankfully, Howard didn't have a shallow bone in his body. He had the unique ability to look past the superficial to see the real treasure within. Lillian looked at Magnolia as she spoke. Her words cut through Magnolia like a refiner's fire. How much do you know of our situation? Magnolia asked. I spoke to your grandfather this morning. He told me about your inheritance and the conditions of the trust. Heat rushed to Magnolia's face. Her hand felt slick in Lucas's. She'd been expecting to get grilled when she arrived at her grandfather's estate, 
but it was hard having it happen here, in this magical place, where she and Lucas had come together in understanding. Your grandfather expressed concern that you might be marrying Lucas for the money. Magnolia looked at Lucas. His expression was stoically guarded. I told Benjamin that if he could see what I see, he wouldn't be worried. The words gave Magnolia a start. She blinked. You're in our corner? She squeaked. A tender smile touched Lillian's lips. Yes, dear, I am. I know true love when I see it. She laughed lightly. Now, mind you, I'm not so daft as not to recognize that you might have initially gone into this for the money. However, that's not the situation now. It's not where you begin your journey or even where you end up that matters. What counts the most is who you become along the way. Lillian steeled her jaw, jiggling her loose skin. For the record, I find the idea of you being forced to get married to receive your inheritance appalling. Amen, Lucas growled, shooting Magnolia a vindicated glance. I don't know what Carol was thinking, Lillian homed in on Magnolia. Your grandmother was a complicated woman. That's one way to put it, Magnolia snapped, bitterness rising in her throat. Lillian tipped her head thoughtfully. I have to believe that Carol felt that she was doing what was best to preserve her family. However, any time a person tries to exert that much control over another, she pushed her finger into the table. Well, it never works out. One thing I do know is that love always finds a way. She smiled. The two of you are living proof of that. She sighed. Anyway, enough of that. I'm keeping you from eating. Your food is getting cold. Lucas released Magnolia's hand as they started eating. The food was good, but it had gotten cold. About the ranch, Lillian said as Lucas looked up from his food, giving her his full attention. I spoke to Arthur Vinson, the seller, last night. She finished off the last of her pancakes before wiping her mouth with the napkin and pushing her plate aside. Arthur and his wife Vivian bought the ranch shortly after they were first married, fifty-something years ago. They raised their four children there. Vivian died last year of cancer. The memories, combined with the upkeep of the property, have become too much for Arthur to handle. He wants to move to Colorado to live with one of his sons. The ranch has been on the market for six months. There was an offer on the table, but it fell through. Arthur is eager to sell. He mentioned that he might even consider financing it, especially if he could find a good person who appreciated and valued everything that he has built. Lillian gave Lucas a pointed look. Someone who could make a sizable contribution to the town of Remember. Lucas coughed, nearly choking on his food. What type of contribution are you referring to? Lillian's eyes zinged with a mild mischief. The type of contribution you made when you jumped out of your truck and rushed to save me and Sam. This world needs more noble men like you. Her eyes moved to Magnolia. And women like you. A knowing smile spread over her lips. While Lucas rushed out to protect me and Sam, you rushed out to protect him. It was true. That's exactly what Magnolia had done. She was shocked that Lillian had ascertained her intentions so accurately. It would be an honor and a privilege to have the two of you in remember, Lillian finished. I'll give you Arthur's number so you can talk directly with him. Thank you, Lucas said sincerely. After the wedding, Magnolia and I can swing back by here and speak to him. He looked at Magnolia to get her approval. The hope shining on his face tugged at her heartstrings. She wanted the best for Lucas. Nothing would please her more than for him to have a ranch to call his own, a place where he could work his own land and be his own man. It was crazy how quickly the pieces were shifting into place. Maybe that's how it worked when you finally found the right one. That would be great, Magnolia said heartily. 
Remember would be an ideal place for her and Lucas to start their lives. Magnolia would have to get the Internet figured out. She needed it for work. They'd had no cell service on that gravel road. She could only assume that service wasn't much better a few miles away at the actual ranch. However, she felt sure that she could work something out. Where there's a will, there's a way. It has certainly been a Christmas Eve to remember, Lillian proclaimed. I've made two new friends. A smile graced her ruby lips. Just remember that I'm indebted to you both. If you need my help, all you need to do is ask. Her voice quivered with fervency. I mean that with all my heart. Thank you, Magnolia said with a deep appreciation. For all her eccentricity, Lillian Yates was a good person, a person whom Magnolia was glad to have in her and Lucas's corner, and they certainly needed all the help they could get right now. Butterflies swarmed in her stomach. It was time for them to leave, time for them to face her grandfather and Eric Stanford. Fear lodged a cold cylinder in her throat. The sense of impending doom caught her lungs in a tight squeeze. She took in a breath, forcing herself to relax. She had to think positively. She had to look past the next two days and keep her eyes fixed firmly on the future. It would be brighter than she could have ever imagined now that Lucas was by her side. Lucas seemed to be reading her thoughts. He placed his napkin down and scooted back his chair. We need to get on the road. Magnolia flashed a large smile at Lillian. I'm so glad we met. So am I. We'll stop by on our way back, Magnolia promised. Lillian nodded. I'll be looking forward to it, she eyed them both. Remember what I said, love will find a way. Her voice rang with so much authority that it helped restore a sense of calm to Magnolia. Love will find a way. Magnolia was determined to do everything in her power to make sure of it. Chapter 10 They made good time, thanks to the roads being plowed. Sunlight was finally dispelling the thick lid of clouds. Lucas glanced at Magnolia. They were almost to her grandfather's estate. She'd been talkative when they left, remember, but for the last little while she'd grown silent. Her expression was pinched, and she kept fidgeting with her hands. He wished he could tell her that everything would be all right, but the truth was he wasn't sure. From the conversation that Magnolia had with her grandfather the night before, and from what Lillian said, it was painfully clear that Benjamin Bentley saw Lucas as an opportunist. What cut the most was that the assertion was partly true. Lucas was excited about owning a ranch, and he did want to pay off his parents' mortgage. Did that make him a terrible person? He was starting to care deeply for Magnolia, Today was Christmas Eve, that wretched day that he most dreaded all year long. Today, however, he'd hardly thought of Renée and her betrayal. His thoughts had been too consumed with Magnolia and all that they were facing. A part of him wished that they would just forget about the inheritance. He cleared his throat to get her attention. She turned, giving him a questioning look. It's not too late, he joked, to turn and run. The tiniest of smiles touched her lips. Don't tempt me. I can't say I haven't thought about it, she responded dryly. Arthur Vinson told Lillian that he'd finance the ranch. We can turn around right this minute and go back to remember. We'll start from scratch, build our lives together on our own terms. Her eyebrows rose. Just like that? We walk away? He squared his jaw tightening his hold on the steering wheel. You say the word and we'll do it. He would do just that if Magnolia agreed. The guilt of this whole situation was starting to eat at Lucas. Now that he was having deep feelings for Magnolia, everything had changed. He didn't want her to ever think that he was with her because of the money. And yet, how could she not? A hoarse chuckle sounded in her throat. 
It's crazy how quickly everything changed in Remember. He smiled. Yeah, but it did. He reached for her hand, not surprised to find it ice cold. What do you want to do? He held his breath, waiting for her answer. She lifted her chin. I want to stay the course. Fire encircled her voice. I want to show my grandfather and Eric Stanford how great we are together. I want to claim my rightful inheritance. A beautiful, determined smile flowed over her lips as her voice went silky soft. I want to show them that love will find a way. He blinked. Are you saying that you love me? She arched an eyebrow. What if I did? She taunted. Would that scare you away, send you running back to your cave? The only cave I'm going into is one that you're in, he countered. We're in this together. Tears rose in her eyes as she bit down on her lower lip. Thank you, she breathed. For what? For being you, for believing in me, for taking this crazy journey with me, she rushed on for showing me the possibility of a beautiful future where, in the words of Lillian, I can be blessed enough to learn what it is like to truly love and to be loved. Her voice trembled. I've never had that before. She sucked in a quick breath. So, to answer your question, I'm crazy about you. She gave him a tentative look. And I might love you a little. Say something. She laughed nervously when he remained silent. A lopsided grin tugged at his lips. That's good to hear, he drawled. Because I might love you a little, too. He couldn't believe he'd just said that. It was staggering the difference 24 hours could make. Her voice took on a new cheery lilt as she placed a hand on his arm. Well, I suggest that for both of our sakes... You turn on the charm and act like you love me a lot, because we're here. Lucas's breath froze as he pulled through the open gates onto an intricately laid brick driveway, which curved in a graceful entrance to the front of the home. The front porch was covered in a row of slender round columns. Above the column sat an impressive balcony with a detailed handrail. The roof was steeply pitched, with two stout chimneys flanking either side of the house, like proud soldiers. Lucas had always considered the ranch house at Thousand Acres Ranch to be impressive, but this mansion was the cream of the crop. It spoke of elegance and old money. Everything about it was dang intimidating. The sun had broken through the clouds and was beaming down proudly on the home, as if to showcase its grandeur. The siding gleamed almost as white as the thick blanket of glistening snow covering the ground and trees. Are you okay? He swallowed, forcing a smile. Yeah. It's just a house. A short laugh tickled his throat. A very impressive house. If Lexi were here right now, she'd remind him that his worth wasn't contingent on the size of his bank account. He could almost hear Lexi's words. You are enough. She nodded. I used to pretend it was a castle when I was a kid. I can see why. The mansion was a stark reminder that he and Magnolia were from two very different worlds. In Remember, they'd managed to find that wonderful space where they could simply be themselves. Their pasts and backgrounds didn't matter. But here... He swallowed the tightness in his throat. Just remember, Magnolia cautioned, stick to our story. Don't let my grandfather goad you into giving away any more information than necessary. Got it. Magnolia reached for her door handle as she sucked in a heavy breath, offering a tight smile. We've got this. A wry grin touched his lips. Are you trying to convince me or you? She laughed. Both. Hold it, he ordered. I'll get your door. He went around to help her out of the truck. Careful, he warned. The driveway is slick. Should we bring our luggage in now? 
No, let's go in first and talk to Grandfather and my father, her voice swung up. On a good note, I think you'll really like my father, he smiled. That's good to know. When they reached the door, Magnolia pushed the doorbell. Her expression was so strained that she might have been facing a firing squad rather than visiting her family. The door opened. Lucas was surprised to see a middle-aged woman dressed in a maid uniform. Her dark curly hair was threaded with silver. Hello, she began cordially. Hello, I'm Magnolia Bentley, she motioned. This is Lucas Romeo, my fiancé. The woman's face lit with recognition as she smiled. Hello, I'm Kathleen. It's a pleasure to meet you. She stepped back and motioned. Come in. They stepped into a cavernous foyer where several large oriental rugs were spread over the white floor tiles. A grand circular staircase was the focal point of the foyer. Lucas's gaze moved up to the chandelier, drenched in jewels. It was the size of a small car. Mr. Bentley is in his study, right this way. Kathleen directed as she shuffled across the tile, her rubber soles hardly making a sound. How about my father? Magnolia asked. Where is he? He's swimming laps in the indoor pool. Lucas's gut churned. He swallowed down his apprehension as he straightened his shoulders. He reminded himself that for all of his wealth and status, Benjamin Bentley was a man, same as Lucas. He put his pants on one leg at a time. Lucas would just have to talk to him man to man. Kathleen wrapped her knuckles against the closed door. Come in, a voice commanded. She edged open the door. Mr. Bentley? Yes, he said in the put-out, cultured voice of one who had a short fuse. Even if Magnolia hadn't prejudiced Lucas against her grandfather, he wouldn't have cared for the man simply based on the haughty tone of his voice. Magnolia and Lucas Romeo are here. There was a slight hesitation, following the rustling sound of papers. Send them in. Magnolia stepped through the door first, with Lucas close on her heels. Hello, Grandfather, Magnolia said stiffly as a tight smile wound over her lips. Lucas expected the two to hug, or at least shake hands, but they didn't. Her grandfather merely nodded as he remained seated. I see you made it early. Yes. Magnolia turned. This is Lucas Romeo, my fiancé. Lucas stepped forward and held out his hand as he reached over the desk. Pleased to meet you, he said as he clasped Benjamin's hand. It was smaller than Lucas's and smooth. When their eyes met, Lucas felt the older man's disdain. Yep, he viewed Lucas as a gold digger. Lucas's instinct kicked in. Normally, he would have told an egotistical man like Benjamin Bentley to go straight to the devil where he belonged. It would take all the intestinal fortitude he could muster to tamp down his temper and be civil. He had to do so for Magnolia's sake. Lucas took a quick assessment of Benjamin. He was medium-billed, with his snow-white receding hair, mustache, and closely cropped beard. He reminded Lucas of the actor Richard Dreyfus. His glasses hung from a lanyard around his neck. His dress shirt, open at the neck, was white with pencil-thin blue stripes. He wore navy trousers and brown loafers. Benjamin motioned to the two chairs facing his desk. Have a seat. They did as he instructed. Magnolia reached out and grabbed hold of Lucas's hand, lacing her fingers through his. Her hand felt like ice. Lucas was coming to learn that a surefire way to tell if Magnolia was nervous was to check her hands. How was the drive? Benjamin asked. The roads were surprisingly clear, Magnolia answered. She threw Lucas a cheery smile, but it didn't quite reach her eyes. Benjamin lasered in on Lucas. Tell me about yourself. I grew up in Franklin, Tennessee. I work at a ranch owned by my uncle. Benjamin's eyes narrowed slightly. I see. He reached for a handsome fountain pen resting in a gold stand. He twirled the pen between his fingers. What type of educational background do you have? 
I have an undergraduate degree in business and a master's in communication. The blip of surprise in the old man's eyes was gratifying. Lucas could sense Magnolia's surprise. They'd never discussed his education. It hadn't been pertinent to the situation. Just because Lucas loved working on the ranch didn't mean that he was ignorant. His parents were firm believers in education, particularly his mom. You're well educated, and yet you choose to work on a ranch? Benjamin's words were spoken with such disdain that the hair on the back of Lucas's neck bristled. It took all the effort he could summon to keep his voice even. While there are many worthy professions I could pursue with my degrees, I find great joy and satisfaction out of work in the land. Benjamin seemed to absorb that bit of information before switching gears. Why do you want to marry my granddaughter? Lucas looked at Magnolia. He wished he could ease the tension from her beautiful face. He felt for Magnolia, having grown up as she had with this cold, unfeeling man. Because I care about her, he uttered. Her eyes softened as she smiled. They shared a long look. Do you love her? Benjamin prompted. Yes, Lucas answered. It astonished even him how his answer had flowed out with so much confidence, almost as if his heart already knew what his lips were just now willing to admit. And that love is growing exponentially each day. Moisture rose in Magnolia's eyes. The feeling's mutual, she uttered. Benjamin's sneering question cut into the moment. And your feelings have nothing whatsoever to do with the fact that Magnolia will inherit a considerable sum of money when she marries you? My feelings for your granddaughter are not contingent upon the money. Lucas leveled a hard glare at Benjamin. In fact, my advice to Magnolia before we arrived was to forget the money. Benjamin's jaw went slack. Really? He huffed like he didn't believe a word out of Lucas's mouth. Lucas released Magnolia's hand, giving her a reassuring look. He leaned forward, locking eyes with Benjamin. It doesn't matter what I say. You've already made up your mind about me. A hard amusement simmered in Benjamin's eyes as he smiled. I've always admired a man who can call things as they are. He looked at Magnolia. Forgive me for being a doubting Thomas, but a short while ago you were telling me how in love with Roman you were, he paused. I'm not sure what to believe. The comment came at Lucas like a sucker punch. He gave Magnolia a questioning look. I did tell my grandfather that, she admitted, because I wanted him to accept Roman so that I could get my inheritance. She searched Lucas's face. I realize now that I was never in love with Roman. You've made me realize that, she added quietly. Irritation sparked through Lucas as he turned to Benjamin. I hope you realize what an impossible situation that you and your late wife have put your granddaughter in. His voice gathered intensity. She has a right to her inheritance. Look at what you're doing to her. She's your only granddaughter. Don't you want her to be happy? To find love? Of course I do, Benjamin snapped, his face taking on blotches of color. I also want to protect her from gold diggers such as yourself. That's not fair, Magnolia broke in. I love Lucas and he loves me. Her voice caught as she gave her grandfather a pleading look. Why can't you see that? Because he doesn't want to see it, that's why, Lucas seethed. I beg your pardon, Benjamin said frostily. Don't presume to put words in my mouth. What do you want from me? Magnolia cried. I'm doing everything that you and grandmother asked of me. Benjamin placed the fountain pen back into its stand. He sat back in his seat and rested his elbows on the arms of the chair. He steepled his fingers, perching them beneath his chin as he zeroed in on Magnolia. So your feelings for Roman Abbott are dead and gone? Absolutely, Magnolia shot back, lifting her chin. 
Like I said, I never truly loved Roman. Benjamin tipped his head, a trace of amusement pushing over his features. And yet you were so devastated by his betrayal. Lucas sensed a trap. He glanced at Magnolia, his eyes warning her to choose her words carefully. Benjamin was a crafty spider. He tried to figure out Benjamin's angle. The man was wealthy beyond belief. Why would he try to prevent his only granddaughter from getting her inheritance? Yes, I was. If you didn't love Roman, then why were you so devastated? Anger streaked over Magnolia's features. For starters, I didn't appreciate being cheated on. That's understandable, Benjamin said with a nod. Also, Roman's misstep left you without a fiancé. That's true, Magnolia conceded. Tread lightly, Lucas's mind warned. The old man was setting a trap. Then you met Lucas a day later, Benjamin inserted sardonically, and your problems were solved. I didn't recently meet Lucas, Magnolia stammered. He's the older brother of one of my best friends from childhood. We reconnected, and things took off from there. I see. Benjamin drummed his fingers on the table. Going back to Roman, did he know about your inheritance? No, Magnolia answered hesitantly. Benjamin's voice grew contemplative. Why didn't you tell Roman about the trust? The words trembled from Magnolia's lips. Because I wanted him to love me for me. Benjamin held up a finger. Exactly. And yet, you told Lucas about the trust. Why? Magnolia's face was beet red. Not having an adequate answer for his question, she merely shook her head and looked away. I'll tell you why. Benjamin's words flew out like razor-tipped darts, not only finding the chink in Lucas and Magnolia's armor, but decimating it, because you were desperate to find a husband so you could get your inheritance. A white-hot anger seared through Lucas. Benjamin was twisting things around, attempting to drive a wedge between him and Magnolia. No wonder Magnolia had been so apprehensive about coming here. No wonder she kept reiterating that the two of them had to present a united force. A single tear rolled down Magnolia's cheek. She swiped it away with a jerky movement. Do you not want me to get my inheritance? She asked hoarsely. Is that what this is all about? Benjamin laughed in surprise. No, that's not it at all. Magnolia threw him a heated glare. Then what? She snapped. Benjamin's tone became genial. Look, I know I've hit a few nerves here. Contrary to what you must think, I only have your best interest at heart. A hard laugh rattled Magnolia's throat. Could have fooled me. All I'm saying here is that there might be another solution to your dilemma. A benevolent smile spread over Benjamin's lips a way to have everything that you want. What's that? Magnolia asked, her voice dripping with wariness. What if I told you that you could have your inheritance and the man who actually loves you? He sighed. Princess, I know I've been hard on you, but that's only because I know the person you're capable of becoming. Your grandmother felt the same way. His voice quivered with fervor, like a preacher delivering the climax of his sermon. There's greatness in you, Magnolia. It only needs to be molded and formed. Lucas could no longer hold the words back. You mean you want to slap a harness on her so you can have complete control? Benjamin shot him a look that could kill. I, I don't understand what you're getting at. Magnolia uttered as she looked at her grandfather for an explanation. Benjamin gave Lucas a malevolent look before continuing in the lofty, amiable tone of a noble benefactor. 
Lucas had no idea what the spider was up to, but it couldn't be good. Benjamin zoomed in on Magnolia as if she were the only one in the room. I had a visit from someone who truly cares about you. Someone who came here to beg your forgiveness. Someone who had no idea what he stood to gain by reconciling with you. Magnolia frowned. What are you talking about? Benjamin looked past them and asked with a glib, Kathleen, would you please go and get our guest? Lucas and Magnolia glanced at each other before turning simultaneously to look at the maid. Lucas hadn't realized that she'd remained in the study. Yes, sir, Kathleen said with a perfunctory nod as she scurried out of the room. What are you up to? Magnolia questioned, giving her grandfather a steely look. She caught hold of Lucas's hand. We'll be okay, she assured him, but he could hear the underlying tremor of concern in her voice. It cut him to the center, making him fear that he would lose her. Come in, Benjamin said, with more warmth in his voice than Lucas would have thought the man was capable of. A dark-haired man with matching eyes stepped into the room. He was handsome in a showy movie star way. Magnolia gasped, her hand going over her chest. Roman? What are you doing here? Chapter 11 Magnolia, Roman uttered as he strode briskly to her side. She rose to her feet as he embraced her in a hug. She stood with her hands close to her sides, her body stiff. As Roman released her, she looked at Lucas, who wore a stony expression. Now that the shock had run its course, a scalding anger was taking its place. What are you doing here? she hissed. The nerve of Roman showing up unannounced at her grandfather's house on Christmas Eve, and worse was the knowledge that her grandfather had given him such a warm reception. Then again, she'd known that it would be effortless for Roman to gain her grandfather's favor. The two of them were cut from the same cloth. Pull up a chair, her grandfather said to Roman. Roman did so, scooting his chair annoyingly close to hers. She reached for Lucas's hand and clasped her fingers through his. I'm with Lucas now, she said, shooting Roman a dark look. Roman let out an agonized sigh. I'm so sorry about what happened. Her eyes narrowed. You mean because you cheated on me? Don't try to deny it. I saw you with her at the restaurant. You touched her face, gazed into her eyes with that disgusting moon-eyed expression. I made the biggest mistake of my life. I never should have gone to dinner with Jill. She was an old friend who was in town. She asked me to take her out to dinner for old time's sake. He gave her a plaintive look. The dinner meant nothing to me. Magnolia couldn't believe her ears. A high-pitched giggle circled her throat. You lying snake! I know what I saw. Roman ran a hand through his hair. I made a mistake, he said remorsefully. That's what I came here to tell you, his voice hitched. I'll understand if you don't want to take me back. I just had to tell you how I feel. Her head swung back and forth. You came all this way to tell me that? Yes, he said contritely. Why didn't you just call and save yourself the trip, she barked. Because I had to see you in person. Tears rose to his eyes. Magnolia, I can't eat. I can't sleep. His eyes pleaded with hers. I love you, his voice cracked. We're supposed to get married. The day after tomorrow, please give me another chance. I promise you won't regret it. Had Roman always been so soft around the edges, so privileged? No wonder she'd never been able to let herself truly love him. She needed a man's man. A man who wasn't afraid to draw a line in the sand and take a stand. A man who would keep her on her toes. A man who would make her want to be a better person. She was a princess in many ways, and maybe she always would be. But she could be a better princess than she'd been before. 
She could learn to step out of her comfort zone to help strangers, just as Lucas had done without so much as a blink. She could learn to love her neighbors as herself. She could learn to be a part of a community, especially if that community were remember. Magnolia felt curiously detached from Roman's emotions. However, she was keenly aware of Lucas. She could feel the vibrations of his leg bobbing up and down. It was time to set the record straight loud and clear. Roman, I don't love you. I never did. She winced at the shock that streaked over Roman's face. Nevertheless, it felt good to get the words out, to be honest with herself and with Roman. I needed a fiancé to fulfill the terms of my trust, and you fit the bill. I'm sorry. I did you a disservice. No wonder you felt the need to run into the arms of another woman. It was never going to work with us. Roman blinked. What trust? He looked at Grandfather. I, I don't understand. Grandfather held up a hand. His voice was mild, conversational. No need to rehash everything now. We can talk more about it over dinner, after everyone has had a chance to settle down. No, Magnolia blurted. I don't want Roman to stay for dinner. The two of us are through. Grandfather gave her a look so sharp it could have cut through steel. This is my house, and Roman is my guest. I insist that he stay for dinner. In fact, he can stay as long as he likes. Thank you, sir, Roman said respectfully. Grandfather acknowledged the comment with a nod and smile. It was sickening to see the rapport between Grandfather and Roman. Why couldn't her grandfather see how amazing Lucas was? He was more of a man in all the ways that counted than Roman Abbott would ever be. Fine, Magnolia huffed. Have it your way, but it won't change a thing. Trust fund or not, I'm marrying Lucas, and that's final. This earned her the slightest of smiles from Lucas. A ray of light pierced the heavy haze of gloom around her heart. She and Lucas were doing it, standing together to face down the foes. She didn't know how any of this was supposed to look in the future, as she couldn't fathom the thought of actually not getting her inheritance, nor could she stand the thought of not having Lucas in her life. It was like she'd been walking in murky clouds for most of her adult life, and now that she'd come out into the sunlight and realized how great it could be, well, she never wanted to go back to the other. Seeing Roman and Lucas side by side... It was no contest. She wanted Lucas, heart and soul. Kathleen will show you to your rooms, Grandfather cut in. Dinner will be served promptly at 6 p.m. His eyes snapped to Lucas. Don't be late. The classical Christmas music playing in the background was a stark contrast to the dark emotions churning a storm inside of Lucas. The table of the elaborate dining room was set formally with so much silverware that Lucas had no idea which ones he was supposed to use for what. He'd watched everyone else, faking it until he made it. The dinner was several courses. They were on the main course now, the menu consisting of prime rib, fluffy mashed potatoes, and crisp vegetables was better than any expensive restaurant he'd been to, but he couldn't enjoy a bite. He glared across the table to where Magnolia was sitting next to Roman. The seats had been assigned by Benjamin, with name cards on each of the plates. Benjamin was sitting at the head of the table. On his right was Roman, with Magnolia beside him. Eric Stanford, a thickly set man with a short neck and square face, was seated to the right of Magnolia. On Benjamin's left was Oscar, Magnolia's father, with Lucas sitting beside him. Just as Magnolia predicted, Lucas did like Oscar. He had silver hair like Benjamin, but his body type was different. He was slightly taller and thinner. Unlike Benjamin, who could have passed for a frumpy college professor, Oscar was clean-shaven and impeccably dressed. He gave off more of a high-profile businessman aura. Everything in Lucas wanted to jump up this instant 
rush around the table and grab Magnolia's hand so he could take her away from this stifling pretense. But that wasn't going to happen. The very fact of where Magnolia was sitting right now was evidence of the control her grandfather wielded over her. This was Benjamin's world, and he had full control. Would that control be enough to wrench Magnolia away from Lucas? The old man was certainly doing everything in his power to bring that to pass. Lucas reached for his water and took several swallows. What he wanted to do was to punch a few holes through the wall. He didn't know how much longer he could sit here and watch Magnolia laugh and talk to Roman, looking at them both. It was painfully clear that Magnolia and Roman were from the same world. They understood one another. Lucas was the outsider here. Down, tiger, Oscar urged in a low tone. At the rate you're going, you'll shatter your glass. Lucas looked at the glass he was holding, forcing himself to relax his grip. Tell me about yourself, Eric prompted as he pinned Lucas with squinty, bovine-like eyes. What type of work do you do on the ranch? All the attention turned to Lucas. Magnolia gave him an encouraging smile, tinged with a faint ring of worry, like she was afraid he might say something to hurt their situation. After that little get-to-know-you session in Benjamin's study, and now with this ridiculous seating arrangement, Lucas knew that it didn't matter what he said. He and Magnolia were doomed. Benjamin had already made up his mind, and Eric was merely a puppet, intent on carrying out whatever orders Benjamin decreed. Lucas sat up straight in his seat, meeting the eyes of all in the group. He refused to be quelled by their disdain. Whatever needs doing. I supervise many of the day-to-day -day activities, feeding cattle, mending fences, making sure our equipment is in proper working order, assisting the vet to make sure our herd remains healthy. Sounds like grueling work, Eric observed. It can be, Lucas answered. The ranch where you work is in Tennessee? Benjamin asked. Lucas nodded. Yes. Do you plan to continue working on the ranch after you and Magnolia wed? The frosty note of challenge in Benjamin's voice crawled under Lucas's skin. He glanced at Magnolia, wondering how much he should divulge of his ambitions. Lucas and I haven't made any concrete plans yet, Magnolia cut in diplomatically. The good news is that my job is online, so I can live anywhere. Benjamin turned to Oscar, his brows bunched. How do you feel about Magnolia leaving New Orleans? Magnolia's an adult, Oscar answered in a smooth, congenial tone. I know that whatever she decides will be the right decision for her. Thanks, Magnolia said as the two shared a smile. Benjamin's face turned a shade darker as he scowled. A second later, his countenance brightened. Roman, you're planning on getting your doctorate degree, is that correct? Yes, I've applied to several programs, with Harvard being at the top of the list. I hope to one day teach there. Now that's a career one can be proud of. Benjamin said heartily as he shot Lucas a superior sneer that said, You'll never measure up. Lucas's blood began to boil. He'd about had all he could take of Benjamin Bentley and his disdainful attitude. He balled his hand around his napkin. This country was built by hard-working men and women who aren't afraid to get their hands dirty. I will never apologize for who I am or what I choose to do for a living. Silence descended over the group with the density of thick soup. Magnolia caught Lucas's eyes from across the table and said meaningfully, I'm proud of you for the man you are and would never ask you to be anything different. Her words had the magical effect of deflating Lucas's anger. He needed to get control of his emotions and stop letting Benjamin bait him. Benjamin grunted, a noble sentiment, but it won't hold up in the face of reality. He looked at Magnolia. Can you honestly tell me that you'd rather end up with that? He gestured toward Lucas. 
that ranch hand instead of Roman? Open your eyes, Magnolia. Roman loves you for who you are. The two of you have a history together. You're upset with him because you misunderstood the situation. Roman wasn't stepping out on you. You heard him earlier in the study. The other woman was an old friend. Magnolia's face turned blood red. Stop it, she warned Benjamin. I've made my decision. It's true, Roman chimed in. I do love you. His voice trembled. I'll do anything to prove it to you. Give me another chance. He reached for Magnolia's hand. Please, he uttered. Indignation blazed a hot inferno through Lucas as he rose to his feet and threw down his napkin. If he stayed here a minute longer, he was going to punch Roman and Benjamin Bentley into next week. Excuse me, he barked as he turned and stalked out of the room. Chapter 12 Magnolia found Lucas in the atrium, wearing a trail as he paced back and forth. Even when he was a whirlwind of rage, his raw masculinity called to her, titillating her senses. His jaw was set in stone, his muscles pulled taut and lithe, like a panther that might pounce any minute. She stepped next to one of the bushes and plucked off a red rose. She moved closer to Lucas. Hey, she said softly. He must have been too caught up in his thoughts to realize that she was there, for he whirled around with a start like he was ready to fight someone. His features relaxed a fraction when he realized it was her. Although the agony carved over his handsome face cut her to the quick, his eyes were pools of dense flat gray. She held out the rose. He furrowed his brows. What's that for? he grumbled. Magnolia was learning that whenever Lucas felt threatened or in over his head, his knee-jerk reaction was to become surly and withdrawn. She couldn't let that happen. She kept her tone light as she forced a smile. It's Christmas Eve. He barked out a short laugh. You think? I thought we'd take some notes from Lillian and her late husband, start some new traditions of our own, it's not a full dozen, but the sentiment is the same. Her voice dribbled off. His eyes widened in surprise as understanding flashed over his expression. A ghost of a relenting smile touched his lips. Magnolia tipped her head. How are you at dancing? Terrible, he muttered. She stepped up to him. That's too bad. The air around them crackled with energy. Her pulse hammered wildly against her ears as she peered up into his face. Well, if we can't dance, whatever else can we do? She made a point of looking at his lips. She moved so close that she was pressed against him. Heat from his body wrapped her in a tantalizing cocoon. His expression grew fierce, his eyes hot as he scoured her face. She felt his stubborn pride his hurt over being spurned by her grandfather. He was strong and good, an eagle who was born to soar to magnificent heights. Knowledge flowed into her, giving her added insight into herself. She knew in that moment that she would give up everything, even her inheritance if necessary, to be with him. He caught her in his arms, his lips coming down on hers, demanding her complete and undying allegiance. She let the rose fall from her fingers as she yielded to his intensity, welcoming the surge of adrenaline as she melded into him, appreciating the hardness of his muscles. Their lips stoked a delicious fire that licked through her veins and simmered into her soul. When he dipped her back to deepen the kiss, a groan of pleasure rose in her throat as she threaded her fingers through his hair. She got the feeling that Lucas was claiming her his as she was him. They were born to be together. When he pulled his lips from hers, she clung to him as if her life depended on it. I don't care what happens, she vowed. I'm not giving you up. A smile broke over his face, 
dispelling the last tendrils of his gloom. Have I ever told you how amazing you are? Gentle laughter bubbled in her throat. Actually, no. Well, you are, he said vehemently. His words sank deep into her yearning heart. She was so ready to be done with the wretched wedding so she could become Mrs. Lucas Romeo. For her, it wouldn't be just the five years. She wanted to be with Lucas always, and she wanted them to have a house full of kids. She wanted them to experience the joy of having a family that was warm and open, a loving family, like the one Lucas had. She swallowed. About what my grandfather said, he scowled. He has no intention of giving you the okay to marry me. The words struck fear through her center, mostly because she worried that Lucas was right. We still have tomorrow. Maybe we should pray for a Christmas miracle. He stroked her cheek. It would take a miracle. His eyes darkened. What will you do if he refuses to accept me? She lifted her chin. I'm with you regardless. Ten million dollars is a lot of money. Her gut twisted. Yeah, but it's not enough for a lifetime spent with the wrong person. What if your grandfather's right? She jerked. What do you mean? He removed his hand from her face as he shrugged. Roman did come back of his own accord. He didn't know about the trust fund. A sharp anger sliced through her. Are you trying to weasel out of marrying me? Never, he fired back, his jaw taut. Are you sure? If Grandfather doesn't approve of you, then there would be no reason for us to rush things. She ran her tongue over her lips. We could date like normal people, take it slow. Her stomach tightened. She didn't want to take things slow. She wanted to be Lucas's wife. She'd marry him today if she could. He arched an eyebrow. Are you trying to weasel out of marrying me? Never, she affirmed. A shadow passed over his face. I'm sorry, she frowned. For what? That I'm not more like Roman, someone your grandfather would approve of. Laughter sputtered in her throat. If I wanted Roman, I'd marry him. Maybe you should. His words were spoken lightly, but she could see the pain in his eyes. You can get the guy and the inheritance. She reached up, cupping his face in her hands. Would you stop? Her eyes locked with his. I love you. He blinked in surprise, a smile touching his lips. A little? A lot, she fired back. We're getting married the day after tomorrow, right here in this very atrium. She thrust out her chin. And when you see my dress, you're going to cry because it's so beautiful. It had cost a blooming fortune. It should be beautiful. Now that she was marrying the right man, her wedding day would have new meaning. The atrium was the perfect venue. Her grandmother had loved to garden, and her grandfather made a point of keeping the gardens in pristine condition. Lucas chuckled low and deep. Is that so? he drawled. Yes, her eyes flashed. All right, cowboy, it's Christmas Eve and we're starting new traditions. That leaves you with two choices. You can either learn to dance or you can kiss me again. Her gaze traced the outline of his lips, an eager desire stirring warm ribbons through her stomach. Amusement lit his eyes, infusing them with a rich blue. He pursed his lips thoughtfully. Those are my only two options? She giggled. Yep. All right, princess. His words were a caress that whispered to her heart. Here's to tradition. He quipped, his lips hungrily covering hers. Later that night, Lucas lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, his brain a jumble of thoughts. He wished there was something he could do to win Benjamin over. If only Roman hadn't shown up, Lucas and Magnolia might have had a fighting chance. Was Roman on the level? Had the woman he'd gone to dinner with been merely a friend? If Roman didn't know about the inheritance, then he must have some feelings for Magnolia. His thoughts went to Renee, 
When she ran off with her therapist, Lucas had been devastated. That hurt quickly turned to a smoldering anger that left Lucas vowing to never again open up his heart. Then Magnolia stepped back into his life in such an unexpected way. A smile tipped his lips. An image of her holding out the knife, ready to protect him from the teenagers, flashed through his mind. She was such a princess, and yet she was fearless. He still couldn't believe she was choosing him over the money. It made his heart swell with gratitude. She was giving up so much for him. He'd never forget it. He'd vow to be worthy of her love, to be the man that she, for some wonderful reason, unbeknownst to him, believed he was. Their love would make him a better man. They'd stop by Remember on their way back. Lucas would talk to Arthur Vinson, see if they could work out some sort of deal. It would be tough running his own ranch and keeping it afloat with all the expenses while paying a payment to Arthur, but where there was a will, there was a way. A knock sounded on the door. Lucas glanced at the clock on the nightstand. It was 11.30 p.m. His blood quickened. Was Magnolia at the door? Those kisses had been amazing. She'd melted into him. Her lips were so soft and pliable, and yet she'd kissed him with such fervor. Several times over the past 24 hours, he'd allowed his mind to drift to the approaching wedding and everything that would come afterwards. The thoughts of holding Magnolia in his arms and making her his wife lit him with a fevered excitement. It occurred to him just now they'd not even talked about where they wanted to spend their honeymoon. He grinned, thinking about that ridiculous heart-shaped bed at the inn. He'd love to see Magnolia's face if he took her there. He threw back the covers, turned on the lamp, and padded across the plush carpet to the door. Suppressing a yawn, he opened it. Surprise pinged through him when he saw Oscar. He was dressed in the same clothes he'd had on earlier at dinner. I'm sorry to bother you so late, Oscar motioned. May I come in? Lucas glanced down at his T-shirt and boxers before raking a hand through his hair. Sure. Oscar stepped in, closing the door behind him. He shuffled his feet, his hands going into his pockets like he was suddenly unsure of himself. This couldn't be good. Lucas motioned to the sitting area, which was larger than the living room in his apartment. Do you want to have a seat? No, thanks. This won't take long. Oscar blew out a long breath. There's no easy way to say this, so I'm just going to come out with it. Okay, Lucas said carefully, bracing himself. I spoke to Magnolia. She's determined to marry you. A semi-amused smile stole over Lucas's lips. That's good, because I intend to marry her, too. It won't work. Lucas flinched. Why? A hard edge slipped into his voice. Because I'm not Roman Abbott? This has nothing to do with Roman Abbott, Oscar countered. Okay, if it's not about Roman, then what is it? He ground his teeth, eyeing Oscar. The money. Magnolia believes my father will come around, but he won't. Several emotions flickered in Oscar's eyes, pain, regret, sorrow. Lucas wasn't sure exactly what Oscar was feeling or why he was here. Magnolia's willing to forego the money if necessary. Lucas didn't want that for Magnolia, but if that's how it had to be, then they'd deal with it. Another emotion darted across Oscar's features. This time, Lucas had no trouble getting a clear read. It was pride. Magnolia reminds me so much of me at that age. She's so optimistic about the future, so certain that she won't regret giving up the money. His eyes hazed with sorrow. I was like that once. You're talking about your ex-wife? Oscar's voice grew recollective. Janet was this big ball of energy and fire. She swept into my life like a tornado. I was so madly in love that I would have gone to the end of the earth and back for her. He compressed his lips into tight lines. When my parents threatened to disinherit me, I told them to take a flying flip. 
I believed that nothing could ever come between me and Janet, especially not the money. Foreboding gripped Lucas's heart in an icy grip. But it did. Yes, it did, Oscar said dully. Janet felt guilty because she knocked me out of getting my inheritance. And you started resenting her, Lucas inserted. I did, Oscar admitted quietly, a sorrowful look in his eyes. Over time, it drove a wedge between us that we couldn't get past. Lucas's throat constricted to the size of a toothpick. He coughed to clear it. You think the same thing will happen to me and Magnolia? Yes. Anger bubbled in Lucas's chest. You're asking me to step down. A quiver rattled Oscar's voice. If you love Magnolia like I think you do, then you will look past your own feelings and consider her well-being. He gave Lucas a pleading look. Magnolia is fanciful, naive. He pushed out a dry chuckle. She thinks love can conquer all. But one thing you have to consider is that Magnolia has never been without money. She doesn't know what it's like to have to scrimp. His eyes hardened. Don't think for one minute that I condone what my parents have done, because I don't, he clipped. Magnolia should be free to marry whom she pleases. Lucas raised an eyebrow. Even if that someone is a small-town cowboy who mucks out stalls for a living? A dart of respect flicked through Oscar's eyes. As you so aptly pointed out over dinner, this country was built by hard-working men and women who aren't afraid to get their hands dirty. I respect you for the man you are, he sighed. Under a different set of circumstances, I would be honored to have you as a son-in-law. He paused, his eyes meeting Lucas's. I hope you realize that. Time stood still as they locked eyes. Lucas could tell that Oscar was a good man, who was genuinely worried about his daughter. I do, Lucas said tersely, his mind reeling. My daughter's future is in your hands. Oscar gave Lucas a long look. Please do the right thing. Lucas pushed out a short laugh as his hand went to his neck. His words came out in bitter chunks, like rocks hitting a cement floor. Is it right to just desert Magnolia? and leave her to marry a man she doesn't love? Oscar gave him a perceptive look. Magnolia's feelings are skewed right now. There's so much riding on this, I doubt she hardly knows what she feels. She cared deeply for Roman once. They were happy together for a long period of time. Magnolia can develop that love for him again, over time. Relationships are built on mutual understanding, with two people who share similar backgrounds. He took in a heavy breath as he eyed Lucas. You're a good man. I'm just sorry that you got caught in the crossfire of all of this, he said solemnly as he strode out of the room, closing the door behind him. For several minutes, Lucas felt numb. Then, when the gravity of the situation began to sink in, he went over and collapsed onto the couch. He buried his head in his hands. Was Oscar right? Would Magnolia end up resenting him because she'd given up her inheritance? The answer came in the hard punch that stole his breath. She would. His heart began to pound, sweat beads breaking over his nose. He was hot and cold at the same time. What he and Magnolia had was incredible, but it was fragile and new. They'd only been together a short period of time, if he left now and walked out of her life, she'd have a chance to start fresh with Roman. His insides shriveled. He couldn't stand the thought of Magnolia with anyone else, least of all that frat boy suck-up. Tears burned his eyes. He had to do the right thing. He had to think of Magnolia. Oscar was right. She was fanciful and naive. Magnolia was from a completely different world, a world that would be harsh when seen through the eyes of one who'd been born with a silver spoon in her mouth. On the miracle that Lucas could purchase Arthur Vinson's ranch, it would be a tough way of life. 
He'd have to work like crazy to build it up. Magnolia had her own career that paid well. Still, ten million dollars was an astronomical amount of money. Nothing that neither Lucas nor Magnolia could ever earn would come close to that. She would come to resent him. His gut churned. He'd lose her anyway. He couldn't go through that again. He couldn't put himself out there and enter into a relationship that was doomed. As excruciating as it was, it was better to end things now, when Magnolia could still get her inheritance. At least she would have a happy life. Tears burned his eyes as he stood and went to the closet. He pulled out his suitcase and threw it onto the bed. He opened it and began shoving in clothes. The only way he would have the strength to leave was if he did it now, when Magnolia was unaware. She'd be furious with him for leaving, but one day she would hopefully understand that he'd done it for her so she could have a chance to live the life she deserved. Chapter 13 A tremble of excitement ran through Magnolia as she hopped out of bed, traipsed over to the window, and looked out at the falling snow. It was soft and fluffy, like the whole world was covered in marshmallow cream. She chuckled at the analogy. Marshmallow cream? Really? She felt as giddy as a kid. It was Christmas. Tomorrow she would get married to Lucas. Her face flushed, thinking about those kisses last night in the atrium. His lips had been so insistent, so demanding. She loved his fire, his passion, his bluntness. He was a cowboy to the core. One thing was certain, life with Lucas Romeo would never be boring. Her grandfather was so stubborn, no amount of talking to him would do any good, so Magnolia decided to try a different angle. Her only hope was to get through to Eric Stanford. If she could get him on her side, then she might have some sway with Grandfather. Last night at dinner, before everything went haywire, Magnolia had asked Eric Stanford if she could meet with him at 9 a.m. this morning. Eric agreed. It was a little after 8 a.m. She'd have to hurry and jump in the shower. She made a face thinking of Roman. It was so awkward having him here. Roman seemed regretful for what he'd done. Maybe in the future the two of them could be friends, but that's all they'd ever be. Roman was wasting his time by sticking around. She'd quietly tried to tell him that at dinner, in the nicest way she could, but he obviously wasn't getting the message. Oh well, Roman was a grown man and could make his own decisions. Magnolia didn't want to spend any more time dwelling on him. She had much more important things to think about. There was so much to do today. She was meeting with the wedding planner at 3 p.m. to go over the final details. Prep would start tonight as the decorating crew and catering company began setting up. The wedding was set to take place at 6 p.m. tomorrow evening. It would be a quaint ceremony with only her immediate family and a few of her grandfather's closest friends. Before, when she was getting married to Roman out of sheer obligation, Magnolia hadn't wanted any of her friends in attendance. However, now that the situation had changed, she wished she'd invited Lexi and Lucas's parents to attend. Maybe she and Lucas could have a wedding reception in Franklin. Yes, that's what she would suggest. She hurried to the shower so she could make it to the meeting on time. At five minutes before nine, Magnolia hurried out the door. Lucas's room was a few doors down from hers. His door was closed. He was probably catching up on his rest. She would meet with Eric and then come back and grab Lucas so they could have breakfast together. She went to her grandfather's study, where she found Eric waiting for her. He was a thick, solid man, built like a linebacker. Eric had handled her grandparents' estate for as long as she could remember. Her grandparents trusted him implicitly. If she could get Eric on her side, then she might be able to shift the tide. Hello, she began with a warm smile as she stepped up to him and shook his meaty hand. Thanks so much for meeting with me this morning. I'm sorry to take you away from your family. He waved her apology away. 
Sophie went to check on her mother this morning. She's in a care center. We'll have our Christmas celebration with our grown children and grandchildren at noon, so no interruption at all. Good. Magnolia sat down in the same chair as she had the day before. Eric sat where Lucas had been. He crossed his legs and gave her an expectant look. She clasped her hands together and took in a quick breath before launching in. I know that Grandfather thinks that I would be better off with Roman, but it's not true. I love Lucas and want to marry him, her voice hitched. Surely you can see how I feel about Lucas. He tipped his head thoughtfully. Yes, I can tell that you are fond of him. Hope sprouted in her chest as her words rushed out. Lucas is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Her eyes misted. I have never been as happy, she said hoarsely. He studied her carefully, his lips pinched together. You have to admit that it looks a bit suspicious that you would break up with your longtime boyfriend shortly before the deadline, and then suddenly you're in love with some other guy. He held her with a look. A guy who knows about your inheritance? A guy who has everything to gain? Lucas isn't like that, she stammered. He loves me as I love him. She eyed Eric with defiance. In fact, Lucas doesn't care about the money. He's been trying to talk me into giving it all up. She felt a swell of victory when she caught the flash of surprise in Eric's eyes. Really, he mused. That's interesting. She held out a hand. Here's the bottom line. I'm marrying Lucas tomorrow, with or without grandfather's and your approval. Her throat felt drier than a pack of cotton balls as she swallowed. I hope that you and grandfather will see fit to approve of Lucas so that I can get my inheritance. But if not, well, I guess it is what it is. You really do love Lucas he said quietly, like it was a new revelation. Yes, she exclaimed, laughter catching in the back of her throat. I do. His brows furrowed. But your relationship with him developed so fast. Yeah, it did. She crossed her legs and wrapped her hands around her knee. It came as much of a surprise to me as anyone, she pursed her lips. Then again... When you consider that Lucas and I have a long history, it makes more sense. He lifted an eyebrow. A history? She rubbed her lips together. I've been interested in Lucas since childhood. She told Eric the story about how she and Lucas dated after high school. When we reconnected, things were rocky at first, but then came that magical moment where everything just clicked, she sighed. Look, I realize that on paper, Lucas doesn't seem like he'd be a good fit for me, but in reality, he's perfect, the only one I want. A smile waffled over her lips. It's funny how things happen. When her words ran dry, she looked at Eric, hoping against hope that she had managed to persuade him to her side. What about Roman? He seems like he loves you very much. It took a great deal of courage and humility for Roman to come here and beg your forgiveness. Her insides tightened. If he hadn't cheated on me to start with, then there wouldn't have been any need for him to make amends. If he did cheat. Irritation splashed over her. I know what I saw. She sucked in a quick breath. She didn't want to argue with Eric. It wasn't his fault that Roman was a cheat. Also, this wasn't about Roman. Even if he hadn't cheated on her, Magnolia knew now that he wasn't the one for her. I suppose it did take humility for Roman to come here, she acquiesced. It's good of him to try and make amends. Her voice trailed off as she shook her head. But, Eric prompted, I never really loved Roman. I know that now. A smile tugged at her lips. It's a funny thing when you find the right one, everything suddenly becomes clear. Now that I'm with Lucas, I realize that what I felt for Roman wasn't love. I was desperate to fulfill the terms of the trust, so I tried to make my relationship with Roman work, even though we're not right for each other. 
One day when Roman finds the right one, he'll see that I was right. A sense of urgency filled her breast. She offered a quick, silent prayer, asking for help to say the right words. If I didn't love Lucas, would I be willing to give up my inheritance for him? Eric stroked his chin. You certainly made a good case for Lucas. Her heart leapt with anticipation as she leaned forward. Would you please talk to Grandfather? She held her breath, waiting for him to answer. Her inheritance was hanging by a thread. She would give it up, if necessary, to be with Lucas, but it would be a tremendous blessing if she could have both Lucas and her inheritance. Did she dare hope that she could have it all? The analytical side of her brain took over. She could see how this must look to Grandfather and Eric. It boggled her mind how quickly everything had developed between her and Lucas. Was she being rash? Warmth flowed into her, almost as if it had come from someplace else. No, she wasn't being rash or reckless. It was right for her to be with Lucas. In some way she couldn't fully understand or explain, she knew to the depth of her soul that she was supposed to be with Lucas. He nodded. I will. Her heart shouted in triumph. That's fantastic, she beamed. I'm not sure that I'll be able to convince Benjamin to change his mind, Eric cautioned. Anything you can do to help would be great. Elation flowed through her. She was halfway to her goal. Now that she had Eric on her side, she at least had a chance of changing Grandfather's mind. When the conversation was over, they both stood. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me, Magnolia said sincerely. Emotion rose in her throat as she swallowed. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak my mind. She could tell that Eric had really listened to her. It felt good to know that her life was on the right track. A brief smile touched Eric's lips. Thanks for scheduling the meeting. It's nice to hear your perspective. Lucas is a lucky man. Thank you. She practically skipped out of the room. She couldn't wait to tell Lucas the good news. She just stepped into the hall when she barreled into Roman. Good morning, he said with a chuckle as he caught hold of her arms to steady her. She took a step back extricating herself from his grasp. Were you eavesdropping on my conversation? It was interesting how she no longer felt any connection with Roman. Confusion washed over his face. Of course not. Her spine went ramrod straight. Why were you standing outside the door? I just spoke to your father. He told me the news about Lucas. He said you were in the study. I wanted to make sure that you were okay. Magnolia's knees went weak. What news? Concern touched Roman's features. I thought you knew. He shook his head, his expression solemn. I'm sorry. Knew what? She pressed. Roman's face paled. Lucas left last night. Magnolia gasped, her breath leaving her lungs. Her knees buckled as Roman reached to catch her. An acrid hurt surged through Magnolia, settling to a cold pit in her core. Her mind grappled with the words. How could he do this to me? Hot tears stung her eyes. She was vaguely aware that Eric had come out of the study. Her heart pounded out a frenzied beat, sounding like a jackhammer was in her ears. What's going on? he demanded. Magnolia has just learned that Lucas left the estate last night. Roman responded. Left? Eric boomed, his lips turned down. Why? I'm not sure, Roman answered. All I know is that he's gone. Magnolia's head burned like it was on fire. How could Lucas do this to her? They'd been planning their lives together. Had he gotten scared of the commitment? Had Grandfather threatened him? A wave of dizziness rolled over her, making her sick to her stomach. The, there must be some mistake. I, I have to call him. Take it easy, Roman urged. Let's get you somewhere where you can sit down. She jerked her arm away from his grasp. No, she seethed, venting all her rage on Roman. I need to talk to Lucas now. 
She couldn't think straight. Everything was coming at her too fast. Roman held up his hands, a wounded look on his face. Okay, I won't stand in your way. No one will stand in my way, she hissed as she stumbled past him and ran down the hall. She went to Lucas's room and threw open the door. The bed was neatly made, his luggage gone. A sob of panic wrenched her throat. She rushed to her room and grabbed her phone. With a shaky hand, she called Lucas. Despair cut at her insides when it went straight to voicemail. It's me, her voice broke. Why did you leave? Call me. She sent him a text, demanding that he contact her. Nothing. Her brain raced, trying to figure out what to do. She called Lexi. It also went to voicemail. She left a message asking Lexi to call her. She sat down on her bed. For an instant, she felt disconnected from herself. Then the scope of the situation steamrolled over her, streaming tears down her face. Anger seared a hot river of fire through her. Why had Lucas deserted her? She'd been willing to give up everything for him, for them, She'd felt so good about the situation. Just now, when she was pleading her case to Eric, the warmth that flowed into her felt like it was heaven-sent. Had she completely misunderstood the impressions she was getting? Was she so desperate to find love that she'd refused to see the truth? All her hopes for the future were gone in an instant. Last night in the atrium, Lucas had been fighting mad when she came in, but then everything had changed. They kissed. She felt secure in the path they were taking. A snide voice cut into her thoughts. I knew he wouldn't be able to cut the mustard, Grandfather said. Her head snapped up. You did this, she seethed. At that moment, she hated him. He was cold and unfeeling, so intolerant of anyone who didn't fit into his microscopically small box of expectations. I did nothing except for try and protect the interest of my granddaughter, he said with a stiff dignity. Disgust roiled in her stomach, making her want to vomit. You don't care about me. You never have. Yes, I do care he countered. I know you're upset, but when you calm down, you'll realize that Lucas did you a favor. A favor? An incredulous laugh rose in her throat. You are unbelievable, she growled. Her voice broke. I love Lucas. He's the best thing that's ever happened to me, she said hoarsely. If you weren't so blinded by your idiotic social class requirements, you would have seen that. She glared at him, wishing her eyes could burn holes right through him. He lifted his chin, his expression rigid. When you've had a chance to calm down and look at this rationally, you'll see that I'm right. Save it, she barked. She was sick of his snobbery and judgments. Oscar stepped into the room and placed a hand on Grandfather's shoulder. Let me talk to her, he urged. Grandfather looked like he might argue, but instead nodded. He turned on his heel and strode out of the room, his shoulders stiff and resolute as always. Oscar went and sat down beside Magnolia. I'm sorry, he said quietly. While Magnolia's father wasn't demonstrative when it came to emotions, he was thankfully warmer than her grandfather. Ever since her arrival yesterday at the estate, she'd felt more of a kinship with her father. That was probably because Magnolia felt like they had to bond together to stand against Grandfather. Also, her father had been kind to Lucas, treating him like a person, with dignity rather than a pariah. The dam broke as Magnolia began weeping. How could Lucas leave me? Her shoulders shook as she gave way to her grief. Oscar rubbed her back. I'm so sorry, he said again. You've only been with Lucas a short time. Your infatuation with him will fade as quickly as it blossomed. She turned to her father, a sense of outrage filling her chest. Do you not know me at all? 
His jaw went slack. What do you mean? Her lower lip trembled as she stared unseeingly into the distance. For most of my adult life, I floundered trying to find my place in the world. I went to school, settled into my career. I went through the motions of the life that I was expected to live. Her voice trembled as she rushed on. When I was a kid, I had this huge crush on Lucas. Then shortly after graduating from high school, the two of us went out on a handful of dates. She grunted out a brittle laugh. I was smitten. I probably would have committed to him right then and there, but Lucas wasn't ready. Fast forward to the present when Lucas and I reconnected. Her voice hardened. He's the most infuriating, bullheaded man that I know. A sad smile moved over her lips. When he calls me princess, it's not a compliment. Lucas is a cowboy to the core. He's painfully blunt. Tears blurred her vision. He makes me want to be a better person. It'll be okay. A black tidal wave of fury engulfed her. No, she nearly shouted. It won't. Nothing will ever be okay again. Hearing the clearing of a throat, Magnolia's head jerked up. Roman had stepped into the room. Irritation spiked through her. What do you want? she demanded. I know this is a rough time for you. I'm sorry for what you're going through. Thanks, she said mechanically. I love you, he uttered, giving her a plaintive look. She rolled her eyes. Roman, please, not now. He held up a hand. Just hear me out, please. She clamped her arms over her chest, her lips forming tight lines. Despite everything that has happened, I still want to marry you. Her jaw dropped. Was Roman for real? This is ridiculous, she muttered. Oscar caught hold of her arm. Hear him out, he urged. Fine, she huffed. Say what you have to say. She was cold and empty inside. I didn't know about your inheritance. Anger flashed in his eyes. It's astounding to think that you're being forced to get married. Yes, it is, she snapped, surprised and grateful that Roman was acknowledging the unfairness of her situation. I'd be lying if I said it didn't sting to know that you intended to marry me so you could get your inheritance. And I'd be lying if I said it didn't sting that you two-timed me, she retorted. His eyes widened before he pressed his lips together in remorse. Like I said yesterday, I'm sorry. His dark eyes brimmed with tenderness. I know you don't think that you ever loved me, but I love you. He gave her a hopeful look. I'll love you enough for both of us. Her brows furrowed. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way, she said tartly. She knew from sad experience that no matter how much she loved Lucas, it wasn't enough. If he couldn't commit, then they were doomed. Roman's gaze held hers. You need a husband so you can get your inheritance. There was a tremor in his voice. I need you. Please, marry me. Magnolia had to fight the urge to start laughing hysterically. This is ludicrous. Think about what he's offering, Oscar cut in. I know you're upset right now, but do you really want to lose your inheritance? Magnolia chewed on her inner cheek. No, she didn't want to lose her inheritance, but all she could think about right now was Lucas. Her heart squeezed, a wall of tears pressing behind her eyes. You don't have to give me an answer right now, Roman said. Just think about it. A reminiscent smile curled his lips. We had fun together, remember? She gave him a curt nod in response. Roman was a handsome man. She'd been drawn to him once. Could she grow to love him? Everything in her repelled the idea as Lucas's face flashed before her. Her heart ached. Would the hurt fade? She'd lost Lucas. She didn't want to lose her inheritance, too. I'll think about it, she finally said. Don't think on it too long, 
her father inserted. You're running out of time. Chapter 14 Start at the beginning and tell me everything that happened, Lillian prompted as she shifted on the plush couch, as if trying to find a comfortable spot. Her eyes were kind, her voice soothing. Lucas's head was throbbing, like he'd been beaten with a baseball bat. He felt sluggish from lack of sleep. He wished he could sink into the couch and let it swallow him whole. His emotions were such a tangled mass that he felt like he'd lose his mind. After leaving the Bentley estate the night before, he'd intended to drive all night back to Franklin, but he couldn't fathom the thought of going home without Magnolia. Before his head even realized what was happening, he found himself back in the town of Remember. He didn't know what he hoped to find by coming here. He only knew that he wasn't in any shape to go home. He'd pulled into the inn and slept in his truck. This morning, when he'd gone inside, he was greeted by a surprised Sam who quickly ushered him back to Lillian's office. Forty-five minutes later, Lillian shuffled in, apologizing that he'd had to wait for her. She explained that she'd hosted a Christmas Eve party the night before for some close friends and members of the town. Lucas apologized for interrupting her Christmas but she brushed away his comment with a wave of her hand, saying that she had all the time in the world. Lillian had on a Christmas sweater. This one was of Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer. Rudolph's nose was a fluffy red pom-pom. What happened? Lillian prompted. Benjamin Bentley, for starters, Lucas grumbled. Ah, she said sagely, but you knew that going in. Benjamin can be a grumpy old codger. He's like a dog that won't let go of a bone. Grumpy is one word for him. I can think of a few other choice words. He clenched his jaw as the anger resurged. Lillian chuckled. Let's not go there. I don't like to speak ill of the dead, but Carol Bentley was a cold fish. She and Benjamin did a number on poor Oscar. Tell me about it, Lucas growled. Lillian propelled her hand in a circular motion. Don't keep me in limbo here. Tell me what happened. Do you know about the conditions attached to the trust fund? Yes, Benjamin told me when I called him. Magnolia has to be married by her 27th birthday, and it has to be someone that both Benjamin and Eric Stanford approve of. Don't forget the part about Magnolia having a child within five years of the marriage. Lillian blinked in surprise, a look of outrage turning her face deep red. Are you serious? Yep, he clipped. Her head swung back and forth. That's absurd. I always knew that Carol was a control freak, but this takes the cake. Benjamin didn't have any intention of approving me. I don't fit into his sleek, black-tie world. Lillian frowned so deeply that the edges of her eyes were enfolded in deep wrinkles that could have given a basset hound a run for its money. Is Benjamin really that shallow? His voice rose. Evidently, I'm living proof. So what happened? Did Magnolia not stand by you? Oh, yeah, he answered quickly. She did. She was determined to go through with the marriage, with or without her grandfather's approval. Good for her, Lillian steeled her jaw, admiration simmering in her eyes. A second later, she gave Lucas a questioning look. If Magnolia stood by you, then why are you here? He pushed out a long breath. Oscar came to me last night. He told me his story about how he defied his parents and married Magnolia's mother. Carol and Benjamin disinherited him. The friction of losing the money drove a wedge between the couple. Eventually, their marriage fell apart. I didn't know that. It's a shame. Oscar told me that if Magnolia and I went through with our marriage, then we would follow the same path. Magnolia doesn't know what it's like to live without money. She would have ended up resenting me in the end. 
his gut nodded. I couldn't be the cause of her losing her inheritance. Lillian's voice rose. So you just walked away? What choice did I have? Acid rose in his throat. You could have stayed and fought. Her voice was coated in reproof. I believe that when push came to shove, Benjamin would have backed down. Surely he wants Magnolia to get her inheritance. Benjamin has more money than he knows what to do with. Magnolia will get her inheritance, Lucas said calmly, although his insides were raging up a storm. She'll marry her ex-boyfriend, Roman Abbott. Lillian's jaw dropped. Where does the ex-boyfriend come in? I thought he was officially out of the picture. He rubbed a hand across his forehead. He'd thought it would help to talk to Lillian, but it was only making him feel worse. No matter where he went or what he did, nothing could stop the raging in his head. All he knew to do was to keep putting one foot in front of the other and to keep breathing in and out. He couldn't think past the next few minutes. It was too painful. Before Magnolia and I got together, she'd been dating Roman. The two of them broke up when Magnolia saw him having dinner with another woman. Lillian's eyes rounded to large circles as Lucas continued. Magnolia had planned to marry Roman so she could get her inheritance. Yes, Benjamin told me that. He was afraid that Magnolia had grabbed the first guy she could find on the rebound to fulfill the terms of the trust. Sorry, I mean no disrespect to you, she said when Lucas grimaced. It's okay, I'll take my fair share of the blame. Magnolia was desperate. She agreed to buy me a ranch if I agreed to marry her. Ah, the rest of the picture shifts into place. That's why you were out trying to find Arthur's ranch. Yep, that's why, he grunted. The only thing I didn't count on was actually falling in love with Magnolia. A coy smile curved Lillian's ruby lips. I know true love when I see it, she asserted. She dipped her head. I still don't understand how the boyfriend, what was his name again? Roman Abbott? That's right. How does Roman Abbott play into this? He was at the Bentley estate when we arrived. Shortly after Magnolia and I met with Benjamin in his study, Benjamin got his housekeeper to bring Roman in. His eyes narrowed. Roman proceeded to tell Magnolia how sorry he was. He claimed that the girl he'd gone to dinner with was an old friend. He pleaded for Magnolia's forgiveness, telling her that he wanted her back. Lillian snorted. More like he wants access to her inheritance. No, I don't think so. Magnolia never told Roman about the inheritance. Had Roman not been there, I might have stood a fighting chance. However, in Benjamin's eyes, there was no contest between me and Roman. He's from the same background as Magnolia. He got his master's from Columbia University and plans on teaching at Harvard. Oscar asked me to step down so that Roman could marry Magnolia. That way she gets to claim her inheritance and they ride off into the sunset together, he finished bitterly. Lillian sat back in her seat, drumming her fingers on her pants. It certainly seems like everything is tied up in a neat bow. It's a good thing Roman was there waiting in the wings to marry Magnolia. How benevolent of him to want to reconcile, especially since he had no idea that she stood to inherit a fortune. She looked thoughtful. I wonder. Lucas frowned. Are you saying there has been some foul play? She pursed her lips together. I'm not sure what I'm saying, only that it's convenient that Roman Abbott was there. Abbott she mused. Why does that name sound so familiar? I can't quite place it, but I'll figure it out. How was Eric Stanford? Lucas shrugged. Cordial, diplomatic, although I could tell that Eric won't make a move without Benjamin's approval. Lillian's eyes sparked fire. 
Eric Stanford is a leech. My late husband, Howard, tried to warn Benjamin to cut ties with him, but Eric has his claws in too deep. Lillian squinted her eyes in concentration. Columbia, Harvard, she murmured. Roman Abbott. Why does that name sound so familiar? She jerked, her eyes popping open wide. Oh, my gosh, it just came to me. Eric has a sister named Rosalind Abbott. Lucas's breath caught. Do you think that Roman Abbott is Eric's nephew? His heart began to pound as the implications began to take shape. He balled his fists. Hadn't he known deep down that Roman was a fraud? He was too much of a slick talker, too repentant, too willing to lay down at Magnolia's feet. He pushed a hand through his hair. If Roman Abbott is Eric's nephew, then I've been played. What does Roman look like? He's tall with dark hair and dark eyes. Is he a good-looking guy, a George Clooney type? Yeah, he swore under his breath. Don't panic yet. Let's make sure that my hunch is correct. I'm friends with Rosalind on Facebook. She always posts pictures of her kids. When you said that you were friends with Benjamin Bentley, I didn't realize that y'all were close enough that you'd be connected to his attorney's sister on Facebook. It's a small world, especially where the wealthy are concerned. She looked over her shoulder. Would you be a dear and get me my laptop from my desk? Sure. He returned with it a minute later. Lillian opened it and began typing away on the keys. A few seconds later, she turned her computer to him. Is this the guy? An invisible noose tightened around Lucas's neck, stealing his breath. He coughed, rage blistering through him. What have I done? I've thrown Magnolia to the wolves. A humorless laugh scratched his throat as he rubbed a hand over his forehead. I shouldn't have left. I never even told Magnolia I was going. I took off in the middle of the night. After what Oscar told me about his marriage, I panicked. I didn't want to knock Magnolia out of her inheritance. His voice cracked. I didn't want her to end up resenting me. He ground his teeth. Let's face it. I was fighting a losing battle from the beginning. Even if Benjamin had given me his blessing, then Magnolia would always wonder if I was with her for the money. We should have just told Benjamin Bentley where to stick it. Anguish twisted his gut. We could have built a life for ourselves independent of the money. It's not too late, Lillian interjected. She's not married yet. She'll never forgive me for leaving her. Lillian gave Lucas a sharp look. You can't sit back and do nothing while she marries a charlatan. No, you're right. Even if I've lost her, I still have to look out for her well-being. Magnolia loves you. And I love her, he thundered, but I will never be her equal. The money will always be between us. She gave him a speculative look. What if there was a way to level the playing field? He frowned. I don't understand. A mischievous grin flitted over Lillian's lips. You know how I told you Sam and I were out looking for a Christmas tree when those teenagers jumped us? Yeah, he said warily. He'd known all along that Lillian and Sam weren't telling the full truth, but he had no idea where this was going. Her eyes twinkled. I might have fudged the situation a smidgen. She pressed her index finger and thumb together as she held up her hand. A minute later, she sat up straight, fixing him with a penetrating look. How much do you love Magnolia? His throat thickened with emotion. Enough to give her up when I thought it was best for her. She nodded. Now that you know that you goofed, what are you willing to do to get her back? Determination bubbled inside him. Whatever it takes. Good. I just wanted to hear you say it. And for the record, your value to Magnolia has nothing to do with money. 
It will only come between you if you allow it to. She clasped her hands together with a renewed sense of purpose. I just have one final question for you. What's that? A large grin broke over her face. How are you at digging? Digging? he asked dubiously. What does that have to do with anything? Lillian was a nice person, but she was a bit odd. Still, he owed her a lot for helping him uncover Roman's fraud. His insides burned with indignation, making him want to jump up this very minute, rush back to the Bentley estate, and beat Roman to a pulp. Lillian giggled. You'll see, she sang, her eyes dancing with mystery. All will be revealed soon. Chapter 15 You look beautiful, sweetheart, Oscar said as he stepped up behind Magnolia and placed his hands on her arms. Thanks, Magnolia said dully as she looked at her reflection in the mirror. She ran her hand over the smooth, silky fabric. The dress was more exquisite than she'd ever imagined. This should be one of the best days of her life, the fulfillment of every young girl's dream. And yet, Magnolia had never felt emptier. Would she grow to love Roman? The thought of being intimate with him turned her nauseous. Every time she closed her eyes, she kept seeing Lucas's face, the tender expression of his blue-gray eyes called to her. What good was money if she couldn't have Lucas? Why couldn't he have stood by her? She would have given up everything for him, but when push came to shove, he couldn't follow through. Too bad your mother couldn't be here to see you, Oscar said morosely. Magnolia studied his reflection in the mirror, struck by the deep sadness in his eyes. Was that how she would be, an empty shell of a person? The words rose from her lips and spilled out between them. What happened between you and Mom? She'd been thinking a lot about her parents' marriage over the past several hours. This morning, she'd gotten down on her knees and prayed for direction. She prayed for peace. She even prayed for Lucas, asking the Lord to help him find his focus. How desperately she wanted him back. She kept getting the distinct impression that she needed to get some answers surrounding her parents' divorce. She didn't know how that tied into her situation, but she'd learned to trust her feelings. He blinked in surprise. Today isn't a good time to talk about this, he said tersely. She turned to face him. The need to know the truth rose inside her like a fire-breathing dragon that refused to be quelled. She'd either find the answers to her questions, or she'd incinerate from the inside out. She looked him in the eye. If not now, when? She clenched her jaw. It was about the money, wasn't it? The color drained from his face, letting her know that she'd hit her mark. It was... She felt her nostrils flare as she planted her hands on her hips. Grandfather and grandmother destroyed your marriage. Her head swung back and forth as a sickening feeling settled in her gut. The money did eventually come between me and Janet, Oscar admitted. His words were flat and dull. Janet felt guilty for knocking me out of my inheritance. He exhaled loudly. And I... His voice faltered as he shoved his hands into his pockets, looking down at the ground. Heat flushed through Magnolia's body. It wasn't Mom's guilt that drove y'all apart. It was you. Her words came out in short bursts, her head spinning so fast that it made her dizzy. You resented Mom because you gave up the money for her. Grandfather and Grandmother cut you off without a cent. You couldn't handle living without the money. When he didn't respond, her voice shook with wrath. Isn't that right? How could you? Tears brimmed in her eyes. We could have been a family, she uttered hoarsely. He lifted his face to hers. The naked pain in his eyes cut her to the core. I failed, Janet, his voice broke. I have to live every day with that knowledge. I didn't want that to happen to you. 
which is why I told Lucas. His eyes widened as he clamped his mouth shut. His face was lobster red. She clenched her hands, getting up in his face. Told Lucas what? It doesn't matter, he mumbled. She threw her head back. Of course it matters. Keep your voice down, he warned in a low tone. Do you want the wedding planner and her staff to hear you? I'm beyond caring who hears me, she screamed. I want to know what happened. What did you tell Lucas? He drew his lips together. Okay, lower your voice and I'll tell you. When he'd finished, a blistering anger raged through Magnolia. You drove him away. I thought I was doing the right thing. I didn't want you to end up like me. Magnolia's dress suddenly felt too tight. She could feel perspiration oozing from every pore in her body. Thanks to what you did, I'm about to end up exactly like you. I'll have a truckload of money, and I'll be utterly and wretchedly alone. She lifted her chin. Congratulations! Your daughter has grown up to be just like you. He winced, giving her a wounded look. I thought I was doing what was best. On some level, Magnolia knew that what he was saying was true. Her father had always wanted what was best for her. Magnolia knew that he loved her, but he didn't know how to show it. Right now, however, she was too livid to mince her words. Serena, the wedding planner, knocked once before opening the bedroom door and sticking her head in. Everything is a go. We're ready when you are. Her cheery smile fell a notch when she got a good look at Magnolia and Oscar. Is everything okay? Oscar offered a tight smile. We're fine. Just give us a few more minutes. Okay, she replied in a voice too chipper. Just stick your head out the door and let me know when you're ready. She popped out, closing the door. Oscar turned to Magnolia. Now that you have all the information, what are you going to do? Usually, he was in complete control of himself and his surroundings. She'd never before seen him look so distraught or defeated. A humorless laugh rattled Magnolia's throat. You mean all the information that you've been keeping from me? She slung out. She could tell that her words cut. Normally, she tried to be respectful of her father, but right now, she had to get the ire out or she'd explode. She pressed her fingers to her temples and closed her eyes, trying to calm herself down enough to think. Lucas had left because he thought he was doing what was best for Magnolia. He hadn't given up on her, not exactly. Her heart wrenched at the irony. Lucas thought he was being noble by leaving. She was so furious with her father. What was she going to do? A new thought circled her brain. She didn't have to get married to Roman. She could break the chain of control that her grandparents had exerted over her and her parents. Did she have the courage to do it? Now that she knew that Lucas still loved her, it changed everything. I'm sorry for all the pain I've caused you, her father said, his eyes going glassy. I thought I was doing the right thing. Not wanting to argue any further, she remained silent. He cleared his throat. I'll be outside the door waiting to walk you down the aisle. She lifted an eyebrow in cynical amusement. You seem awfully sure that I'm going through with this. Money is a powerful persuader, he said sadly. She thrust out her chin. So is love. He nodded but she could tell that he didn't believe her. I'll be right outside. She waited until he'd left the room before turning to look at her reflection. What kind of woman was Magnolia Bentley? The type to hold her ground for love or the type to marry for money? Her father was right. The lure of money was intoxicating. She balled her fists. She could rise above this, she could break the chain. She could give herself the purest gift of all, the gift to choose one's life and love. Lucas Romeo, what have you done to me? She muttered. Another knock sounded at the door. Her father stuck his head in. 
It's time, he announced soberly. She ran a hand over the bodice of the dress. It is beautiful, she murmured. The right dress, the wrong groom. She adjusted her veil, giving her face one last check. Here goes nothing, she said as she straightened her shoulders. Let's do this, she said to her father as she linked her arm through his. I knew you'd come around, he sighed in relief. Yep, I have come around. It's about time, she added to herself. When Magnolia and her father reached the atrium, they stood just outside the door, waiting for the wedding march so they could walk down the aisle. One of the assistants to the wedding planner handed Magnolia her bouquet. Her colors were dusty rose and sage green. Magnolia had felt it was a perfect combination for a winter wedding. Roman was the picture of elegance in his tux, standing erect and tall, his dark hair gleaming. He wore a cavalier smile, but it seemed a little strained around the edges. Magnolia thought he might be a touch nervous. Her grandfather was sitting on the front row. Eric Stanford and his wife were beside him. There were around twenty other guests, but Magnolia didn't know a one of them. The wedding march sounded. Magnolia and her father jumped into gear as they propelled their feet forward, going down the aisle. The guests rose to their feet. Her father delivered her to Roman. They faced the preacher who was standing in front of an ornately carved wooden arch, draped with some of the most beautiful flowers and greenery Magnolia had ever seen. The decorators had outdone themselves. It was an incredible space, one that would have had Pinterest lovers salivating. Roman's gaze flickered over her with appreciation. It seemed strange that the two of them had once been close. She'd been happy with Roman for a time, but then her heart had longed for more. All the memories were there, but they felt like they were part of someone else's life instead of her own. Roman was still as handsome as ever, with his dazzling smile and dark eyes. But he did nothing for her. Not any more. Dearly beloved, the preacher began, we are gathered here today to witness the union of this couple. As he continued the ceremony, Magnolia took in his appearance. The preacher was a thin man with stooped shoulders who looked to be in his late sixties. He had a shock of white hair and hawk-like features. His skin was pitted like he might have had acne at one time. There was a faint stain on his shirt to the right of his burgundy tie. Magnolia wondered what he'd eaten before coming. She had no idea how much the preacher was being paid to officiate the ceremony. She'd never even thought to ask how much the caterer or wedding planner charged. Her grandfather was paying for the entire thing, so money wasn't an object. She felt like she was standing on a precipice, with her entire life spread before her. If she chose to walk away from her inheritance, she would have to make a vow to herself that she wouldn't fall into the same trap her father had. She couldn't let money come between her and Lucas. Could she do it? Was she strong enough to just walk away? The current of tradition in the Bentley family was strong and swift, like river rapids. Could she navigate them without getting pulled under? It startled her when she realized that the preacher and Roman were looking at her expectantly. Was this where she was supposed to say, I do? She coughed. I'm sorry. Could you please repeat the question? This brought gentle ripples of laughter from the audience. She looked at Roman. His eyes were shadowed with concern. The preacher looked down at the black leather book in his hands, as if trying to find his place. He cleared his throat, starting again. Magnolia Bentley, do you take Roman Abbott? to be your lawfully wedded husband, forsaking all others to have and to hold from this time forward till death do you part. Here it was, the moment of truth. She felt her spirit split from her body. It soared forward, trying to discern how the future Magnolia Bentley would feel about the repercussions that would follow this fateful moment in time. She straightened her shoulders. No! 
she said loudly. Roman's face caved. Think about what you're doing, he whispered in an urgent tone. The money. She flinched. I thought it wasn't about the money for you. It's not, he stammered. I'm just thinking about you. Roman was such a smooth talker, so quick on his feet, that she couldn't be sure whether or not he was telling the truth. Then again, it didn't matter. I'm sorry, she said loudly, but I can't marry you. I love someone else. Murmurs went through the crowd. A look of panic streaked over the preacher's face as he glanced at her grandfather. Everyone, it seemed, was keenly worried about her grandfather and his long arm of influence. Magnolia turned to face the audience. Thank you for coming out this evening. As a little girl, I would often dream about how my wedding would be, what kind of dress I'd wear, what type of decorations I'd have, the cake. A wistful smile tipped her lips. The groom. She turned to Roman. As far as looks go, I don't think I could have asked for a more handsome groom. She pulled her lips into tight lines. There's only one problem. I don't love you. She looked at her grandfather. His expression was livid. You see, I love a man who's not quite so comfortable in a high-dollar tux. A man who's rough around the edges. A man who can be moody and intolerable at times. A man who doesn't mind setting me straight on the very rare occasion when I need it. This evoked a few rounds of laughter. This man is a hard worker. He doesn't need accolades or degrees from prestigious schools to make him feel good about himself. She glanced at Roman. His face was beet red. My late grandmother thought she knew what was best for me and other members of my family. She looked at her father as she spoke. His expression was too guarded to read. But she was mistaken. You see, love can't be bought. We can't always choose the person we'll fall in love with. But when our heart makes up its mind, the best we can hope for is that we can have the courage to follow it. Her voice choked as tears pressed against her eyes. Money is a poor substitute for love. I'm sad that I won't be able to claim my inheritance, she cast her grandfather a pointed look, but I will never regret following my heart. Her voice shook with fury. Long story short, I'm done playing by the rules. I'm ready to live life on my terms. I've often heard it said that faith must take a few steps into the darkness before coming into the light. Well, I've been wandering in the darkness for most of my life, it's about time that I stepped into the light. Her gaze went to her father. His eyes were shining, tears dribbling down his cheeks. A faint smile touched his lips as he gave her an admiring look. Amen, a deep masculine voice chimed. She would have recognized that voice anywhere. She dropped her arm, letting the bouquet hang by her side, as her other hand went over her heart. Lucas, she exclaimed. He'd come for her. A feeling of undiluted joy splashed through her. It registered in her brain that Lillian was beside him. She was wearing a bright red sequin dress that matched her hair. The dress was so out of place in the artful setting where every last detail had been so fastidiously planned that Magnolia couldn't help but giggle no one could plan for Lillian Yates. The audience turned to look at Lucas. He marched forward with Lillian ambling behind him, using her walker. When he reached the wedding party, he homed in on the preacher and said with an authoritative, I don't know if you've gotten to this part yet, but I object to this wedding. You're out of line here, Roman said hotly, his face contorting with indignation. Lucas pointed at him. Actually, you're the one out of line. You're a fraud. This is outrageous, Roman spat. Lucas grunted. Buddy, you ain't seen nothing yet. He drew back his fist and popped Roman in the jaw, knocking him to the ground. That's for trying to deceive my woman. Magnolia was stunned. For an instant, it seemed as if everyone and everything around her was frozen. 
Then her grandfather stood, outraged. Call the police, he said to one of the ushers. That's a splendid idea, Benjamin, Lillian said loudly. What is this about? Benjamin demanded, glaring at Lillian. She arched an eyebrow. Why don't you ask Eric? Her voice cut the air like a sharpened knife through a ripe piece of fruit. All eyes turned to the attorney. His fleshy face began blotching red. His wife put a protective hand on his arm. Grandfather bunched his brows. What's going on, Eric? I... I'm not sure, Eric stammered. I'll tell you what it's about, Lillian continued, as she threw Roman a malevolent glare. Roman Abbott is Eric's nephew. The air whooshed out of Magnolia's lungs. She looked at Roman and could tell from his panicked expression that it was true. She'd met Roman at the country club in New Orleans. They played tennis together. Her world expanded and contracted in a hard jolt. My entire relationship with you was a sham, she uttered. She ran her mind back through the course of their relationship as a short laugh clipped through her throat. No wonder I kept feeling like something was off. You are a despicable snake. And you're an entitled snot, Roman sneered. I'm almost glad you found out the truth. Five years with you would have been torture. No amount of money is worth that. Careful, Lucas warned, the vein in his neck pulsing, or I'll finish what I started and give you the real thrashing that you deserve. Roman swore, I'm out of here. He looked straight at Eric before he stomped away. Now that the trash is gone, we can breathe a little easier. Lillian declared with a laugh. She lasered in on Eric. Well, some of the trash is gone. Lucas turned to Magnolia, searching her face. I'm so sorry I left. He jammed a hand through his hair. I thought I was doing the right thing, he muttered. I thought I was giving you a chance to get your inheritance while having a happy life. She could tell from the tortured look in his eyes that he'd been in turmoil. It was a mistake. The corners of his jaw twitched. When I think about what could have happened if you'd married that clown, his expression darkened. It makes my skin crawl. All her emotions bubbled to the surface as she slapped him hard against the jaw. That's for leaving me. Lucas's eyes widened in shock as his hand went to his face. Laughter gurgled in Magnolia's throat as tears sprang to her eyes. This is for coming back. She threw down her bouquet and flung her arms around Lucas's neck as she pressed her lips to his, giving him a long, satisfying kiss that stoked her ache for him. She drank him in, needing the reassurance that he was hers. When they pulled back, Lucas kept both arms firmly fixed around her waist, his eyes moved over her slow and appreciatively, causing her blood to warm. You're the song that I never want to let go of, he murmured. Luckily, you won't ever have to, she asserted. I'm not letting you get away from me again. A corner of his mouth pulled up in a lopsided grin. You throw a mean slap, princess, he drawled. Remind me not to ever again get on your bad side. His expression grew serious. I love you. I love you, too. A smile curved her lips. More than a little. Lillian began clapping. Now that's what I call a happy ending, she exclaimed jubilantly. Lucas released Magnolia's waist. He reached for her hand, linking his fingers through hers. Let's get out of here. Gladly, she sighed. Wait a minute. Eric interrupted, eyeing Lucas. How do we know that you're not after the money? I think you've done enough damage, Oscar said, a clear note of warning in his tone. I, I was only trying to carry out Carol's wishes, Eric sputtered, keeping his eyes fixed on Grandfather. She wanted her granddaughter to marry someone with the right breeding and background so that Magnolia wouldn't end up like Oscar. 
I was only trying to help. My nephew is a good man. He didn't mean those things he said. He was just... Enough, Grandfather commanded, holding up his hand. He gave Eric a look that was as scalding as it was cutting. I'll deal with you later. Eric was quelled into silence, shaking in his boots. Magnolia couldn't help but feel a trace of admiration for her grandfather. Eric had better be scared. Grandfather was not one to cross. And the fact that he'd trusted Eric implicitly added fuel to the fire. Grandfather turned to Lucas. Unfortunately, Eric does bring up a good point. How do we know that you're not here for the money? Anger surged through Magnolia. Seriously? We're back to this? Benjamin does bring up a good point, Lillian said. Thank you, Benjamin clipped. I'm glad someone here has enough sense to see things clearly. A large checkmate smile filled Lillian's face. I know it's tacky to discuss finances, Lillian said in a chatty tone as she turned to the wedding guests nearest to where she was standing. But in this case, I believe an exception can be made. Lucas, why don't you explain to Benjamin why Magnolia's inheritance is no longer an impediment? Her eyes burned with determination as she peered over her glasses. Magnolia turned to Lucas. What's going on? A sheepish grin moved over his lips. Well, it would seem that I'm a man of substance. He's worth $2.8 million, Lillian said with a touch of pride. Magnolia's jaw dropped. What? How? Let's just say that the past few hours have been interesting, Lucas said. Lucas found a valuable treasure. Lillian smiled at Magnolia and Lucas. And I'm not talking about just money. Benjamin rubbed a hand over his forehead as he looked at Lillian. Are you talking about that ridiculous treasure that you hide every year? His voice escalated to a fevered pitch. The one that you leave clues about on your blog? He shook his head. You really are as eccentric as everyone says. The eccentric billionaire who has more money than she knows what to do with, he grunted. Howard would roll over in his grave if he knew how you were squandering his money. I like to think that Howard would be proud of the way I'm spending the money, Lillian enunciated every word. And for the record, I'd rather be known as eccentric than as a stubborn old curmudgeon who will go to his grave friendless. It sickens me to see what you and Carol have done to your granddaughter with that dastardly trust fund. Magnolia's mind was spinning. She turned to Lucas. Lillian's a billionaire? Yep, he grinned. Remember how I told you that there was no way that Lillian and Sam were out in the boonies trying to find a Christmas tree? Yeah. Well, I was right. They were hiding Lillian's treasure. That's what those teenagers were trying to get. Lillian's treasure has made her famous. Or infamous, Lillian laughed. Magnolia's mind scrambled to catch up. She looked at Lillian. Why would you hide a treasure and leave clues for people to find it? A wistful smile touched Lillian's lips. It started as a way to remember Howard. He died suddenly of a heart attack. In a fit of anger, I took every piece of jewelry Howard ever gave me and put it into a box. I buried it, hoping that it would help me bury my pain. Then something magical happened. The treasure became bigger than me. It became a symbol of love and hope. Her eyes sparkled with tender emotion. You see, the treasure has a way of finding people who need it most. And sometimes, on rare, wonderful occasions, I'm able to play a small part in getting it to its rightful owners. Magnolia turned to Lucas. You and Lillian dug up her treasure? Yep, 
Lucas grinned. We no longer need your inheritance. We're free to live our lives as we please. Magnolia's eyes misted. You're a millionaire, and you came for me, she squeaked. A tender smile touched Lucas's lips. I will always come for you, princess, he said softly. I'm afraid you're stuck with this old country bumpkin cowboy. Mirth rippled in her throat. Aren't we the pair, the cowboy and the princess? Lucas motioned with his head. Let's get out of here, his eyes twinkled. We've got a ranch to look at, she giggled. Arthur's ranch. Soon to be our ranch. But you haven't seen it yet, Magnolia protested. Oh, yes, he has, Lillian asserted. Lucas grinned. Like I said, the past several hours have been busy. They moved to leave, but Grandfather held up his hand. Wait, his gaze locked with Magnolia's. He swallowed as if collecting his thoughts. It would seem that in my efforts to ensure that you didn't end up with someone who was after the money, I failed dismally. He looked at Lucas. I'm sorry that I misjudged you. Magnolia's jaw dropped clear to her feet. In all her years, she'd never heard her grandfather admit fault. I assume that the two of you plan to get married, Grandfather asked. Magnolia and Lucas looked at one another. A smile stole over Lucas's lips. That's the plan. Well, why not do it here? Grandfather's voice hitched. It would be a great honor to have you as part of this family, he said to Lucas. A hint of a smile touched his lips. And it would fulfill the terms of a certain dastardly trust fund. He made a point of looking at Lillian. But the trust fund requires us to get Eric's approval, Magnolia countered. Not just yours. Grandfather cut his eyes at Eric. Don't worry, he'll approve it. Won't you? He growled. You bet he will, Eric's wife piped in, giving her husband a withering look. Eric nodded as he adjusted his tie and tugged on the collar of his shirt like it had suddenly grown too tight. What do you think? Lucas asked, eagerness shining in his arresting blue-gray eyes. Should we get married here and now? It only took a split second for Magnolia to reach a conclusion, but she pursed her lips, pretending to mull it over. She tapped her chin with her index finger. Well, it is a fabulous setting, and I do have the perfect dress. I'll second that, Lucas murmured, his eyes moving over her. A radiant smile spread over her face. Now that I have the perfect groom, how could I say no? Lucas looked down at his jeans and denim shirt. Magnolia was pleased to note that he was wearing his faded cowboy boots. She hadn't even realized that he'd brought them on the trip. I'm a bit underdressed, she laughed. Nah, you're perfect. My country bumpkin cowboy, she said affectionately. Lucas turned to face her, holding both her hands. Tears rose in her eyes when he got down on one knee and peered up at her. A crooked grin pulled at his lips. Your hands are warm, she laughed. Yes, they are. Magnolia Bentley, you caught me completely by surprise. You're the princess I never knew I always wanted, he uttered, his eyes growing moist. Thank you for showing me that I can love again, he sucked in a breath. Thanks for believing in me, for reminding me that I am enough, his voice caught. I promise that I will spend the rest of my life proving myself worthy of you. You already have, she said, her words hoarse with throaty emotion. Marry me? Yes, she exclaimed. I do. The preacher was standing off to the side. It wasn't until he spoke that Magnolia remembered that he was there. 
Oh, wait a minute. I haven't gotten to that part yet. Well, get to it, preacher, Lillian laughed. The instant Lucas got to his feet, Magnolia flung her arms around his neck and gave him a full kiss on the mouth, holding nothing back. I haven't gotten to that part either, the preacher said, but she didn't care. It was time for her to start living her own life with the one man who'd claimed her heart long ago, before she was even mature enough to realize what was happening. Something Lillian said Christmas Eve morning floated through Magnolia's mind. It's not where you begin your journey or even where you end up that matters. What counts the most is who you become along the way. Her heart felt like it would burst open with joy. Lillian was right. Love always finds a way. Epilogue, Ten Months Later Magnolia hummed as she worked in the kitchen. She dipped her finger into the spaghetti sauce bubbling on the stove. She tasted it before adding in a few shakes of salt. Lucas stepped up behind her and encircled her waist. Something looks good, he murmured, his warm breath tickling her skin and sending tantalizing shivers traipsing down her spine. Don't you mean smells good? She giggled. Nope, he drawled. But supper does smell amazing. He began trailing feather-light kisses down her neck. It drove her to distraction. She grinned, loving his use of the word supper. He was a cowboy through and through. He loved every minute of working the ranch. The two of them had settled comfortably into their new life in Remember. Magnolia was still working at the magazine. Also, she'd supervised the complete remodel of their house. It had been a hectic but glorious past few months. Lucas turned her around to face him. His eyes took on a smolder, turning them to deep pools of blue. You know, we could put supper on hold and focus on more important matters. His voice grew husky as he leaned in and nipped her earlobe. She laughed, pressing her palms to his chest. Lillian's joining us for dinner tonight. She'll be here any minute. Too bad, he pouted, but his eyes held a playful glint. I guess I'll have to wait. Good things come to those who wait, she chimed, her cheeks warming. Even now, after all these months, she was still so enamored with Lucas that he made her go weak in the knees. He released her waist as he went over to the salad and grabbed a carrot slice from off the top. He plopped it into his mouth before folding his arms over his chest. I spoke to Mom today. Oh, how's she doing? Over the past several months, Magnolia had grown super close to Layla and Dylan. Magnolia loved Lucas's parents as if they were her own. Really well. She's wondering if we're going down to Franklin for Christmas. Magnolia reached for a wooden spoon, stirring the sauce. That would be great. A large, enthusiastic smile filled his handsome face. Fantastic. Christmas will be at my uncle's ranch. I can't wait to show you off to the whole Romeo clan. Everyone's going to be there this year. She feigned a grimace. It sounds daunting. In reality, she was excited about meeting Lucas's cousins, especially Cash who was a superstar. Magnolia had been a longtime fan of his music. The corners of Lucas's lips pulled down in concern. I know your dad and grandfather are hoping we'll spend Christmas with them. Yeah, they are, but I'm sure they'll understand, especially since we're going to grandfather's for Thanksgiving. Magnolia could tell that her grandfather was trying to make amends for the things he'd done, it had been hard for Magnolia to let go of her resentment, but she was working on it. With time and lots of prayer, she felt like she'd eventually be able to forgive him. Lucas brightened. That's right. We did tell them we'd go there for Thanksgiving. Good. It settled. She wiped her hands on a nearby dish towel as she turned her full focus to Lucas. There was something she needed to tell him. She'd planned on giving him the news after dinner tonight, but she could no longer wait. 
She kept her voice light, even though her pulse was hammering against her temples. You remember how we decided that we were going to hold off on fulfilling that one last requirement of the trust fund? His eyes widened in understanding. Are you? he blurted. A grin curved her lips. I am. She pressed her hands over her stomach. We're having a baby. He let out a whoop as he picked her up and twirled her around. That's wonderful, he laughed. He set her back down before pulling her close and stroking her cheek. I hope we have a little princess just like her mom, he said tenderly. She chuckled. Or a cowboy like her dad. I love you, he uttered. I love you back. A feeling of gratitude swelled in her breast. Sometimes she felt like she was walking around in a dream. She and Lucas had so much to be thankful for. He grinned from ear to ear. Well, this is a big surprise. You know what your mom always says. Often life's greatest blessings come as a complete surprise. Yes, they do, he said, giving her a meaningful look. And I thank God every day for it. Thanks for listening to One Fake Fiancé. The Romeo Family Romance Series continues with One Silent Night. Closing Credits This has been One Fake Fiancé, Romeo Family Romance Book 8, written by Jennifer Youngblood, narrated by Lisa Valdini, production copyright by Jennifer Youngblood, copyright 2020 by Jennifer Youngblood, all rights reserved. No part of this book may be reproduced in any form or by any electronic or mechanical means, including information storage and retrieval systems, without written permission from the author, except for the use of brief quotations in a book review.